like to call this meeting to order and ask that the clerk take the roll. Barbara Marshman. Here. Christina Johnson. Here. Elizabeth Monley. Here. Megan, you're on mute. Not muted, but we've lost your audio, like your microphone went out. Um, let me, I can open up the um, the thing and out. Hold, it'll take me just a second. Hold on. Sorry. It's not letting me open the, the list until I authenticate. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, sorry about that. So what happened? Okay, uh, Ellie Matsumura, can I call your name once more? Here. Thank you. Enrico Callender. Good evening. Frank Maitsky. Here. Derek Percival. Here. George Sanchez. Here. Hui Tran. Jeremy Barus. Here. Jose Posadas. Lundia, Linda Lazard, Luis Barosio, here, Magnolia Siegel, present, Maria Fuentes, here, Sammy Robledo, here, Jerry Segura. Tran. Present. Tobin Gilman. Veronica Amador. Here. Yong Zhao. Here. And Frederick Ferrer. Here. Thank you. Have a quorum. Thank you. Um, and now I'd like to take the consent calendar. In the consent calendar tonight, we just have to receive and file the letters that we've received from the public. I will go to the public now for any comment about the consent items. So the clerk can call the first speaker. So would Mancy? Hi, okay, the consent calendar, right. Um, well, I guess, oh, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, good, I'm trying to, um, hold on. Uh, I, okay, so I don't see a clock. Just give me I'm, a, I'm, I'm sharing. Just go ahead and talk your timer. Okay, you're so sweet. Thank you. Well, I'm just talking about that. You know, the way the agenda went. You see the letter, and so okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, Tony. We love your little count, your little thing. Thanks. So, you know, basically, the consent of what's going on to our agendas and how we need to really focus on the real issues that are leaving us vulnerable to extinction. And so we really need to be addressing these issues with our charter review. And, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, there's a lot of resistance to that and it's frustrating to, to see and that we need to be focusing on like the rest of the world is right now as we're looking at how we're going to reduce our fossil fuels to zero by 2030. And the only way you can do that is to you know keep that you know when you're in a crisis you have to always talk about your crises and so that's why I do that and you know when when I see that you know that there's a lot of um, issues about politics and economics into our agenda when we have such crushing issues to address and to get ourselves ready and resilient to save to save as many of us as we can we're going to have to just focus on this to really get us down to zero emissions and they're saying 20 2025 in order for us to stay alive is you know i mean 
people are saying 2030. I mean, not people, it's the science is saying 2030. And that if we don't stay, you know, down below at the 1.5 is what the science is looking at. And that is reducing uh, 50 percent at least. And now with all this, the um, nature kicking in with the fires and the peat, the, 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 you know, the permafrost frost, frost melting, we have to go faster. So it's zero by 2030. Blair Beekman. All right, thank you, uh, Blair Beekman here. I wanted to uh, quickly thank you for the uh, one of the presenters last week who spoke on surveillance and technology data collection issues. He was really interesting and what you'll be talking about tonight and your many uh, agenda uh, draft recommendation items, uh, you mentioned technology ideas and, and the future of data collection. Thank you for that and, and good luck in this continued good work. Um, I wrote two letters uh, from the public this week. Um, I, you know, I my letter last night. I'm very sorry if I didn't quite, I didn't get, have all my facts straight and I got the order wrong. How to, or not fully better about how to understand uh, these issues at this time. I gave it my best shot. Uh, you know, uh, to talk, I, I don't quite understand what exactly we'll be doing in the next few weeks and months. So I wanted to try to write a letter to kind of prep about some practices that may be going around about, uh, you know, legal language issues about the future of the charter and, and what part will that play in these final few weeks and will that be a, a, pur a purpose of, of, of extending the city charter process possibly. And I just wanted to write that letter, get it out there so we can have decisions to make. I'm very much for the study session process of all you know the good practices we'll talk about tonight. And just a, a thank you to the other issues of uh, you know the, the electoral issues that we'll be also talking about. Uh, thank you that we'll be considering the money issues. Um, the point of what I'm saying is uh, yeah, there's just a lot you guys have to balance. Thank you. It's it's difficult efforts, and uh, I hope my letters can make sense in that way to add another few things that to talk about coming up. Thanks. Alina Yin. Good evening, commissioners. Um, I had a comment about orders of the day, but there was no public comment on there. Um, so I see that we have a new item in the work plan for voting in elections. Um, and I thought that item we already voted on. So I'm really unclear on the process of how the work plan, work plan can be changed as I've heard several commissioners effort to do so to no avail. Um, so we have this new item on an evening where we have 11 proposals. I would like to urge the commission to consider making a motion to move this item to another date as you know we have 11 topics to cover tonight. Additionally, I would like to ask the chair if we could consider having public comment after each presentation, because 11 items only allows for 10 seconds per item, which is not a very meaningful discussion. Um, in general, I don't think we have a large number of attendants, or maybe we do tonight, but I hope that we can have more time for public comment after each item versus commenting on all 11 at the very end. Again, it's really hard to make public comment with only 10 seconds per item. And so I really hope that, you know, the, the commission can consider um, moving public comment after each item presentation. Thank you. Carib and Sari. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Tarab Ansari. And I'm here to speak on behalf of the Reimagining Public Safety Community Advisory Committee. The purpose of our memorandum that was submitted to this meeting is to convey to the council and committee our support for a community oversight committee to be added to the charter through the work of the Charter Review Commission. So this relates to agenda item 6B. Um, it's, I'm gonna stop you there, Tarab. This, we're, we're only on the consent items right now. So it's just the letters from the public. So there will be a chance for you to speak to that issue when we get to it, but I'd like to um, um, wait until then so we can make sure that it's included in that discussion, if you I would. appreciate it, thank you. Thank you. Apologies. Back to the chair. Thank you, could I get a motion to pass the consent calendar? This is Commissioner so Quaytran, so moved. Thank you, Commissioner Quaytran, um, a second? Second. 
Thank you, Commissioner Fuentes. Uh, clerk can call the roll. Barbara Marshman? Yes. Christina Johnson? Yes. Elizabeth Monley? Yes. Ellie Matsumura? Yes. Enrico Callender? Aye. Frank Maitsky? Yes. Garrick Percival? Yes. George Sanchez? Yes. Lee Tran? Yes. Jeremy Barus? Yes. Jose Posadas? Oh, he said he was absent, sorry. Glenn Diep? Linda Lazat? Luis Barosio? Yes. Magnolia Siegel? Yes, and the letter from reimagining is on the consent calendar. It's one of the letters that was sent in. So hopefully um, they will have another opportunity to speak. Thank you. Maria Fuentes? Aye. Sammy Robledo? Yes. Sherry Segura? Yes. T. Tran? Yes. Tobin Gilman? Veronica Amador? Yes. Yong Zhao? Yes. That motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, members of the commission, we're going to go to the new business item, uh, which is first the final voting on um, the fair, the, I can never remember, BFCCPP. Um, and the first item is the recommendations from the subcommittee for the final vote. Uh, and Commissioner T. Tran, if you'll uh, lead that off with a motion to accept the recommendations and restate the recommendations that you're, that you're making. Sir Chair, and thank you for the opportunity. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon, or in this case, good evening. Um, I guess let's start off by, by going through the, uh, the motions that will be made. Uh, everybody here on this commission received two documents. One was the memorandum. One was um, pretty much a draft uh, of the language that would be included, as well as the proposals that were, the motions that were, were to be made. So I'll just repeat those proposals verbatim, and we'll go from there. So proposal number one is moving to recommend that the language, the, the following language, which is in the uh, SJ Fair Campaign and Political Practices draft document, pending approval from the council shall be included for the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices within the charter. So that's proposal number one. Proposal number two is moving to recommend that the following policy recommendations would be further analyzed by the entities that were listed within the document. So the first one, revamping the city webpage pertaining to council and mayoral elections that would be further analyzed by the city clerk's office um, should we move to recommend it the second would be assessing the feasibility of implementing a small donor matching funds system or program this would be analyzed by the board of fair campaign and political practices and last but not least is assessing and recommending strategies to address historical disenfranchisement this also would belong to uh, the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices for further analysis. So those are the two proposals that are being, I guess, moved. Um, a second would be much uh, grateful and appreciated. Thank you, Commissioner Tran. Uh, second to the motion? Second. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Marshman. Okay, I will now move to um, public comment and then we'll have discussion or I think if we do public comment first, then we can go to discussion. So you can hear the public first and then for the discussion and then we'll call for the vote. So the clerk can call the first speaker. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. I'm a little out of it. Um, I don't quite understand what's going on. It was my understanding that uh, there was gonna be dialogue about the future of the electoral process um, coming up. Uh, it's my hope that that voting can be, you, uh, you offer some forms of conversation about it this evening. Uh, hopefully it can be limited so we can have the long conversation about the uh, studies process issues and that the voting for the, the good ideas of the electoral voting ideas can be uh, better voted on and, and talked about at a, at a further meeting. Uh, I, I, that was also part of my letter. I hope that if that's applicable to this item, uh, you know, or to the upcoming item, uh, 
<laughs> Sorry that I'm a bit confused. Thank you. Alina Yin. Yes, I had a, a question on proposal 2B on assessing the feasibility of a small donor matching fund system. I don't remember this ever being discussed. And so I was wondering if um, Commissioner T. Tran could explain more on what exactly this is. And then also um, the same with 2C on um, how the addressing historical disfranchisement for the Board of Fair Campaigns and political practices. Thank you. Tessa Woodmancy. Thank you, Tessa Woodmancy. Well, you know, I guess this, you know, it's hard to focus on this topic because of the issues that I, I mentioned in the letter I wrote, wrote to everybody that, you know, we were supposed to, in terms of the work plan, just deal with our, the people's agendas and, you know, protecting the people from harm is really the job uh, of our government. And we're, you know, so it's hard to focus on this. I mean, it's hard enough to focus on the 13 things that are in the, um, the issues of our protecting the people from harm, the people's agenda um, issues. And then on top of it, you throw this political football into it when, you know, it's supposed, it was based on the work plan, we were supposed to be dealing only with our, our um, issues of our, the people's agenda. So now, you know, to try to address this issue, it's hard, you know, hard, hard to wrap my head around it because it wasn't supposed to be on the agenda today. And, um, you know, and it, there was supposedly significant changes and a lot of the, you know, the commissioners weren't even aware of this. So it just seems that, um, we, you know, we need to do that better. And, and then, you know, to give such little shrift to the, the people's agenda is even though like, you know, um, Vice Mayor um, Jones says, you know, I shouldn't have even put it in there. Well, that is the problem is that, you know, the, you know, protecting the people from harm is really, like I say, the job of our government. It's not business, you know, giving all of our money to businesses and, and now dealing with political issues when there's so many crises that we're facing and primarily our climate crisis that needs all of our attention. And so, you know, that's what I'm saying about this. We shouldn't be doing this at this time. Maybe we could put it off to another meeting would be better and address what was in the work plan. And that's what we're supposed to do. Back to the chair. Thank you. Um, discussion from commissioners on the motion to adopt um, a charter amendment uh, recommendation and three policy recommendations. Uh, Commissioner Matsumura, followed by Commissioner Callender. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> a request to the chair and then a question to Commissioner T. Tran. To the chair, um, you know, we've heard from a number of members of the public some confusion about this item. It, it is consistent with my memory of where we left off with it last week, but I thought you might be best positioned to, to refresh the memories of, of anybody who needs their memory refreshed about um, how it is that we've had this item come up tonight. Um, and then the question to Commissioner T. Tran is just, um, <clears throat> if you can highlight, in addition to having written um, language for the motion, are there any other revisions or additions that, that you've made um, based on the conversation that we had about this previously? Thank you. So this item is coming back to us for the third time. I believe it's the third time. Um, and as you recall, the subcommittee made a recommendation the recommendation was kind of in two parts. One was the recommendation around an amendment to the charter, which raises the BFCPP to a charter level committee. And then it also had the three recommendations, which you now have language, exact language for. Commissioner Tran described it in his last um, discussion. He made that discussion. There was a presentation on the small donor uh, idea. Um, of, it was the same time as I recall, it was the same time as we heard from uh, the subcommittee about the um, ranked choice voting. So if you remember, it was a second presentation at that time uh, on the small donor programs and what they look like. So this item is coming back for a final vote. If you recall, our process was to hear the item, to get the feedback both from the public and the commission, which we have done. And now we're coming back to the final vote so that we move it forward to our 
whatever the recommendation is or isn't, uh, moves on to the final report. Um, just as a member, just as a, um, another piece of the information, we will be going to um, all of the items. I think there's 14 recommendations, 11 items next, as soon as we get through these two items, um, which are follow-up items that we've, um, that have been continued from before. Um, and Commissioner Tran, I don't know if you had other comments. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, and, and to Commissioner Metzmore to, to respond to your question. The way I, I think of it was during the last commission meeting when we were discussing this item, we, and we ultimately threw a friendly amendment by Commissioner Percival and myself, we ended up splitting this into two parts. Um, during the most recent commission meeting, what we ended up voting on, and this feel free every uh, chair, I can't see Lawrence here. Okay, I see him on, on my video now, or, and as well as Mark, if any of you could uh, clarify, that'd be great. But my understanding last time was we voted conceptually to elevate the Board of Fair campaign and political practices from the municipal code, municipal code to the charter. Now, the language in particular that, that was there, there was clearly no language that we voted on. We just voted on from a, from a high skeletal, uh, like an umbrella to start, so to speak, that we voted and said, let's move it from one to another. What the language was, nobody had it. So this time around, we're bringing that specific language to the commission uh, for review and pretty much for a final vote. As uh, pertaining to the proposals, the three policy proposals, there was certain verbiage in the memo that conflicted with the sentiments of the, I guess in this case, the, the policy writers and the memo writers. So we went back, changed it up and made it so then the words that we said last time fit with what was the intent, which was in this case that the policy proposals would be further analyzed. Uh, there was some concern amongst uh, commissioners last week uh, about the fact that we were going to, based on the memo, the way the memo was written, we were ultimately going to tell or recommend to the council that we were going to proceed in these manners and there was some hesitancy. So um, that's where we're at, uh, to my understanding. And for the three that I mentioned earlier, feel free to chime in if you'd like. If I may, with just a quick clarification follow-up, but you, in addition to recommending study, you are also recommending that we go ahead and adopt actual changes to the charter language tonight. Is that correct? I wouldn't say actual, I wouldn't say actual charter language. I think if anything, it, it's pretty much to take what was in the municipal code, throw it into the charter, um, uh, my can I, can I understanding is the city Tran? attorney's office would, would work on that. Um, I, I'd like a readout from the city clerk because my my rec recollection was that at the last meeting there was a, a friendly amendment to separate the charter change to elevate the board of fair campaign and political practices to the to the to the charter from municipal code to separate that out from the policy recommendations. And my recommendation recollection is that this commission voted yes on the elevation of the BFCPP to the charter and that the policy recommendations are being brought back today, tonight, after uh, in a request for clarification on what those were. So um, Tony or Megan, can, can you just help us recall what the, the last meeting, what the final vote was? I can pull that, um, the final vote, if you give me a minute. I think it'd be helpful for us to refresh ourselves uh, on what that, the motion that, uh, that passed was. Okay, it's gonna take me a few minutes unless Megan has it off the top of her head. She's the one who writes the minutes, so she, she might um, remember it more quickly. Um, give me a couple minutes. I've got the votes, but I want to make sure I've, I've got the votes with the right recommendation. Why don't we move to Commissioner Callender? We'll come back. Um, Commissioner Callender and then Commissioner Huey Tran. Yeah, so that's where I was actually where Lawrence had left off. And so things were not quite clicking with me. And I do see some of these policy recommendations. I thought we said, let's elevate the, um, not the Fair Political Practice Commission, but the Board of Fair Campaign and political practices is part of the charter. And the, these remaining issues here look like policy issues, which we may want to study. I'm not prepared to vote to say to place these things into the charter. I thought- no, so, Mr. Calendar, they're not to be placed into the charter. 
these were the recommendations. The three recommendations are revamping the city web page, talking to the city clerk, assessing the small donor, giving that to the board, and assessing the disenfranchised, giving that to the board. Those were the three policy. Yeah. My understanding was that we voted yes on the raising the to the charter from the municipal code. And tonight we're just getting the actual language for, for that change for the final vote. That's so my the, recollection. On the bottom of the write up, it says, where would this amendment occur? Well, the, um, part C, it says article X of the city charter. And then part B, it's unclear to me if the A, where it says it would this occur in the municipal code or the charter. I, I, I think studying these things is probably the proper thing to do. And I would definitely be supportive of saying, let's study these things and kick them over. But I'm not sure where we are, to be very frank with you, in terms of us moving forward. But I think we did vote to elevate but I don't know that I can support anything beyond studying these issues and making a policy recommendation to study. And that's what I understand the motion to be from the subcommittee as well. Um, Commissioner Huaytran. Yes, uh, thank you. So this is, this is just kind of recap on what, how we got back here. And I think this might, I'm hoping this will be helpful. The last vote based on our understanding was it was just conceptually we were going to elevate the fair campaign portion of the charter, but the language doing so, the language that would be incorporated into the charter had not yet been approved. So part one of this proposal fills in that language specifically as to the elevation of the fair campaign board. The second part of the fair of the proposal really just is our, our policy recommendations for studies. So none of the second part of the proposal would go into the charter. Um, these are uh, uh, essentially recommended assignments for either the fair campaign board um, or, uh, or for the clerk. That's my understanding. And, and I would agree with your assessment, Commissioner Tran, uh, city clerk. Yes, um, I'm agreeing with, with Lawrence. That's what I have on the record. I have um, 14, 14 votes yes, seven no on elevating the board of fair campaign, campaign and political practices, but directing the other revisions to come back as policy changes. And so tonight, the, the subcommittee brought back two things. One is the language for the elevation and the three recommendations for policy. So the three recommendations for policy are not uh, items to go into the charter, but they're, re they're really issues for further study. And the subcommittee just su is suggesting who would be doing that, assigning that further study in our recommendation, whether it be the board or the city clerk. Um, and I actually don't rec remember uh, a conversation to bring back language tonight uh, specifically uh, around elevating the the BFCPP from the municipal code to the charter. If if the commission feels it necessary to, to vote on specific language instead of moving a, a general recommendation to the council to, to do that, then that's fine, but um, I, I think I agree with the city clerk in that it was it was a, a vote on the on that notion of, of elevating that commission and and not um, to sort of vote and then bring back language and have to vote again. So the motion tonight has been the suggestion of the language both for the elevation as well as the three policy issues. If we want to change that motion, we can, but that's the motion that's coming before us tonight. And uh, Commissioner Siegel has had her hand up for, for a little while. Commissioner Siegel, sorry, I didn't see you. It's okay. Um, our normal, uh, first of all, there was a lot of talk that the very last uh, meeting we discussed this, which we didn't, our very last meeting was a study session on policing, um, among other topics. And so this was never brought up at that time. Furthermore, our, our process has been when we make changes to language, we, when we amend, we first run that by the public in a public hearing. And I don't think that this specific language has, um, has presented to the public in a public hearing, um, nor did we really give the public notice because it really wasn't a part of the work plan. So we didn't really vote to have it on our work plan, to have it be an item that we talk about today. Um, and so I really would, I would not be comfortable voting tonight. I would really rather us, um, you're welcome to add it to um, this Saturday that's coming up as a public hearing. If, if we can add it to that, then I think that's a great process. Specific language can go to the public, the public can give feedback and then we can vote. And I just wanted to very much um, thank Commissioner Tran for all the work that he's doing. Thank you. <clears throat>
Anyone else? And I just want to clarify that that our, our process uh, is that there has been an initial presentation of of a recommendation that's heard in a public public hearing. Revisions happen after that initial presentation. There's a public hearing. There's revisions then brought back to a commission meeting for further discussion uh, and then further revision. So revisions have been made that haven't been presented at a public hearing, um, but uh, all revisions that have been made have been presented at a public meeting vis-a-vis -a, -vis a, a commission meeting. Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you to everyone for this work to clarify our process. So to, to follow up on what I'm hearing about what we are and aren't voting on tonight, um, so on the memorandum with the motion to be made, proposal one um, says it's it, and this is, if I understand correctly, the motion that's currently on the floor. So um, I want to make sure that we're crystal clear about what motion we're voting on and that it um, aligns with the rest of our, that everything that we understand that's important to us as commission is, is captured within the motion. So for proposal one, it says to move to recommend that the following language, pending approval from the council, shall be included. And so um, I, I do see, you know, what seems mostly like some pretty straightforward language and and i i think i guess so here here's a couple of questions one um what are the differences between this language that's recommended to be included in the charter and the existing language that creates the fcpp i believe it's in the municipal code um second i i do see a yellow highlight under d vacancies what's the meaning of the highlight? Uh, I guess I should say, what are the meanings of the three yellow highlights in here? And then third, specifically under E3 with that yellow highlight, it, it, does, um, it does refer to assigning the FCPP to address matters on campaign finance reform and historical disenfranchisement, which does seem to include the item that I think we're saying we want to be a policy statement in charter language. So um, so just to recap, sorry, what are the differences between this language and the existing language in the municipal code that creates the FCCP, FCPP? What are the significance of the yellow highlights? And can you explain um, the inclusion of this reference to historical disenfranchisement if we're not in fact intending to uh, make that as a charter change at this point? Well, I can certainly try my best, Commissioner Matsumura. So let's uh, let's let's go through uh, each of those parts <laughs> um, as slowly and carefully as possible. So the yellow highlights, to me, when I submitted this document, the yellow highlights were a way for us all to kind of hone in the discussion on this. Pretty much, the in my view, were the substantial quote unquote changes in the language that originally was in the municipal code. So vacancies, for example, this language, the, the, the yellow highlight in vacancies was pretty much included underneath the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices as a way of aligning it with other commissions that were listed in the city charter. That was pretty much it. It's, it's, it's pretty much just a uniformity type of uh, proposal. Uh, I, I would like to believe this was some of the additional requirements that come along with including such a commission in, in the uh, in the city charter, but I'm, I'm sure Mark Manny from the attorney's office can, can provide further clarity on that. With the other two additional, um, the, other, the other two additional yellow highlights, those were pretty much ways. The second one was to provide the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices with an idea as to what type of, pretty much what type of policies or research that they can do. Uh, in the municipal code, there wasn't, it was pretty much anything in the yellow highlights was um, not there uh, verbatim. So from the subcommittee's perspective, we decided let's list a couple of things out. We, we wish that we could list out pretty much every single possible policy, but, you know, given how the conversation at the time had, had been revolving around campaign finance reform and historical disenfranchisement, and given how all this stuff is recorded, Honestly, they can look look at it back and sit and, and and see for themselves. Oh, this is something that we can do, right? It's not they're not limited to it. They're not confined to it. They it's just two things that they can they can evaluate and do research uh, in the future. And then the last one, I think it was E five. E five is 
as well, it's also a uniformity type of uh, addition to that was in other uh, commissions that were listed on the city charter. And also another way, once again, to, re to reiterate to the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices that you have pretty much the discretion to do what you believe is, is, um, is necessary to ensure uh, that elections are are run as smoothly as possible in the city of San Jose. So hopefully I clarified that portion of your questions. Uh, unfortunately, I have now in my explanation forgot the other two portions. So if you can. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. No, thank you so much for that. Um, one, I think you at least started to answer, which is what are the differences between this language and the language that already exists in the municipal code? Um, regarding the FCPP. Um, and now that you pointed out the difference in, uh, I think you said the, the vacants, all of these are, are added, right? That, that is actually the significance of the yellow highlights is that they are changes from what's in the municipal code. Did I get that right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, and then I think the last question, and these are the only changes, the yellow highlights are the only changes relative to what's in the municipal code? Yes. Okay, thank you. They're so considered substantial, yes, in my view. Okay, um, and then for the one under E3, so I guess I just wanna echo back then, I, I think that this would add to the scope of the FCPP um, making recommendations to the council uh, with regard to matters on campaign finance reform and historical disenfranchisement. So, and that that would be under this language codified into the charter, that's actually a, a change that you all uh, under this language are recommending into the charter, not just as a policy recommendation to the city council to study it. Am I? getting that right just going for clarity here is that inadvertent or is that deliberate i guess is the question i would add to commissioner metzmer still not following unfortunately sorry okay so, can i take a pass here um you. there there was a, a part of your original four policy recommendations or considerations of your, your original recommendation the fourth was to expand the purview of the fcpp to not only look at uh, campaign and ethics, uh, campaign finance and ethics violations, but also to address matters of historical disenfranchisement. And there was a concern amongst these commissioners and members of the public that that would change the uh, requirements for commissioners and also um, really be something that that people weren't comfortable with. And so when voting happened last week, it was on specifically elevating the B the FCPP as is from municipal code to commission and for the board to study potentially expanding the purview of that commission to include issues of historical uh, addressing issues, issues of uh, <laughs> addressing issues of historical disenfranchisement. However, in this charter language, you've included that, which seems to actually take issue one from your recommendation and issue four, which commissioners only voted on 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 issue one, is that, is that okay? I, I get I get I get I get the the question you're you're trying to go with, Lawrence. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. So my explanation to that, and I unfortunately do I have a share screen option? I believe I do. So let and me. I think we could we could probably cut to the chase. Is if you drop I mean, the, to, yeah, so pretty drop much hit historical disenfranchisement. I think that there'd be a lot more support for this potential charter language because I think there was concern from commissioners about that piece of the original proposal. There, I mean, I can see the, the concern, but I also would like to highlight that in the municipal code at the moment, it says make recommendations to the city council with regard to campaign and ethics regulations and policies. The two examples, I mean, I could have listed any, any. Well, and that's very different commissioner Tran. And I think that's understood as far as elevating it, can, can, keeping the same language, but you've added another phrase that significantly changes, as we've heard from many commissioners and public speakers, significantly changes the scope of that body. And there's not an agreement that that is, if, if that were in the proposal to elevate, it, it wouldn't have passed last week. So, so uh, do you, do you understand where the concern is about voting on this language? We're basically you're asking you're basically relitigating the conversation from last week and adding adding people to vote again on something 
while changing what what they're what they're voting on. See, that's the that's the thing. I don't see where the where the changes are because the original municipal code said make recommendations, right? And with this proposal, it's pretty much listing out, for example, what things, what potential, what potential areas they can look into. It's not changing the well. You're but you're adding you're adding a, a significant chunk of new. Uh, purview <laughs> to this commission that is of concern to, to some of these commissioners. And so you, I, I think I, 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 my recommendation to you would be to draw, to keep the exact language that's in the municipal code and, and we can avoid this, this sort of um, confusion um, because uh, the, the addition of what the uh, words are always up for interpretation and, and your interpretation of what they mean is clearly different than from what other commissioners here. And so if we're simply elevating, if you're simply elevating, I, I would I would encourage you to to not change the language because changing the language is 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 I think at least in my reading, and I'm not a commissioner, is is changing the scope and purview of 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 the commission. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll let you to, think about that, Commissioner Calendar. I mean, Mr. Chairman, I was just going to call for the question. I was going to say, yeah. Um, <laughs> And have we gone to the public already on this question, this motion? I believe so. I thought we did. I thought yeah. we did. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes, we have. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure. I'm always the one that forgets it, so I really want to make sure. Okay, so the question on the table is to uh, accept the language that's been proposed in the memos, um, both on the, uh, the final language of the first the elevation um, piece, as well as the uh, the revamping, I'm sorry, the three recommendations on policy. Um, I still see some hands up, but the question's been called. Commissioner Siegel? I'm just wondering, everyone keeps saying last week. Um, Commissioner Siegel, it's the last meeting we had. We had a sub, we had a down a meeting last time, we had a study session. So I think that that's the, that they're trying to talk about the last meeting we had, not the last time we met. Not not the last, okay. And yeah. Commissioner Amador also had her hand up. And she took it down, so that's, I'm gonna, Commissioner Amador, or did you? No, it was uh, around the same question, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you, I'm wondering if there's still the opp opportunity to offer um, a friendly amendment <clears throat> that we um, recommend that the following language pending approval from the council, I'm sorry, that, that the language pending approval from the council that gets included in the city charter would be the, the language um, that is in the municipal code um, with any adjustments deemed necessary, I guess, by the city attorney um, in order to, to make it work, so to speak, in the charter. Uh, I don't know also if the city attorney has any thoughts on. Commissioner Tran, is that an acceptable friendly emotion? I think what she's trying to get to is would, it, would you would be adopting language that it would elevate from uh, a municipal code commission to a charter commission. And you would just be taking the language that, that does the elevation and you would not be saying something like a disenfranchisement. That could be a policy recommendation separate from the elevation to the charter itself. So Commissioner Matsumura's friendly amendment is to say the motion is to uh, elevate with language that reflects simply the elevation from municipal code to the charter level. Mark, Mark uh, could you provide further clarity on them? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying to follow the thread of the discussion, but what, well, well, when we have charter commissions, we do outline certain basic um, terms for qualifications as well as duties and of course vacancies you know presently with the board of fair campaign and political practices um, their uh, criteria they have special eligibility for special criteria for eligibility um, which is in the municipal code um, but otherwise uh, we just follow the regular default provisions for um, vacancies and, and reappointment um, if but you know, in terms of powers and duties as well, I mean, we could make it as broad or as specific as, as this commission wants. Important things to consider is paragraph five in the language which is highlighted, which is kind of the empower or um, enacting clause that allows the council, council to delegate 
additional responsibilities to this group if it wants or to this commission if it wants. Uh, but you know, I'll say this, we would probably wanna review this proposal. Uh, one recommendation I would have is to not cite uh, parts of the municipal code in the charter. We do have provisions where that occurs, but with this particular one, because campaign finance is relatively technical and things may or may not change, um, you know, I would suggest greater flexibility is better with respect to this particular body. Yeah, I guess my, my point of clarity to you is I, re I remember you returning back the, uh, the document with comments and one of the, um, one of the suggestions you had was instead of citing in the municipal code, cite within section 607, which is code of ethics. Um, my concern with, with changing it from municipal code to, code to section 607 of the charter is 607 pertains to code of ethics and code of ethics is usually voted on by the mayor and council based on the way the charter is written. When Correct. Correct, but 607 of the charter also requires the council to have regulations related to campaign finance, gifts, lobbying, et cetera. It doesn't prescribe what those recommend, what those regulations or laws should be, but it does require that the council enact them. Um, and that is the basis or the genesis for what's under Title 12, which I think in the past was under Title 10. It doesn't really matter what the numbering is, but that was the genesis for these ethics laws, as well as um, I believe the creation of this, of this body. So Commissioner Tran, you've had clarity from uh, the city attorney, maybe. Um, then we've also heard a friendly amendment from Commissioner Matsumura. Are you willing to accept Commissioner Matsumura's friendly amendment? Commissioner Matsumura, could, could you repeat your uh, friendly one more, one more time? Yeah, and I, I guess I'm also looking to the city attorney for, um, for advice because, you know, what, what my initial friendly amendment was, was just basically to take the language in the municipal code um, creating the FBCC and <clears throat> move that to the charter but I, I understand what you're saying is is that the type I think if I understand correctly the type of language that's that would be go in the charter to um, to codify a commission there is a different type of language than what you put into the municipal code did I understand that correctly from what you just said you're referring to me yes uh, well, what I, was, what I was trying to get at is whenever you put something in the charter, it, it enshrines it in the charter and that uh, in order to change it, it requires a vote, uh, a, a vote of, the, of the public, which, which is maybe what the commission or the council wants to do with certain things. Um, but campaign finance, uh, as well as other ethics laws can be technical. They uh, do often change as uh, the law changes or circumstances uh, on the ground changes with respect to uh, uh, new new technologies and things that arise, stuff like cryptocurrency and things like that have been a recent area of regulation in campaign finance. And so my suggestion would be to avoid enshrining too much into the charter with respect to this area be, to allow for flexibility for the council to legislate uh, if, if, if it's needed in the future. Commissioner Matsumura, could you restate your friendly amendment now? And then I'll go to Commissioner Fuentes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I guess my, my friendly amendment in a, in a sense would be um, to, to stick with the recommendation in, in concept to, to enshrine the FCPP in the charter, just recognizing that there is more involved in the work to craft the language to do that than I, I think is practical for us to do tonight. Okay, so if, if I'm hearing this correct and I'll ask the city attorney for his clarity, that's where we are already, right? We are there already. We've already, the majority of the commission has voted to move the, um, the, the, BFCC, BFCPP um, from the municipal code to the level, to elevated to the charter. That's where this commission already is. So what we have language tonight that moves that forward specifically and the 
what I what I'm hearing folks are stuck on is that last phrase that talks about the disenfranchisement of voters being in the language that were elevated. If it was just in the policy side, I think commissioners are saying they would support that on the policy side, but they don't want it to be in the in the the language actually to move this forward. And so that's where we are already, which is the conceptual level. Commissioner Fuentes, Commissioner Marshman, and then Commissioner Percival. Um, I'll just be really brief, but um, I am thinking that um, given that we're being asked to do a final vote tonight, that um, there's enough um, uncertainty as to what we're voting on, on my part anyway, I don't know about others. Mm -hmm. I would prefer to wait until we get a, you know, a new version um, that's, that's everything clean that we can really um, take our final vote upon rather than trying to vote tonight. Thank you, Commissioner Puentes. Commissioner Marshman. Having seconded the initial um, motion, which I did not have a big problem with, I I think uh, I am I am now because of the sense of the commission generally and the need to move this forward. Um, I would I would be inclined to just move the language that we have now, and and put uh, the other uh, uh, issue back in the in the policy recommendation. Uh, Commissioner Percival and Commissioner Monley. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair Fair. I'm wondering if it, it would be helpful to kind of give it because I don't think we've done this for a while. Just kind of recap the difference between, say, a policy recommendation and say policy authority under the charter, because it seems like that's where there's a lot of confusion among commissioners. Um, so maybe we should do that because I think we're going to have other policy recommendations uh as well so um because i i, th I think for what i'm understanding is that there actually is support among the commission for things like you know the study of historical disenfranchisement yeah now, what we could do as a as a as a commission is to encourage through the form of a policy recommendation for the council to you know study that and for the board i'm just going to call it the board because i can never remember the name uh, <laughs> But to to have them look at you know to have them look at this, um, but that's different than uh, you know listing very explicitly the authority over a policy that is uh, historical disenfranchisement. Like those are those are two different things, and so I'm I, but but yeah. they're very but they're, the differences are are small in, in a lot right. of ways. So correct. Yeah, I would agree. That's exactly what I'm saying. If it's a recommendation on policy, it's different than it's a recommendation that this elevated board now has this as their policy. And um, Commissioner Monley? Uh, yeah, I uh, th thank you, Commissioner Percival. And uh, I just wanna say I'm disappointed to hear that there was even a suggestion that historical disenfranchisement be omitted, deleted from this motion. Uh, from this language. I, that is why we're here. That is what is driving um, this elevated um, uh, commission. And um, I think it needs to stay in there and remind us all why, why it's here. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. I, I... I do want to also remind us of the previous discussions that we've had amongst ourselves as commissioners, as well as from the public, that um, believing that the inclusion of work to address historical disenfranchisement in this particular place, uh, does not belong in this particular place, doesn't have to do with opposing work to address historical disenfranchisement, but making sure that it is done um, by the entities within the city that are best equipped to do it. And recognizing that the qualifications, the eligibility for members to be on this board are specifically designed to have people who are not in involved in certain types of current campaign activities may limit their ability to do um, the best possible job addressing the issue of historical disenfranchisement. That's absolutely something the city can take up, just a question of who should take that up and recognizing that this commission's um, ability to do so may be more limited 
than other entities within the city. I hope that clarification is helpful. Um, Commissioner Marshman, you still have your hand up? Oh, sorry, no. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go back to Commissioner Callender, who I think talked about an hour ago to call the question. Um, so the question on the table is still the same. Um, Commissioner Tran did not accept the friendly amendment. So that the motion now is, um, and I'll try to um, uh, restate it in, in its two parts. One is to elevate the Board of Fair campaign political practice from the municipal code into the charter. And that second piece is three recommendations. One is to revamp the city website and ask the city clerk to look at that. The second is to assess the small donor program and ask the Board of Fair Campaign Political Practice to study and assess that and to assess the historical disenfranchisement. Also ask the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practice to, to assess and study that to make their recommendations to the council. So the, the motion I'm trying to make sure is clear is that there is a language proposal to move it to, to elevate it. That language and the maker of the motion's understanding is not dictating that specific piece around disenfranchisement. There's other commissioners that think it is, um, and they are not able to get a friendly amendment in right now. So we're voting on a recommendation of policy change as well as a recommendation on the charter change. This is one motion, so a vote of yes is it to accept both of those um, suggestions. One, to elevate it, and secondly, those three policy recommendations. Commissioner Quaytran. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. And just to, so, to clarify, we're voting directly on the motion. We're not voting on whether or not to call the question. That's correct. Thank you. See no further hands, I'm gonna ask the clerk to call the question. Take and the motion is the language, the written language that we have here that, that's been attached to the agenda for a few days. That is the maker of the motions um, motion, that is correct. Thank you, just double check. Yes. And just, just a point of clarity on mine, I don't think I ever actually made a decision on the friendly. Oh, so I, okay. I, yeah, I, I, we were just going straight to, to attorney Vani for clarification, so. <laughs> Commissioner Matsumura, for I, I believe this is the third time I'm asking this because of our um, numerous discussions, could you repeat your friendly amendment uh, request? Thanks for, for joining me in the amusement. <laughs> this is what group work is like sometimes. Right? Oh, trust me. We I think we all know. We all know. Um. I'm really, I, I'm really struggling with what would be the friendly, my, my, my understanding of what could be a friendly amendment that would be helpful continues to evolve. Um, you know, I think, so it, I hope it's helpful for me to offer a little bit of rationale first um, behind a friendly amendment. So I, I do think that um, uh, City Attorney Vaughn has pointed out some potential problems with this language um, going into the charter, you know, for example, that it references pieces of the municipal code. So just want to acknowledge that, acknowledge that all of this is just, these are recommendations to the city council. They will, you know, do with them as they see fit. They, are, they know how to do public policy. They do that all the time. And so um, for, for the interest of, of not, um, getting too deep into the policy and legal, legal language, but trying to address one piece that, that feels very substantive to me. Um, uh, I guess my friendly amendment would be to keep proposal two, just for clarification, keep in proposal two the, um, the recommendation for the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices to assess and recommend strategies that address historical disenfranchisement. But to strike from the language underneath that. So in section E3, the reference to historical disenfranchisement. So we'd still be making a policy recommendation that they study the issue, 
we're not saying that the charter, we're not recommending that the charter include addressing historical disenfranchisement in the scope of work of this board before they've actually done the work to study it. Would that also include camp? Would that also include striking out campaign finance reform? That seems to be the, the the sticking point amongst a handful of commissioners here. Um, so I guess my, my question, my point of clarity is if I were if we were to if I were to accept this the the, the friendly amendment and instead okay let, let me do this maybe this is easier for everybody how about this so let's say for for the purposes of this document right the friendly amendment request was to strike out this portion oh if i could for goodness sakes if i could do that that'd be great oh, oh i can't make amendments on the spot that's interesting so if i were to strike out okay yeah that actually hold on hold on sorry let me just bold let me just do this so if i were to strike out this portion over here this everything that starts from these include would that make it more uh i guess more favorable to, to other commissioners or is there still something in here that is preventing us from going where we need to go and I'm, i guess i'm asking commissioner met some more of this to be the the voice of everybody who Oh, thanks for the clarification. I was hoping to hear the voice of everybody. I mean, I, I the the piece on campaign finance reform, uh, I'll go ahead and, and say, yes, that would be, <laughs> for purposes of implicity, great. And of course, to hope from, to hear from other commissioners, it is the historical disenfranchisement piece. Um, but yeah, both of those would be great. Mm -hmm. uh, attorney Vani, back to you. So if, if the way it's going, and I think it's, it's going to go, is we're going to take everything from the Muni Code and we're going to throw it in, into the charter. Is it, if, if there are going to be situations, I, I'm sure, and you've already mentioned this, there are going to be situations where there's potential conflicts. How would the city attorney's office kind of hash, mesh out the, the conflicts? In terms of, well, what we would do with this recommendation is we would bring it before the council. Um, and if they were to you know, refer it to uh, to us to draft the ballot measure, we would probably in that circumstance then raise any issues that we see um, uh, as part of the drafting of the ballot measure and then when the, the measure is is put on uh, put on for the, for the election. So, um, so that's how we would raise, we'd likely raise those issues with them at that time. Okay, so the, the way I'm getting is regardless, it will, it will be handled appropriately, okay. We would we would provide our legal advice and opinion on on any issues that we see with 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 any language that is comes out of this commission. I've done the best I can to try to uh, you know identify those areas uh, early on, but to the extent any are missed, we will certainly do that at a later date. There'll be other opportunities for that. That's good to That's know. Good to know. So, Commissioner Tran, is your motion um, striking that that those sentences? Yes, and, and I, I for okay, and for then the sake I, of it, I will accept. I will accept the removal, okay. and I'll just say it for the record and make it easier. I will accept the friendly amendment to remove the sentence uh, underneath E three of the SJ Fair Campaign and Political Practices draft document that begin with these include but are not limited to. And thank you, Commissioner uh, Marshman. Do you accept the, as a second? Yes, uh, she does. And so, Commissioner Barosio. Hi, um, two questions. Uh, the motion, um, the maker of the friendly amendment, uh, I might have missed it, but what would be the, what was the concern? Because I definitely hear where Commissioner Tran and Commissioner Monley were, were trying to get that language in for, for, for moral and ethical purposes. Um, and then two, um, if this doesn't pass, could we run it again without the friendly amendment? I'll answer the second one as a yes, but I'll let Commissioner Matsumura answer the first one. So the concern is that in order for the city to do the best possible job with addressing historical disenfranchisement, it needs for that work to, to lie with the, the best possible body, group of folks, be it the department, a commission, the council, number of different places within the city that could lead up 
that work. Um, we, have, we have said as a commission that we believe, if I am interpreting correctly our previous discussions, how to do that, how the city can put the most muscle possible and the most effective work possible behind addressing historical disenfranchisement should be a subject of study, that we haven't adequately studied that as a commission. And so that we're not ready to say that the best way for the city to improve its work to address historical disenfranchisement is to assign that work to the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices. So to me to say both that we want to, to have <coughs> this issue studied and that we want to go ahead and say that it should lie with the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices doesn't make sense. And specifically, I, I have concerns that, that certain constraints very appropriately placed on the board so that they can do a good job with campaign ethics would actually work against making them the best place to, to lead the city's charge on addressing historical disenfranchisement. That's a concern. We don't know that. That's the purpose of recommending further study. And so the intention of the amendment is to, to recommend to the city that it conduct further study on how best to work against historical disenfranchisement and not um, sort of preempt the results of that study by going ahead and putting that responsibility in the charter under the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices. Is that clarifying? Yes, um, and at the same time, um, Attorney Mark Benny, would you be able to confirm that? Is, is, the, is the language going to monopolize um, and going to make that um, um, fair um, committee um, take control of that responsibility? Or does that language just allow them to look into it as well and all other departments can still continue um, with that uh, equity work? It, it would be the latter unless it was specifically carved out just for that body. Uh, it would give the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices the, I guess, jurisdiction to make re uh, recommendations with respect to historical disenfranchisement, but it wouldn't prevent the City Council from then also um, giving that responsibility uh, or having another body take a look at it uh, as well. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And yes, just to clarify, uh, of course, and at the same time, in, that would certainly, I think it could discourage the city council from assigning it to another commission or per, perhaps even establishing a commission whose role is specifically to improve voter engagement, combat disenfranchisement in San Jose, because because that could look duplicative. So I'm worried that if we assign that to a commission that's less than optimally equipped to do it, it sort of takes up space for, for somebody else to be able to do it with the accusation that that accusation, that sounds so terrible, with the concern that that work would be duplicative. Okay, okay. I'm gonna call the question because I think we need to, we need to move on, um, but I also wanna make sure that, um, because if this doesn't pass and we have a second motion, I wanna make sure we can get to that as well. So um, the motion is that we would accept the language by the subcommittee around the elevation as well as the recommendations um, with the striking of that language uh, that, that Commissioner Titran has stated into the record. Uh, the clerk, so a yes vote is to accept the language as proposed, a no vote is to not accept it, and I'll ask the clerk to take the vote. Barbara Marshman? Yes. Christina Johnson? No. Elizabeth Monley? No. Ellie Monsonaro? Yes. Enrico Callender? No. Frank Kamitsky? Yes. Eric Percival? Um. <laughs> Uh, okay, I guess, I, no. George Sanchez? No. Hui Tran? No. Jeremy Barus? No. Jose Posadas? Yes. Lundiep? 
Linda Lizotte. Luis Barocio. No. Magnolia Siegel. No. Maria Fuentes. No. Sammy Robledo. No. Jerry Segura. No. T. Tran. Yes. Tobin Gilman. Veronica Amador. No. Yong Zhao. Yong Zhao. No. That motion does not pass uh, by a vote of five yes votes and 14 no votes. Um, Commissioner Tran, do you want to make a motion without the friendly amendment? Wouldn't we be back at the same starting point as the first? <laughs> The uh, first proposal. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think your no vote is indi indication that the commission is still not satisfied. That's why I'll, I'll ask: Is there another motion? Does anybody want to put another motion on the table? I'm actually intrigued to, to hear if there's any other proposed ones, maybe to help <laughs> resolve this. Commissioner Baytran, and then Commissioner Calendar. I move to adopt the memo as originally presented. There's a motion. Is a second. A second. second. Commissioner Brosio is a second. Commissioner Callender, you take your hand down. Okay. Um, any other discussion? All right. On this motion, we need to go to the public. The uh, clerk can call the first. Um... Yes, I would, Nancy. Thank you. Okay, well, um, I wasn't really following the whole thing, but like I said, it seems like there's a lot of dissension about, I think that's the word, um, there's not a lot of agreement um, in regards to even, you know, having this um, issue. But the one thing you, you keep mentioning is about like <clears throat> something to do with, um, you know, dealing with uh, disenfranchised people and things like that. I'm interested to know exactly how that would be, how we actually help disenfranchise people or something like that, that you're suggesting it go, you know, to, to it. But, you know, basically, um, I guess you don't have the issue um, of what, it would be nice if we had a little card that said exactly what we were doing, with, like the way the council has it on the, the Zoom agenda, so we know what we're talking about. So, or to refresh us. Um, Anyway, so basically voting on some issue about um, fair, fair elections and things like that. And, you know, these are, you know, good, good, good issues and hope you figure them out and that we could get on to the rest of the agenda that we're all waiting to have addressed um, in terms of the people's, you know, agenda that we're hoping. So hopefully we can resolve these issues as quickly as we can and get on to the um, issues of the people's agenda. Um, and protecting us from the harms that uh, are being addressed in that agenda. Um, so hopefully we can resolve these um, political issues as quickly as possible and um, appreciate all everybody's efforts at trying to, to do that. So thank you for all of your work, commissioners. Thank you. I, 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 whatever they do in my time, you can have my, what is Mayor Beekman? Hi, Blair Beekman here. I think the term is I yield my time for, t for what Tessa was just asking about. Thanks a lot for Tessa's words. Uh, I don't yield my time, by the way. <laughs> I, I need to speak uh, at this time. Thanks a lot for Tessa's words. And um, yeah, I, uh, I guess to start off, uh, you are trying to address, can people mute themselves right now? Uh, thank you. Um, I'm trying to, uh, it's important for myself, just right off the bat, but thank you for working on uh, election issues. Uh, I hope you can work on the concept of, of the money issues and, and what, the, it's been mentioned in the memo how to keep uh, money local and how, how can there be a future process to invite 
people who are who can't be involved, who it's difficult for them to be involved with the process because of money issues, how can they become more involved in the political process and, and in the campaign process in the future? I hope you really can address that. It's, it's really important. Um, with that said, uh, you know, it sounds like I'm a bit confused with this item, obviously, as always. It sounds like the, everyone's a bit confused. Maybe to give this uh, item some thought, it can come back to it in a few weeks at the end of the month, maybe, and, and things can be more clear in, in understanding. Um, but and, until then, you know, I, I, I also hope that uh, of what's coming from city government staff isn't an excuse to keep these sort of projects away from a progressive, good thinking public. Uh, I have that worry that that's what her language is saying. I'm not positive. I hope not. Uh, you know, we can do something really progressive and important in this time. And don't be afraid of it. Uh, I guess that's my only advice at this time. Thank you. All in user one. Yeah, it was kind of hard to follow this whole thing, given the cryptic language that you guys were using. You know, I, I try to follow these things, and it was a bit difficult. It seemed as if it was like campaign finance reform, or like what uh, Blair said, local money. But it's very hard to control cash, much as you know we have all these you know ways of trying to control campaign finances and whatnot i don't like i say it was it was you guys were speaking in another language i don't know why maybe because you didn't want to talk about it it's a little too real i mean you work at a radio station which i used to the people who supported both parties or you know whatever they were supporting always came in last minute with a suitcase full of cash radio station took it no questions asked paying the highest you know per minute for their ads and they had to be paid up way before they could not do it uh or had to be paid before it aired so you know the people who came in with the money i don't care what political party they were in it was a bit shady so i i don't think you're going to keep shady money or shady redistricting out of politics it's just it's just the way it is we're a democrat controlled city here so it would be the snake eating itself who's ever against it so I, I don't really feel that there's much you could do uh, with when there's cash money involved all the time. And, and of course, favors. I mean, when I lived in Spain, people used to get uh, horses, fighting bulls, fur coats, things, you know, gold, other, you know, things that were worth money that nobody knew about. Who knows about a fighting bull grazing in a field somewhere, a horse in a stable, all worth tens of thousands of Rob and sorry. Thank you. Uh, and just a point of clarification from this public comment, I'm speaking for myself and myself only. Um, thank you to the commissioners who uh, made it a point to make sure that the language about disenfranchised communities remains on their recommendation. Um, I do not believe that uh, the assumption that including it here in this scope would remove or disincentivize it from being adding it somewhere else is reason to remove it here, given the history of, of disenfranchisement of communities of color in this country. So I appreciate the work of the commissioners who, who made it a point to have it stay. Uh, and I would ask that maybe if there is an issue with the wording that the commission consider an amendment that removes the, the sentence that was being um, discussed, but chooses to keep that last wording about disenfranchisement and maybe removes the first part of that with the issue. Thank you and I yield my time. Alina Yin. Um, thank you, commissioners. Uh, I echo previous um, speakers that it was very confusing and hard to follow. Um, though what I am observing is that I don't think anybody on the commission is against studying dif uh, disenfranchisement. Um, it's more of where that role and responsibility, the staff time and resources, where that best lies, whether it's the Office of Racial Equity or if the, the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices was consulted about language. I'm curious to know. And um, I'm blanking on the last part. Um, 
Okay, I can't remember, so I yield my time. Thank you. Back to the chair. Thank you. The um, Let's take the roll, the vote on the um, question on hand. The original language, a uh, yes vote is to accept the original language as proposed by uh, Commissioner Tran earlier tonight. Uh, it's the language that was posted to our packets. Uh, take the roll, take the vote, please. Barbara Marshman? Yes. Christina Johnson? No. Elizabeth Monley? Yes. Ellie Monsamura? No. Enrico Callender? No. Frank Macy? Yes. Garrick Percival? Yes. George Sanchez? No. Lee Tran? Yes. Jeremy Bruce? No. Jose Posadas? Yes. Lynn Diep, Linda Lazat, Luis Barosio? Yes. Magnolia Siegel? No, because we do have the Racial Equity Office, and I think that would be a better place to study historical disenfranchisement. Maria Fuentes? No. Sammy Robledo? Yes. Jerry Segura? No. Lee Tran? Yes. Tobin Gilman? Veronica Amador? No. Yong Zhao? No. That motion does not pass uh, with 10 no votes and nine yes votes. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's move on to the next item, which is Commissioner Percival going to be describing to us the transition of the election cycle for odd-numbered districts. Commissioner Percival. Uh, yeah, okay, thanks. I'll, I'll keep this very brief because uh, we're looking at, a, we got, a, I know, a really busy, busy agenda uh, still to come. So um, this issue we actually talked about uh, what seems like a couple of years ago, but it was actually last spring um, where our subcommittee uh, submitted a memo, I was just going through my records for the meeting uh, back in May on this very topic. So it is in the, it is officially part of the record. Uh, and this is data that I compiled with um, a couple of my colleagues at San Jose State looking at uh, the differences in turnout in odd uh, versus even number council districts. And this is a, a topic that the city council specifically asked the commission to, to look into. So we did that and we uh, presented the data to our uh, subcommittee on voting and elections. And after that study, we decided not to move forward with a recommendation, in part because the, although we saw clear differences between turnout and odd versus even number districts, some of the biggest turnout differences are between primary and runoff elections. And we see those in both odd and even number districts so although we could certainly make a recommendation to try to increase turnout in odd number districts, we would knowingly be decreasing turnout in even number districts. And when we combine that with our ranked choice voting uh, study, which eventually came a recommendation and a positive uh, supportive vote by this commission, uh, we felt that that was sort of alleviate some of the problems under the current system and structure. So if that does move forward by the council and voters support that, we believe some of those differences will be alleviated. So that's all I have to say on that, unless uh, anyone else has, uh, has any questions. Any questions? Seeing none, then thank you, Commissioner Percival. Let us move on to our next item, which is the PMLA subcommittee recommendations. Um, I just want to recap our process. Chair uh, and, and city clerk, do we need to take public comment on that item? If we're taking, an, taking it on every item after it's discussed, then yes. Okay. This is the commission not taking action on the transition of the election cycle for odd number districts. 
because of the previous actions that the commission is taking in terms of its recommendations. I'd ask the public to really, it helps us when we really stick to the issue we're talking about because we have a lot of stuff to get through tonight. So I'd really ask everyone to stay as close to topic as possible. So the commission is not taking action on this item. So clerk can call the first speaker. Clerk Beekman. Thank you for taking public comment at this time. This will take 25 seconds, thank you. I simply wanted to ask, as you're gonna have uh, present uh, about 11 items uh, of the draft recommendations, is it possible to split up public comment into two sections, maybe after five items, have some public comment, and then after the previous uh, remaining six, you can have another set of public comment. Uh, that's my idea and suggestion. Thanks for listening at this time. Back to the chair. Thank you, Mr. Beekman. I'm gonna go through the uh, process right now. Um, just as we have on other items, we will give each subcommittee um, the ability to um, present the overview or the recommendation with an eight minute maximum. And I would really encourage folks to make that a, a not necessarily eight minutes since we have so many items and we wanna have a lot of good discussion. Um, I'd ask you focus on the recommendation about the process. Could commissioners mute themselves? Thank you. Um, secondly, we will have a discussion on the memo. We will then ask for public comment. We will go to public comment on all 11 -ish items as they come up, um, as we did in the past. Um, the subcommittee will then be able to hear um, both commissioners as well as the public, and then they can make revisions as necessary best based on that feedback. Um, they will come back to us in the public hearing. They will have they may have been changed their recommendations from your comments tonight. Uh, they'll represent those in the public hearing on November 6th. Uh, and following that, we will then be able to take a straw vote uh, before we take our final vote on these items. Uh, I wanna thank the commissioners for their diligence tonight and for all these um, items. I know these are uh, very important to us. Uh, I wanna go on record for one item. I was out of town, but I got a number of text messages uh, that the Mercury News um, did cover our rules committee meeting and a number of commissioners spoke on their own behalf as I did. Um, and I don't, I don't, if you read the byline, the byline is incorrect. I'm not sure where um, the Mercury News got the byline. I, it's not my position as chair that we would not be taking up issues of police or climate. Uh, they uh, were taking up the recommendations of all the subcommittees and that was what I said in my comments was my personal position was that we would be able to make sure that we, all the issues that we studied, we we're going to make recommendations on or not, depending on the will of the commission, but that we would still be able to meet our timeline and turn our report in at the end of November. So I just wanna go on record to make sure that um, the commissioners are clear. That was never anything I said. So I don't know where the Mercury News got that by, that that byline was incorrect and I don't know their source. Um, I'm not gonna address the Mercury News. I just wanted to go on record here to you tonight as we begin these very important discussions. So let us get started. The first item is Article 10, Boards and Commissions Reform. Commissioner Amador, would you please be our first speaker tonight to make recommendations um, on language to the Charter? Commissioner Amador. Chair, I think Ms. Fr Maria Fuentes is going to speak first on, on all of our um, behalfs, just briefly. My apologies, I did not, I just, just didn't get that note, Commissioner Fuentes. Okay, this is just gonna be very brief because we, we're so late in our time right now. Um, I just wanted to say to, um, to you, um, Chair Ferrer and Vice Chair Johnson and commissioners and the public, um, how important um, these, these 11 recommendations are to our community. Um, you know, we always talk about leaving a, a better place for our children. And, um, you know, we think of the future of our children and our grandchildren and our community. And I think every single, every single recommendation that this commission is going to hear tonight is about that and is about our future. And I hope that you will all take everything very seriously. I hope that we can support what is being presented tonight, because if you think of it all together, it really addresses some of the key issues and needs we have here in our city of San Jose. And um, 
I think um, I just want to add that the way it's being presented is that um, the first um, part will be all the the recommendations that are actually charter changes, and then the last two are are um, policy recommendations. And um, I think with that, um, you, you'll be introducing everyone, Chair Ferrer. So I think we're ready to get going. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Fuentes. Commissioner Amador. Great. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, I am going to be sharing my screen. Um, my internet has been unstable, so I'm going to keep my camera off while I share my screen uh, to make sure I get the best Wi Fi as possible. And Okay, great. Thank you so much, everyone. And one more time, my name is Commis uh, my name is Veronica Madoro. Um, and this was also drafted in collaboration with Commissioner Magnolia Siegel, um, Commissioner Rick Callender, Commissioner Sherry Segura, and Commissioner Jenny Zhao. Um, and this proposal was actually originally drafted by Ali Nayen with input from community. And the proposed charter amendments are on Article 10, Boards and Commissions. And so when we go to what are the problems that we're trying to address, this proposal seeks to improve accountability, representation, and inclusion under a racial equity lens with boards and commissions at the city of San Jose. For council, the Charter Review Commission has been tasked with the following directives, especially the following directives pertaining to the commission's work, which was number five, to consider additional measures and potential charter amendments as needed that will improve accountability, representation, and inclusion at San Jose City Hall. This also, additionally, this proposal aligns with the city of San Jose newly created Office of Racial Equity in advancing systems of change through a citywide racial equity framework that will examine and improve San Jose internal policies, programs, and practices to eradicate any structural and or institutional racism in the city of San Jose. This includes a focus on enabling, and I'm going to quote, now, um, this includes a focus on enabling the organization at all levels and in all departments to identify ways to improve outcomes for Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and people of color, end quote. Lastly, this proposal also aligns with commissioners' agreements um, that we set at the beginning. We value diversity. We believe that bringing together a broad range of ideas, experience, and backgrounds will result in the outcomes of San Jose. We keep an open mind and seek to learn from others. And the burden of proof. How has this problem, again, going back to um, what we had drafted in how our memos and policy and amendments are written, how has this problem possibly benefited or burdened people, especially BIPOC, uh, low-income, undocumented, and immigrants, those experiencing um, houselessness, et cetera? Um, and I'm bringing back this data that was actually presented by um, one of our community members, Lena Yen, um, given us, um, again, the data that she had gathered. According to data gathered from the last three years by the city clerk, Office of, of San Jose, the representation across boards and commissions are not representative of the population demographic of the city of San Jose. Um, and this is, again, was something quick that, um, you know, Alina had already drafted and we had had a conversation, well, not a discussion, but a presentation from Alina. What this data clearly indicates is the racial disparities in government boards and commissions, how this impacts BIPOC, low income, undocumented, and those experiences. Houselessness can be seen by focusing on the Planning Commission, a very powerful commission that up until recently did not have diverse representation for communities of color. The impact of that lack of diversity can be felt historically redlined communities, for example, the flea market re redevelopment and rezoning that has that was decided in the early 2000 via resolution numbers 73956 and 71362. It's felt very vividly today by many vendors and their families. And I quote, today plans for the proposed urban village would shut down two thirds of vendors because of the market reduced size without plans to protect or relocate the flea market. Vendors who depend on it as on it as main source of income would be displaced and left without employment. And this is a quote from San Jose's Fault Live. 
what would this have looked like if there was more representation on boards and commissions from our historically marginalized communities, such as our immigrant and our undocumented community members? Representation by those with the lived experience and hardships, for example, of displacement and gentrification mean that those individuals will be able to spot policy decisions that could have unintended negative impacts that could otherwise go unnoticed or settled by those who do not face any impact with what it is less than acceptable what is needed to survive in one of the most expensive places to live in the country. While we cannot undo the past, now is the time of, to course correct to prevent further community harm to our historically underrepresented communities. And what changes are we proposing? So on Article 10, Boards and Commissions, we have um, Section 1000, Planning Commission, um, and I'll go a little bit more over on that. Uh, the second change on, again, Article 10 is Section 1002, Older Boards and Commissions. And then the third change is going to be on Section 1003, Reimbursements for Expenses. So on Section uh, 1000, or 1000, Planning Commission, it is to remove item A and B to align with the Senate Bill 225, update Senate guidelines on equity and inclusion for government boards and commission. So again, um, just a reminder of Senate Bill 225 is that um, residents of the city can sit down on commission boards. Um, we also would be adding a new section, F, to incorporate racial and social equity analysis to promote the use of equity lens. For planning, an equity lens is a tool used to improve planning decisions, making, and resource allocations leading to more racially equitable policies and programs. For any policy or project decision makers could consider, and the following can be considered, structural equity, what historic disadvantages and advantages have affected residents in the given community. Number two, for uh, procedural equity, how are residents who have been historically excluded from planning process being authentically included in the planning and implementation and evaluation of the proposed policy project? Number three, distribution equity. Does the distribution of civic resources and investment explicitly account for potentially racially disparate outcomes? And number four, transgenerational equity. Does the policy or project result in an unfair burden on future generations? And are there other examples of this change? And yes, there are other examples of these changes across the country and the state of California. For example, most recently, the city of Santa Ana and Costa Mesa have updated their boards and commission meeting, uh, membership requirements to remove these barriers to participate and align with Senate Bill 225, passed in 2019, um, which the California legislator finds and declares all of the following. A, the state of California is the largest and most diverse state in the nation with a total population of almost 40 million people and a total immigrant population of about 10 million people from over 60 different countries. B, California prides itself on its great racial, ethnic, and cultural diversity and acknowledges that diverse backgrounds benefit the state through providing a diverse of experience and expertise. And this diverse is especially beneficial in creating public policy to support and protest all people. Sorry, uh, protects all people. And again, yes, this is an amendment to membership requirements and does not have fiscal impacts or impacts on implementation, current operations, and staff time. Um, and in the section, 1000 again in the planning commission adding the new section f like i had mentioned before um one more time these are the new incorporate the racial social equity analysis to promote the use of equity lens that i had just talked about and yes in partnership with the phase um again section 1000 on planning commission and in partnership with a phase approach with Appropriate departments such as, but not limited to the Office of Racial Equity, also following Government Alliance on Racial Equity. Additionally, the American Planning Association, which has over 40,000 members from 90 countries, released a planning for equity guide in 2019 supporting these practices and the city of Baltimore practices of incorporating a racial equity lens into their entire planning department. So again, it's very, something that can be done, right? One more time. Yes, this can be an evaluation survey or forum 
for the Planning Commission in partnership with the FACE approach with appropriate departments such as, but not limited to the Office of Racial Equity and following cities like the Baltimore, GARE, and the American Planning Association Equity uh, and Policy Guide. And section 1002, other boards and commissions, it would be adding new changes. Uh, the number one would be training and education. All boards and commission members are subject to training that addresses gender, racial, and social equity and related civic education as required, such as the Brown Act, Rosenberg, Roberts Rules of Order, etc. And the second change would be, or adding the, the second, um, adding the second new section would be chair uh, and vice chair selections. So all boards, commissions, and committees should have a chair and vice chair democratically selected through a vote of the majority of members of said board, commission, or committee. On section 1002, other boards and commission, on the, when it comes to the training um, and education, yes, we currently uh, have trainings and education is provided on ethics and sexual harassment and on the Brown Act and Sunshine Rules via video. And then going on the chair and vice chair selection, again, yes, most commissions, unless otherwise stipulated, democratically nominate, select a chair and vice chair through a majority vote of members on said boards, commissions, and committees. So is this change feasible? Um, for section A, adding the training and education, yes. Currently training and education is provided on ethics and sexual harassment and the Brown Act and Sunshine Rules via video. Using the same video format of delivery presentation adapted from the Office of Racial Equity and Santa Clara County Office of LGBTQ plus affairs, part of the Division of Equity and Social Justice. And for adding B, chairs and vice chair selection. Yes, most of the commissions, unless otherwise is stipulated, democratically nominate and select a chair and vice chair through a majority vote of members on said boards, commissions, and committees. This is a procedural amendment with no fiscal or staff impact. Now we're moving on to section, um, which is the last uh, amendment on section 1003, reimbursement for expenses. Um, and this is um, adding all members of boards and commissions and committees should receive a stipend, um, end quote, to remove any social economic barriers to civic participation within boards and commission. Um, and then are there any other examples of this change? Yes, there are examples of this within the city of San Jose of stipends as seen here on our screen. Um, so on our screen, we do have a picture that shows a stipend specifically. Um, this is for the membership. This is for the planning commission. They get about a stipend of $250 a month and it's um, on their website. And I, there's a few listed up here as well that you guys can see. And it's the Fair Compensation Advisory Committee, Voluntary Employees, Beneficiary Associate Advisory Committees are reimbursed only. So I do wanna make that clear. And is this change feasible? Yes, currently 39 members receive a stipend or reimbursement, which is roughly about 11% of commissioners. Through a continued phase approach, some members of boards and commissions could be moved to reimbursement and eventually stipend as properly determined via budget considerations. Um, must this be a charter revision? Yes, all of these changes directly impact and fall under the current section of Article 10, Boards and Commissions. And what are the arguments against this proposal? So I'm going to present three of the arguments here. One is there is no budget available to support this work. It will cost taxpayers too much money. Two, the city of San Jose does not have a diversity and or racial equity problem. And three, there is not enough data available that can ensure equitable outcomes. So for number one, on that argument, there is no budget available to support this work. It will cost taxpayers um, too much money. Improving social and racial equity will require some equity to be invested into our communities. This investment is also supported by the most recent mayor's budget message on spending proposal section A, equity and racial justice. On items one, removing item A and B, there is no fiscal impact as is a changes in the membership requirement and it's not impact staff or resources. On item two and three, the city of San Jose already allocates time and budget to support the work of boards, commissions, and committees. Through a face approach, it 
it is fiscal, fiscally feasible to create those increments changes over time in partnership with other city departments. I'm going to argument number two, the city of San Jose does not have a diversity and or racial equity problem. As the data gathered and collected by the city clerk's office on boards and commissions, there is a clear evidence of lack of diversity and representation and direct impact to BIPOC low income undocumented and those experiencing houselessness as a result. And what I had shared earlier on the planning commission, commission examples as well. And number three, there is not enough data available that can ensure equitable outcomes. While there is not as much data documented long-term impacts that ensure more equitable outcomes, we do have some direct and specific data such as gathered and collected by the city um, clerk office on boards and commissions. And there is clear evidence of lack of diversity and representation and direct impact to BIPOC low income undocumented and those experiencing houselessness as a result. Additionally, equitable data collection is not widely practiced at the city of San Jose yet. However, the formation of the Office of Racial Equity is a step towards better practice. Our first most significant step that can be taken is equ equitable conclusion through removing barriers to participation. And who might benefit from or be burdened by this change? So equity is defined as just and fair inclusion into a society in which all can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential, unlocking the promise of the nation by unleashing the promise in all. So this is a quote from the American Planning Association. The changes will benefit all the people of San Jose, not right away or all at once, but over time. Who might, uh, again, as we go, who might benefit from or be burdened by this change? The burden of change weights on everyone, all participants, both those on the city and staff and residents stepping into a unfamiliar environment and rules to create sustainable and long lasting changes for our city and communities that improve social and racial equity, accountability and inclusion. We're all human, all in serving of life, job, safety, shelter and sus uh, sustenance. As a member of this community, we're all responsible for that care that goes into building community and meaningful connections now and for future regenerations. Some people are more privileged than others. So while less privileged are overburdened with surviving unfair and equitable systems, those that are privileged like every person here that has made it enough to volunteer over a hundred hours for free, it is our civic duty and responsibility to rely, relive every burden possible that is within our ability to do. And again, the time for change is now, um, and this is something that it cannot wait. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Amador. So Commissioner Amador presented extremely quickly, organized, and she took twice as much time. So eight minutes goes really fast, folks. Um, but thank you, Commissioner Amador, for an excellent presentation, very organized, tight. She couldn't make it any faster, but just, just giving folks a heads up around our timing tonight. Uh, first item is commissioners' discussion, questions, uh, feedback, comments to Commissioner Amador's um, presentation. Commissioner Fei Tran. Uh, fully supportive of the proposal. The housing department has actually been considering ways to expand and provide support so that we can actually bring in uh, the, the, the viewpoint and perspectives of people with lived experience as well. So making this a citywide practice is uh, something I strongly support. Thank you, Commissioner Tran. Any other thoughts, comments, questions, or feedback? Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Johnson. I wanted to thank you, the subcommittee, for bringing forward this recommendation. I'm fully in support of it and think it's great to make this process more inclusive, equitable, and accessible for residents in our community to participate in boards and commissions. Thank you. Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. And I'll do my customary once a meeting apology that I am mostly off camera. My internet apparently can't handle this meeting and taking notes at the same time. I'll try to go on camera when I can. Um, and apologies again uh, to my fellow commissioners, staff, and the public. Um, a few questions um, for the presenters. And, and thank you for this. And I'm just going to say thank you for, for all of the education and all of the work. Um, over the past few months, really excited to see it starting to culminate tonight. 
Um, first question is, are there other instances in the charter um, of a citizenship requirement for um, membership in a border commission or, or any other office within the city? Commissioner, um, City Attorney Vanny, do you want to answer that question? Yes, I can. So in the charter, there, there are three places. There's a citizen, citizenship requirement explicitly to be a member of the Planning Commission. And then also with the Salary Setting Commission and um, Civil Service Commission, you have to be a qualified elector, which requires one to be over the age of 18 and uh, also a, 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 someone who's eligible to vote, which requires you to be a citizen. Thank you. And that reminds me actually, wasn't that also in the um, recommended language for the FCPP to, to be a qualified elector? Correct, that, that's specified in the municipal code currently. Okay, thank you so much for that. So, so I wonder whether um, this committee considered striking citizenship requirements from other commissions as well, or uh, only the planning commission? Commissioner Amador, would you like to respond? Yes, um, I believe right now, um, SV225, um, it's something that it's, um, you know, in support of, and I think it would be also very well to um, make sure we align the whole wording, even in those two other commissions. And if that is um, a feedback, I can definitely bring that back to make sure that it is um, a, as part of their recommendation as well. Thank you. Of course, I want to hear the you know thoughts of your committee on that and other commissioners in the public, but but would be very interested uh, in the possibility of pursuing that. Um, a second question for I believe for you all, um, perhaps it's for the city attorney as well. Um, which boards and commissions currently have a chair and or vice chair that are appointed by the mayor and or council versus elected. I'm, I'm trying to, by um, members of the border commission, I'm trying to understand the, whether the proposed change affects, you know, two commissions, 27 commissions, like sort of what, what the scale of impact is, so to speak. Um, the only, this is Tony Tabor, city clerk. The only commissions I can think of where the mayor or somebody appoints the chair is this one and redistricting. Um, in the others, the chair is selected by the boards or commissions. And, and if I may add too, there, there are some commissions that require an attorney to be um, on, to sit on the commission. Um, civil service comes to mind and, and the attorney's role, even if they're not the chair, is during an administrative hearing, they typically will will run that hearing uh, since they have a legal background. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, and then last item from me is just noting that um, this recommendation talks about requiring the planning commission to conduct equity analysis, if I'm understanding that correctly, and also uh, training for um, appointed officials on equity, you know, it seems to me that we've got sort of different definitions of equity, kind of bullet points for an equity analysis and scopes of equity. By scope, I mean, you know, in the reference to training, it talks about, I think, race, gender, and social. And it, it seems like it might be valuable to, to kind of consolidate that, you know, recommendation number five brought forward by Commissioner Callender that we'll be talking about later and building on the presentation by Bob Brownstein has like a nice big chunk of language about equity and, I, and, and how we can apply equity across the city. And so I just wonder whether it might work to kind of have any other places in the charter where we want to refer to equity, kind of point back to that single definition, whether or not we keep the exact language in that recommendation is something we'll discuss later, you know, and, and maybe requiring the planning commission to do an equity assessment could could go in there right because right now it would require an equity assessment for the budget maybe the planning commission too so i'm i'm sort of trying to propose some thoughts again deferring to the the sort of lead thinking of your committee on this 
for how we kind of tighten and consolidate and make sure that we don't have slightly different things in different places in the charter. That's it for me. Any other thoughts, comments, feedback from other commissioners? Great, seeing none, we're gonna to go to the public. Clerk can call the first speaker. Call in user one. Yeah, I'd like to know how you're gonna define equity for everybody. It, it's gonna be almost impossible to do so. I mean, if there's a disagreement among people, who's gonna, who's gonna have, what, what's the outcome gonna be? Uh, you know, is it gonna be by how we use gender pronouns? Is it gonna be what your political ideologies are or are not? It seems pretty vague that you're gonna try to be completely equal for every single thing. There's no way that everybody on that panel, one person's better at something than the other person, or they're better at uh, you know their job or a better person. I think this thing with equity is very, very vague and wide open. And it's gonna be used against people. It's not gonna be used for people. So I could guarantee you I haven't been treated with equity by this city in my whole life on all levels. And I don't see them changing anytime soon, I could tell you. So if you think there's gonna be this perfect equity in every single thing, I, I think you're fooling yourself. Quite frankly, there's a lot of people who say they don't have equity. They have more power than that, than other people. And I think if you start to, you know, use your mind a little bit, you could figure you could figure it out. Equity is going to be used as a weapon against people. It's not going to be used as something positive. And I could tell you the way I've been treated, I can guarantee you there is an equity, and I could prove it. So. I'd like to have a little bit more definition from the people who seem to be promoting this and who's going to enforce it, enforce it. And what are the punishments and the fines and the fees going to be? I'd like to know. I, I dare anybody on this. Tessa Woodmancy. Okay. Thank you. Tessa Woodmancy. Um, yeah, well, it was a fabulous uh, presentation. It was very educational, and I um, very much appreciate um, Ellie, um, the woman who was, um, you know, I think it's Ellie Yin or something, who actually gave that first presentation, which was so informational about commissions and, um, and how they started as, you know, giving people a voice. So um, anyway, Alina, Alina Yin, I guess was, I guess she maybe was the one who presented that, that first time when we heard about commissions and the history of commissions was really educational. So this whole presentation was very good. It was really excellently done and really easy to follow. And, um, you know, it's inspirational, like what, you know, what they're asking for, which is more equity to say that you don't have to be a citizen, to say that, you know, you can just be a, a um, live in San Jose and th those type of things. And then paying, I thought that was a good to see into the structure of our city you know that some of the commissions do pay and i thought that that's really neat and um so you know i think that you know creates an equity to have people be supported to do this work um of volunteering is is a great idea and so yeah i'm definitely supportive of the the changes um that are being presented and appreciate just um, a look into the commissions that this whole um, charter review commission has done is just so exciting to see, you know, um, just sort of opening the door of what our, our city is about. And it's just been a great education and, you know, getting more people involved is, is really great. And that's, you know, what democracy is supposed to be about. So we appreciate it. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman. I just wanted to quickly offer a, a thank you that you'll be taking public comment on each uh, draft recommendation tonight. Thanks a lot. Back to the chair. Thank you, Commissioner Amador. Our next item is um, Native Land Acknowledgement, and Commissioner Segura is going to be speaking on that tonight. Commissioner Segura. 
Okay, I am trying to share my screen. It's here we go. Okay. Mm. Can you see it? Yep. Okay, trying to um, get to these little three buttons here to make it a presentation style. It doesn't seem to be working, but you can all see it, correct? Okay. I am also not able to, oh, there it goes. Okay. Okay, so we'll just have to, sorry, I apologize for the other part, but it's not allowing me to make it uh, go in presentation style. So um, I am going to present on behalf of my subcommittee. You can see all of the people here and the commissioners in my subcommittee that worked on this. <clears throat> I will go fast because I know we are um, stretched for time. So the problem that we identified is um, basically the secularization of Bay Area, um, of the Bay Area has caused harm to indigenous people. Um, you know, some of the examples are taking and not returning land occupied by tribes, past government policies that exterminated native language, cultural practices and religious rights, and it caused trauma to generations of native, native people. The loss of their native language and lack of acknowledgement continues to cause them harm. So why a charter revision? Um, including this in our charter is of the utmost importance to our native community. It is the first step to healing the community by acknowledging its importance to the Muwakma Ohlone tribe and other indigenous people. The benefits of this, a native land acknowledgement will support the healing of generations of trauma and promote them in finding their voice in the conversation of where and how they fit into the diverse community of the Bay Area. Land acknowledgements are very important for the healing process. They recognize the existence of native people, not only that they were here in some distant past, but rather that they are alive and thriving. The Moekwa Ohlone people are stewards in their cultural ancest um, ancestral land, preserving their connections from the past to future generations. This acknowledgement will also recognize and show appreciation for the contributions their ancestors have made to our history. The feasibility of this is, you know, to our knowledge, becoming a common practice in many places in California and the rest of the country. And, you know, our subcommittee is not aware of any law prohibiting such an acknowledgement. Wanted to give you some local examples, and these are just a few, there, there's more than this, but the city of San Jose, San Jose State uh, University, California College of the Arts, San Francisco State University, Centers for Educational Justice and Community, Oakland University and the ACLU of Northern California. Our recommendation, um, we are proposing that the land rights acknowledgement be formally included in the charter. So there were two um, versions submitted by the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. Um, there is a shorter version, which is here. And there is a full version, which actually is only two pages. And I believe that it was Commissioner Barosio, um, if I'm not mistaken, that, um, that suggested we do the full version. Um, and I don't, um, I mean, it, it, it isn't, it's only another page. So I, I believe that that also is a great recommendation um, is going with the full version. Um, so I, um, that is our recommendation. Um, we feel like this is something that isn't costly. There really shouldn't be. Um, we couldn't think of anything that would prevent or there were arguments against um, doing this as there was no cost or other adverse impact. So I am trying to stop sharing. I apologize. It is not. I don't know what is going on with my computer right now. <laughs> Can you stop me from sharing? I'm sorry. It's just I'm clicking on it. It's not letting me stop. Thank you so much. So you the you I I, I tried to do a truncated faster version. 
Um, you can read the full recommendation in the document sent um, in both full and short versions of the acknowledgement. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Severa. Um, any questions or thoughts, feedback, any comments to the subcommittee on the land acknowledgement recommendation? Commissioner Marshman. A question on the other examples um, of, I assumed of, of folks having accepted, uh, you know, adopted this. Uh, the top one was the city of San Jose. How does that, I mean, we're trying to put it in the charter. How has the San, city of San Jose already done this? Um, yeah, so um, I there's a link um, in the document that we sent you and you can go right to it. It's, um, it's not as um, extensive of an acknowledgement. Um, the acknowledgement that we have um, provided was um, actually created um, by the tribe. So you can take a look at their acknowledgement and the one that we're offering there, they are um, different. Can you, um, where does this reside? Where is, does this, how did the city adopt it? Is it in the charter now? It is not in the charter. So I will um, research that further and I would be happy to bring it back to our next study session. Commissioner Matsumura, Commissioner Fui Tran. Commissioner Matsumura. Um, thank you. Thank you to the committee for your work on this. A couple of questions. One, um, the, the word secularization jumped out at me. I, I'm not familiar with its use to describe, um, you know, what's happened to the land here and, and the removal of that land from Native American people, um, but rather, you know, conversion of something from religious to non-religious. Um, and so it, does it have a, a different meaning here? I think it's, it's raising my antennae just because of, you know, strong values of separation of church and state and not wanting to imply that secularization of something is equates with sort of removal of land from native people and, and the genocide that accompanies that. And yes, guess that, that language was actually um, brought by the tribe. Um, and also in, you know, when we were working together um, on this, um, so that was the verbiage that they used, but we definitely can change um, the verbiage if it's a recommendation. It might just be more research that I need to do. To, it might be a particular use of the word that I'm just not familiar with. Um, so, so probably it's 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 on me to go look that up. Um, the other was in the shorter version. I don't think I saw this in the longer version. There's a sentence referring to the Moak Maloney tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area as the legal success, successor of all the surviving Native American lineages, um, etc. And uh, I think probably there's just a piece that I'm not understanding well here as well of um, what the importance is of the reference to the, the Verona band of Alameda County um, and, and also whether there's a dispute about its status as, as legal successor and um, you know, whether we're taking a, a position in a dispute, which I'm not necessarily opposed to, I just kind of would wanna understand more. Yeah, and definitely, um, again, we can look at that um, change in language, but I can tell you that um, the Verona band portion was sort of an unauthorized naming of them that they are not in agreement with. They were named that after a nearby kind of railroad station, but it wasn't something that they sanctioned or call themselves. And that's what they have um, the issue with in that era. And I know some of that was covered in the presentation. It's just a lot of information that I'm trying to remember. So um, so yeah, if, if, you, if you're able to look into um, the issue of legal successor, I, I, and it might also be that I need to look back at their presentation. So thank you for that. Absolutely, I will definitely look into that and have additional information when um, when we return. Commissioner Hui Tran. Thank you. I actually I echo Commissioner Matsumura's questions. Um, I had the same concerns around secularization, and in part because um, uh, the practice or the idea of secularization isn't necessarily to oppress or, or identify and target religious communities or groups, but rather just to create space for people with different perspectives. And so that's where I, I definitely want to echo 
Commissioner Matsumura's statements on that regard. Uh, and also uh, the clarity that you guessed around Muwek Ohlone versus the Verona as well uh, is helpful for context. One additional question, and this is actually directed to uh, Attorney Mark Vanny, um, is there any impl implications in the incorporation of a land acknowledgement into the charter from McGirt v. Oklahoma? You, you know, it's something that we've looked into a little bit. Um, nothing stands out immediately, um, particularly if it's just that an acknowledgement and it doesn't impart any legal requirement on the part of the city. Uh, but we'll continue to look at it if this moves forward. Thank you, Patrick. Any other questions? Commissioner Segura, I have one question. Um, is your recommendation, as, as I read your recommendation and I appreciated it, and I appreciated the study session and the, vet, the, the two sets of guests that we had to speak to the issue. So really um, my familiarity is with Santa Clara University's land acknowledgement statement. And is it the recommendation that it only be put into the charter or that it become a practice that the city um, uses a land acknowledgement statement, which is even shorter than your short version, um, in its public gatherings and uh, official city activities? Is your, your recommendation for your subcommittee limited only to language inserted into the charter? So that is our um, recommendation now, is that it be inserted in um, they sent us two versions because initially they had felt like it needed to be a truncated or condensed shorter version um, it, commissioner Barosio had had sort of brought it up in in um, our q a after and so they also submitted the the full version appreciate that appreciate that thank you any other thoughts comments feedback Mr. Marshman. Sorry, I'd, I'd just like to say that uh, with regard to the other questions about secularization and so on, there were a number of, of places in, in, both, in both essays where the language, particularly perhaps if you are not a native English uh, speaker, the, um, the language, is is not will not come naturally and the use of secularization here is obviously not something we're familiar with so i would just like to suggest that whatever we think about putting into the charter be clear as to what it's what it's saying and if there's another word besides secularization even if the tribes didn't use it we we should clarify that okay um, Commissioner Segura is hearing your feedback and I see none other hands up. So I'm gonna to go to the public uh, speakers that wanna address the commission on the idea, recommendation of a land acknowledgement being added to the charter. So clerk can call the first speaker. Tessa wood -Mancy. Thank you. Oh, okay, good. Well, I, I really appreciate that the, um, that we're gonna recognize that we, you know, you know, like Paul Soto has told us that we cut off their heads and we, um, the native people, and we, you know, sold it for five dollars or and the scalps for two dollars, and we took their lands. Yeah, and so now we're just going to say, oh, okay, you know, we're going to recognize that 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 you know this was their land. I mean, it sounds. I mean, of course, that seems like the minimum that we should be doing. And basically, you know, what I I've been thinking when I listen to the native people when they were there at Thomas Phelan and, and you know, the, some of their, ans their, their elders were saying, you know, we, we want to reclaim mother nature. And, and the thing is, and we want to reclaim the land. So much of our land has been stolen from us as well, you know, and, and in terms of our capitalism and consumerism and fossil-based economy that has grown where we are now. That's why we're in the problem we are, that we have like um, Prince Charles is saying that the, the, the is issue, as he was talking at the COP26 today, that, that nature is our best teacher, restoring natural capital, meaning that we have to, you know, take the land back, that the land has been stolen from all of us for capital, capitalism and consumerism. And, and, you know, like in my neighborhood, building hotels when I want to have a garden, I want to grow food. 
And that's the spirit of what we need to be doing is we need to be restoring natural capital. We need to be taking the land back, not just recognizing that we stole it. We need to make amends. And, and, and you know, even um, Prince Charles says nature-based solutions. We need more nature around us. Nature heals. We have destroyed every, everything, you know, with our, you know, consumer and our fossil fuel-based economy. And so that's how we've made so much money. And we have to start going back to the natural. Call in user one. Yeah, I think we could start with recognizing the native people by getting rid of the Quetzalcoatl statue, which is from Mexico. Uh, how about a statue for the Ohlone Indian people? Uh, they did they did a lot of incredible things with basket weaving and surviving in this area, flood control, uh, control of fires, fire prevention, and they, you know, they lived in a very uh, kind of even though the weather's nice in an inhospitable place of flooding earthquakes mudslides fires things that ever change and uh, i think you know there's a wonderful uh, statue of a native american man in a tule boat at one of the public libraries and explains a lot of things about the ohlone uh and we don't have enough of that i think that i think to honor them would maybe be to have some statues plaques or memorials in certain places for them that wouldn't be a bad thing. Uh, in some cases, the churches, I know that, you know, they claim uh, things happen there. Uh, but a lot of the Ohlone people and Native people built the missions. They painted the ceilings and the Native American geometric designs. It's that Mission Dolores in San Francisco is quite beautiful. I don't think we should be taking anything down that they've ever uh, created. And I think that honoring them in some sort of way would be great. And acknowledgement, I don't know. I think, you know, they want to get rid of certain statues. Once you build some statues of Native American people who were first here and explain things instead of just tearing down a statue and leaving an empty podium or having this ugly keys and codal thing that, uh, you know, is from, is from Mexico. I love Mexico. But, you know, Keys and Cola was not in, important here in San Jose, California, b millenniums ago at all. The Aztecs weren't here. So why do the Aztecs? Alina Yin. Thank you, Commissioner Segura, for your uh, proposal and presentation. Um, I do support this proposal. I agree that we can work more on how to make sure the language is most appropriate to the context of the Moekma Ohlone people and other tribe members. Uh, I know there is not a lot of precedent for this type of amendment, but what that means is we're setting a new precedent and having this commission set that for the Bay Area, I think would be both symbolic and aspirational for other cities to follow. And I think this is a step in the right direction from the long list of grievances and apologies that we owe to um, the original stewards of this land um, before we came here. So thank you for that presentation and um, I hope that the commission supports this. Thank you. Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. <clears throat> um, thanks a lot for this item. Uh, I'm, I'm really interested to learn more about this issue and uh, boy, I'm just, I'm wondering how the future of Ohlone issues can, can be seen and heard and understood uh, in the future of the city charter. Um, you know, in living in this area for, you know, 100 years, 150, 200 years, um, I, I think there, there can be ways to understand, you know, these, these previous traditions and how we've been asked to consider the ideas of stewardship at this time. Uh, it's, it's finding, it's learning how to find that language uh, and, and those traditions and uh, really learning to bring that out. That's, uh, that's what I'm interested in myself. This is obviously gonna be a longer task in this commission. Um, I'm also interested in, in their word usage. <laughs> um, hopefully their idea of secularization was I think understood by, by staff or by, by commission persons that uh, uh, you know, they're being taken over by you know the Spanish uh, uh, conquistadors and and their new new religious cause and uh, that that's that's what they term secularization and 
Yeah, I, I, I've, I've made that mistake myself, actually. So I'm interested to, to learn uh, how, how you progress on these questions of language together. And uh, yeah, to really find ways that green sustainability and, uh, you know, uh, equity and, and neighborhood equity can, can relate to future of Ohlone issues. Uh, that's, that's the connections I'm going to be working towards. So thanks for this item. And I'll, I'll offer myself a real good study. Thank you. Back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you again to the subcommittee. Thank you, Commissioner Segura. The next item is um, item C, which is the use of gender inclusion language in all of the city of San Jose documents. And I'm going to turn to Commissioner Amador for a presentation. Commissioner Amador. Great. Thank you. And one more time, I'm going to be sharing my screen. Okay, and this is, uh, again, the use of gender inclusive language in all of the city of San Jose documents. Um, and this was submitted by myself, Commissioner Veronica Amador, Magnolia Siegel, Rick, Commissioner Rick Callender, Commissioner Sherry Segura, Commissioner Jenny Zhao. Um, and what are the problems here that we're trying to address? This proposed amendment seeks to promote and improve accountability, representation, and inclusion on their racial equity lens at the city of San Jose say by promoting and supporting gender inclusive language in all of our city documents. Um, you know, violence and discrimination born of intolerance and marginalization continues to take the lives and create barriers to equity and opportunity for LGBTQ plus people and their families. Language is also gender um, is also gender and plays a central role in human cognition and behavior as one of the most common mechanism by which gender is constructed and reinforced. Some languages do not mark gender distinctions systematically, some use pronouns to distinguish between male and female, and some go on even farther. Extending the gender distinction to inanimate nouns through a system of grammatical gender, gender language is essential as it frames the understanding of E equality. Language is a reflection of the attitudes and norms within a society. It also shapes our world view and over time people's attitude as to what is normal and acceptable. The way language is used not only reflects social structure and biases, however, it may also reinforce preconceptions and in inequalities related to gender roles in everyday life and the work of the environment. And so I wanted to add here one of um, one of our presenters slides um, that was uh, presented on how many times we are using gender um, language in the city uh, charter. And so there was about 140 total times that we use his, him, her, she, or him. And this comes into section 1704 and the definition as well. The masculine gender includes the feminine and neuter. Um, and this do not make gender visible when it is not relevant for documents and communication. So updating the gender language to be gender inclusive or gender neutral. Um, how has this been a problem or possible benefit or burden people? Gender inclusive language in all city of San Jose's documents. Um, this actually, you know, as we're moving from um, really respecting people's um, pronouns, just really uh, how we have it currently right now, disregards that, disregards whoever, um, for people that do not do not uh, have a pronoun of she or him or her or him, um, disregards them. And so I think really, again, having this technique to be preferred as inclusive language and avoids complication sentences and structures, if we use they, them, theirs. Um, and one more time, here's another example on um, things that we can be more inclusive when we're talking about chairman, chairmanship, we can change it to chair, chairpersonship, businessman, business person, policeman, police officer, um, as we move on with our gender inclusivity. Uh, what changes are we proposing? Again, the section 1704, the definitions, um, and as well as those 140 in the, within the charter, um, where we are including gender, him, her, she, his, um, taking that and being an inclusive as they, them, theirs. Um, and um, as we move forward with all of the documentations uh, at the city of San Jose. Um, is this change feasible? Yes. I think it's something that it is just grammatically that we have to correct within our documents now. Um, and it is not something that is going to be burdened by uh, money. Um, who might benefit? Well, I believe everyone should benefit from this um, as well. 
Um, I don't see what arguments would be against it. Um, and then is this a charter revision? Yes, it must be a charter revision to support language inclusivity to reflect on all San Jose City's documents. And there are other examples of this. Santa Clara County has supported this efforts into a policy change. It has started processing using inclusive language in all of their documents. Um, and I just wanted to remind you all that we had two presenters talking about this. And one of them was Sarah Fernando. Um, this was, uh, they were one of our speakers on 9-9 uh, study session. Um, and they share a free, um, they share a little bit more on the building a more inclusive workplace and their work that has been within the uh, Santa Clara County. Um, and I included a couple more links and that's about it. Thank you, Commissioner Amador for your presentation. Uh, questions, thoughts, feedback, comments from commissioners. Seeing none, then I'm gonna to go to the public for public comment on the inclusion of gender inclusive language in all of the San Jose city documents. Clerk can call the first speaker. Call in user one. Sounds like Brave New World just met 1984. You guys are trying to force Orwellian new speak on people. And you're going to go, I don't know what you're going to do. You're going to go through just the charter or every single city document from 1777 to reflect gender neutrality. I, I don't know what you're going to do, but I don't know. The only people who are going to pay for this is a taxpayer. And this is a city that always has budget shortfalls. And you're worried about the way words are structured and grammar and pronoun usage, I, I just find it a little bit overreaching. And over the course of time, since language is a living thing, uh, it'll, it'll, you know, it will finally be what you guys want, but to just force it and to have to take up all this time, including have to hear me for two minutes about it. I find it a bit, I just find it a bit sophomoric, like it's a term paper in college or something. I think you guys should focus on other things, like maybe fix the unfinished manhole covers. Oh, I said manhole covers. That uh, there's like an unfinished ring around them when you guys pave the roads. You guys do a great job paving, but you don't finish the job with these manhole covers that are unfinished. Sorry, I said the word man. I don't want anyone to have a nervous breakdown or reach for the Prozac. But uh, yeah. I, I really think that uh, this is something not to be focused on when we're in the middle of a pandemic, for God's sake. We got so many things going on, pe places out of business. Half of downtown is boarded up with plywood. I call it plywood city down there. You guys are worried about pronoun usage. You guys should focus on other things, I can tell you. Thanks. To Rob, I'm sorry. Good evening, commissioners. Um, I would just like to clarify that this public comment is, is on behalf of me and me only and represents only my views. Um, I appreciate uh, the effort the commission is making uh, to include gender inclusive language. Uh, I come from the subfield of behavioral health and uh, in the county on at the county level, uh, behavioral providers are also recommending that the county begin using gender inclusive language because we have found that when gender inclusive language is, is included uh, in, 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 in government official documents that it increases the likelihood of people trusting the city government and of, of, of accessing public services and already really takes the changing words from he or she to they. Um, and so I really appreciate the consideration for this and I yield my time, thank you. Blair Beekman. Hi. Um, it, language uh, is a difficult thing <laughs> sometimes, and especially when, uh, boy, I'm not as familiar with how way, the ways things are working as compared to say 20, 25 years ago. Um, I, you know, I just spoke on the items of uh, considering our future of, of Ohlone issues and, and the stewardship role that we're at right now. And I use the term we to describe, you know, for the past 200 years, we have been working towards 
And I think you can hear a language in like the city charter and things, uh, baloney issues. Um, so it, it, it's always work to figure out how to improve ourselves and improve our language and where we're at. And it, it's hard. Get involved in, you know, he, she, the, you know, our names, you know, it, it's where, you know, we are facing a existential crisis. And so, you know, how much resources we have to face this is, is, go, is critical as we go forward. And we need to make so many changes in our lives and in our lifestyles that, you know, we all are responsible for. And so, you know, to be focusing on, you know, our, just our, our gender or, you know, our orientation about that is a, you know, a, a minor issue in regards to the, um, the issue of survival of our species. And, and then all the other species, life on earth, bio, you know, we have an ecological collapse. So we're having a much more larger issues to address. And, and I think, you know, we, we've had so many um, distractions. I mean, even COVID has been very difficult, you know, as we go, but we've learned a lot from COVID. And of course it's, you know, the way it is, but it's more a matter of, you know, how we're going to, well, the problem with COVID is it had, you know, we had to reboot the whole economy and the way we rebooted it was all through fossil fuels. And we, we gave only 2% of the monies went towards green, a green, you know, the new green deal or whatever that we all need to have. So we really need to be focused, you know, in unison, all of us, you know, you know, all colors, races and, and, you know, sexual orientation towards this goal of saving ourselves and, you know, and life on earth. Back to the chair. Thank you um, again, and thank you to Commissioner Amador. Our next item is Police Commission, Independent Investigation Department, Office of Inspector General. And Commissioners Segal, Segura, and Amador are going to be presenting. I don't know who's going first, but I'll turn it over to you all. All right, um, this is Rick. I believe I'll be jumping out there. I'm not sure if Magnolia is going to be sharing the PowerPoint. But let me just kind of give a, a broad overview. Um, the police oversight. Can I'm sorry, Commissioner Callender, I just want to identify you for the record. Commissioner Callender speaking first. Go ahead, Commissioner Callender. All thank right, you. Th thank you for the reminder for the introduction. But as I say, police oversight can benefit not only the individual complainant, but also the larger community and police department. And the actual benefits that occur depend on the type of model that's going to be um, um, implemented. So in terms of uh, that's there, and, and please do go ahead and share that slide if you like for the public to be able to read. Um, so the potential benefits are complaints can be given a place to voice concerns outside of the law enforcement agency. Oversight can help the police department be accountable for officers' actions. Oversight can improve the quality of a department's internal investigations of alleged, of alleged misconduct. The community at large can also be reassured that discipline is being imposed when appropriate, while also increasing the transparency of the disciplinary process. When oversight agencies confirm a complainant's allegation, complainants feel validated. And similarly, when the oversight agency exonerates an officer, the officer also may feel vindicated. Oversight can help improve community relations by fostering communication between the community and the police agency. And oversight can help reduce public concerns about high profile incidents. If you look at our model, San Jose has an outdated model. We do not have a true oversight model. Many organizations and members of the communities that I've talked about have long desired that the city of San Jose to update its model to an oversight model. Many organizations have been calling for an update to policing oversight model and the charter for over 25 years. The committee, we've listened to the needs of the community and the model that will be presented is sufficiently independent in terms of political, professional, and financial independence and authority, and to do what's needed and to ask for what's expected for police oversight. I think it's helpful to think about this in terms of what the community is being asked for in terms of local oversight. From the presentations that we've seen, we've seen lots of them. We've seen that and we've heard that there's, we believe that oversight should bear some relationship to the size of the police department, the size of our city, the department's funding levels, and the level of trust or mistrust within the community. And this is particularly among those segments of the community that have historically have or been the subjects of over-policing or bias-based policing. Now, the model that we're going to be talking about is exactly similar to that what we've heard in Oakland. Basically, it's a triangle model with the police commission on the top, 
You can see on the bottom left hand side, you have the Office of Inspector General, and then the Independent Investigations Department, which would take over for that of the independent police auditor. At this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to um, Commissioner Siegel to, con to talk a little bit about the, the different components. Commissioner Siegel? I think Commissioner Sherry Segura will be next, reading what the problem is. Okay. Um, there's a history of policing practices which have resulted in excessive and unnecessary force towards residents of San Jose, ultimately causing our citizens distrust um, of the police. This distrust has caused concerns regarding policing, hiring, training, accountability, mental health awareness, and lack of basic care for the people they are sworn to protect. San Jose lacks a robust police oversight structure that in turn lacks credibility and legitimacy among impacted communities. The oversight structure does not promote community empowerment and engagement and does not promote prevention of systematic issue or accountability of police management. It is largely reflective focused on individual officer accountability, not fully independent and depends upon the IPA office itself to firmly engage community input. Control um, the, oh, I'm sorry, community input. Um, the public should have a formal input into policing in light of the current state of distrust and enormous power that police have. This power has manifested in significant use of force, including causing serious injury during the protests following the murder of George Floyd. But there have also been documented disparities in the treatment during the stops in the last five to 10 years, and at least one federal jury finding of the, an unfair officer involved shooting. The IPA routinely makes policy recommendations in light of deficiencies and that the office identifies and it is critical that a body oversees adoption and implementation of such changes. A supplementary, uh, I'm sorry, a supplementary IG could also utilize its access to monitor improved police practices. Great, and I'll follow along with how has this problem possibly benefited or burdened people, especially BIPOC? Again, Black, Indigenous, people of color, low income, undocumented, and immigrants, those experiences, houselessness. Um, our Black and brown communities have, have been severely impacted by over-policing and excessive use of force. Because of police officers' lack of understanding and approachabilities, these communities who are already underserved believe that the police are more prone to causing the problem than solving it. It leads to residents exhibiting fear and rest restlessness when interacting with the police. And this also leads to hesitancy when in situations they should call the police. Moreover, the disconnect creates an environment where there are two entities, police and residents, who have distrust for one another. Sorry, I lost my point. This is Commissioner but, Amador speaking. Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, police that, uh, who have distrust for one another instead of acting as one as a whole community. There are complaints of under policing in some neighborhoods, over policing in uh, some neighborhoods, complaints of excessive use of force, racial profile and different use of force, depending on race and uh, independent investigation body of the policing in San Jose. People complain that police do not come to respond to drug houses, abandoned cars, reports of thefts, reports of trespassing and other complaints. The district attorney does investigate alleged criminal behavior on the part of San Jose police officers. This includes if an officer is accused of murder, sexual assault, sex with a minor, theft, domestic violence, and other crimes. This is not considered to be independent investigatory oversight of San Jose policing. There are complaints of other officers smiling and laughing with each other um, after pulling residents over during traffic stops, appearing to be laughing at the same person they have pulled over. Injuries caused by the San Jose Police Department have cost over $26 million in lawsuits since 2010, and this money could have been used to fund our schools instead of being diverted to pay for police misconduct. In prior recent years, there has been document disparities, um, and so there is a link there that you all can read more on, um, but it talks about the UTEP researcher study racial bias in policing stops. 
and the lack of permanent commissions also has a disp disappropriate impact on marginalized communities while other commissions exist. The exclusion of police commission affects BIPOC and other marginalized communities because of the disparities, this proportionate impact of policing on those communities. Thank you. The next bit is mine. If you could please bear with me while I find the right screen. Commissioner Siegel's now speaking. Yes, I am. I'm searching for one moment, please. Okay. So we are proposing a police commission. A police commission is, um, you can just see this model. It's a really basic model. It's, it's a it's a, it's a model that many, many cities have. We've had many speakers. Um, there are lots and lots of options of how we could um, structure police oversight. This is the one we chose because it's just very basic. Um, the roles are clearly defined and we're just gonna walk you through that. Now you can see on the top of this triangle is a police commission. The police commission um, reviews with expertise and assistance from the I, inspector general's office through the use of its access authority. So you have a police commission, they're basically civilians. They're just plain old civilians like us, um, like the folks that are listening. And they are um, in charge of all these folks. They're in charge of the chief of police, the police department. They're also in charge of the investigators. They're also in charge of the in, inspector general. So the police commission as a whole then, because it has all these people under it, is looking at training, patterns of practice. This is all through the IG's office. If you wanna know what's the difference between the IG and the investigator, this is the explanation of that. Um, so through the IG's office, it's gonna be looking at training, patterns of practice, use of force, stop detentions, um, other practices, policies and procedures, supervision and management. So it's kind of like, Somebody there to do constant management audits, um, base hire, fire, appraise chief of police, and also the same with the inspector general and the independent investigative department head. So this police commission is in charge of all of these folks, um, the hiring and the firing of all these folks. So it's a it's true civilian oversight over the entire process, both people that are police and also people that are. Um, in, in keep having checks and balances on the police. The civilian police commission is in charge of all these folks. Um, they also recommend the uh, San Jose Police Department budget to the city council, because again, they're in charge of the whole thing. So part of what they do is make that recommendation. This is, this is what happens in San Francisco, Oakland, Los Angeles, it's a very common thing. Um, they conduct regular for example, monthly public hearings on department policies, rules, practices, customs, general orders. The police commission will propose changes at its discretion or upon direction by adoption of a resolution of the city council, including modification to the department's proposed changes. So basically, if the, if the police department wants to make um, any changes, it goes through to policies, procedures, practices, it goes through the police commission, the police commission will uh, present those and uh, take public comment and um, approve them or modify them or reject them. So this just basically goes through that. Um, and then the key that we have here that we think is really interesting is, um, and, and we, we just think this should be true for all major commissions, but this is what we've put here, that when the commission chair, so all such proposed changes shall be submitted to the commission chair by his or her does or his or her designee to the city council for review. It, and the city council gets to approve, modify, not approve, approve, reject. It can do whatever it wants with the commission's proposals. Um, but, it, but it should vote. Here's the thing that I think really bothers the citizens of San Jose. When city council does nothing, it doesn't take it up it just says, thank you for that report. That was a really nice report and just puts it aside. And I think that really, really bugs people. So we do want city 
council to actually vote on it. They can reject whatever they want to reject. They can approve, they can modify, set it aside to approve later, whatever they wanna do. That's completely their purview, but they should do something. So um, within 120 days of the commission's vote on a proposed change, um, if the city council doesn't vote, then that change or modification just becomes final. That just becomes um, becomes final. That's that's now the law. That's now the policy change. So we just are doing that. So so there is action. Um, so police commission, how is it formed? Each city council member and the mayor shall select one applicant for a two-year term for a maximum of three terms if the applicant so desires once selected by a council person. Um, so half of the initial applicant pool shall serve one year term so that at any given time only half the commission needs to be replaced. Uh, former or current law enforcement or those affiliated with law enforcement or police unions shall not be eligible to serve on the police commission. Again, we're just looking for civilian, pure civilian oversight. No city or county staff is eligible for this commission. Really, we don't want an echo chamber. We, we, we just want pure civilian oversight. So if you already work for the city, then this is not the commission, then, then you wouldn't be eligible as a commissioner uh, on the police commission. Um, subcommittees each, and so then the question comes up, well, in our general model, where does the public fit in? You know, here we've got this model proposal for, we've got the police commission, we've got, you know, how it's, there's checks and balances on it. So the independent investigator, Gations department is looking at all the cases. People have a problem, let's say excessive use of form, force, and they make a complaint. Who do they make that complaint to? This IDD. And the IDD then investigates that complaint. So that's what the IDD looks at. The inspector general, again, pat use of force, patterns of practice, policies, looks at all those things. Where in this model then is the public? Where is reimagining policing and the, you know, 40 or uh, community-based organizations that's associated with reimagining policing, where do they get to have a say as to um, patterns of practice, use of force, things that we can do better? How can we make the police department better? Uh, where Where is the say for the community? And this was, um, this is how, sorry, let's go to subcommittees. So through subcommittees, each commissioner on the police commission, that overarching police commission at the top of the triangle may create any number of subcommittees of which members of the public, like all of us soon will be, um, and all of those listening will be eligible to be appointed to their, you know, by their respective commissioner for any of these subcommittees. You can just join a subcommittee and, um, and then the subcommittee members will give input and actively participate in making recommendations as part of the uh, police commissioner led subcommittee. So that is where we would put public input. It would be in these subcommittees. Um, and so now let's go into more detail about the office of the inspector general. I think we, we pretty much covered it. The, um, the Office of the Inspector General will have subpoena authority, of course. Everybody has this. San Jose is the only one that doesn't. I mean, it's okay. I, I, I will just read. Um, it'll have subpoena authority and full and unfettered and unredacted access to the documents contained by any city department or employee relating to San Jose Police Department. In making this presentation to you, I actually considered redacting the whole presentation and just telling you I've decided you shouldn't know what I don't think you should know. And so you're just gonna have to vote without knowing half of you know what's on here because I've redacted it. But in the interest of time, I didn't do that. But you can imagine if you're looking at the screen and 50 or 60% of the words are blacked out, how could you possibly know what the Office of the Inspector General does? You couldn't. So it's, it's I, I will not, nobody else gets, un, gets redacted documents. It's unique to San Jose that the um, oversight agency gets redacted documents. So of course the Office of the Inspector General will have full unfettered unredacted access to documents contained by any city department or employee relating to the San Jose Police Department. 
folks, this is what civilian oversight looks like. This is what it is. Everything else is, um, is not the norm of our sister cities in California. So, and by sister cities, I don't mean official sister cities. I just mean larger cities comparable to us. So the Office of the Inspector General will have full access to anything and everything that the police department's internal affairs has, um, as well as body-worn camera footage, uh, recordings, transcripts, data, police reports, use of force reports, stop data, police communications, disciplinary histories, force reviews, training, all documents shall be unredacted to the extent permitted by current state and federal laws. There are currently laws in the state that, that are very strong. They were put in there by police unions. They have to do with police officers' bill of rights. And those are things that obviously um, would have to be followed and so those would be followed. That's why we put in here, you know, to the extent currently permitted by state and federal laws. The IG shall have the, the, ex, shall have the existing powers of the IPA, um, but with additional access and authority. So its IPA authority should also include the role of whether a case should be sustained and in a disciplinary decision. The IG will report directly to the police commission outside the police department's chain of command um, and the office can initiate investigations into any area. So this is kind of a big thing, right? Because with our current mo oversight model, um, there's no what we call in law sua sponte. You can't just all of a sudden decide that you want to investigate something. And if, if you will recall, good commissioners, Paul Parker of San Diego was saying in his oversight model, um, death automatically triggers his ability to do oversight investigation. Because what was happening was somebody would die and then there'd be nobody to sort of make that report or figure out to make that report to him. So, you know, <laughs> it, it sort of became a little bit um, untenable. And to solve that in San Diego, they said, of course, you know, there are things that just automatically trigger oversight. And, and so even a better model of that is, you know, the IG can initiate an investigation into any area um, that the IG thinks needs investigation, um, subject to the IG's time. But this person's going to be very, very busy, so they'll have to make good time management choices. But they're authorized to compel any San Jose Police Department um, employees to, you know, to um, cooperate with the investigation. So currently now, for example, um, our Siobhan Nuri, she really for a long time couldn't ask any questions at all. And I think now she can just submit a question to somebody, to the um, to somebody in the police department and they will ask. And I think she gets one question or something. Again, this is like so archaic and it really just shows an imbalance of power. Um, and that is what we are, we've waited a long time to have just proper civilian oversight. This is what it looks like for other folks. It's a good, it's a very good model. It's, um, I don't want to use the word gold standard because there really isn't any. It's very much what's appropriate to a community. Um, but it is part of best practices to just have this triangle model. It's pretty common. Um, let's see, I independent investigations department. So we're not actually dissolving the current office of the independent police auditor, we're simply morphing it into somebody that can do investigations. Currently, an auditor is not somebody that can investigate anything. They just audit documents that they're given that somebody else thinks are relevant, not even that she thinks is relevant, that are redacted, somebody else thinks is relevant, and then she kind of audits it for, but she doesn't get to investigate at all. And so we're looking at um, the IPA will be turned into an investigations department that will have subpoena power. Um, this person, of course, reports directly to the police commission, can be hired, fired, appraised by the police commission. Um, and then rather than audit internal affairs and fest investigations of complaints, the I, as, as she currently does, um, it would conduct investigations itself, independent investigations. Right now, our oversight model relies on the investigations of the police. They're investigating themselves. And in investigating themselves, um, 
remember, she told us that usually it's kind of rookie cops or people with not very much experience that end up being the investigators. And then, at, and then they quickly get, um, after their year or whatever as an investigator, they have to go back onto the street um, on their beat with the folks that they investigated. So it's kind of a conflict of interest and we're just gonna get out of that whole thing in this proposal by having um, the independent investigator actually be able to independently investigate, not rely on someone else's investigation. So this person will issue annual reports um, will sh and she'll have sufficient staffing based on the formula relating to caseloads, number of complaints, um, again, full and unfettered, unredacted access to documents contained by any city department or employee related to San Jose Police Department. Um, and again, it, all the same stuff we just went over. And again, to the extent permitted by state and federal laws. And so why does San Jose need a police commission? Um, why is it good? Expanded hope, oversight will benefit all um, San Joseans by, um, but will especially benefit the BIPOC community members and community members who belong to other marginalized communities, including those with disabilities, um, the unhoused LGBTQ plus community. This is because the historical realities of policing affected, affecting those communities most, right? Um, and the historical distrust between these communities and the police. Um, in addition, our entire community will benefit because oversight can hold the police department accountable for officers' actions. But I would just add here, even better, even better than just holding someone accountable is helping them figure out what the problem is and offering solutions. I mean, this is really meant to not be us against them. I think we can all agree that we all need the police. Of course we need the police. And we want civilian oversight so that we can have ethical, modern policing in San Jose, something that San Joseans actually trust and, and, and trust because they're a part of, they're a part of building, they're a part of creating the policies, um, correcting things that need to be corrected and making it a strong community oriented public safety institution. And I think that's how we all benefit. Um, we help together create the kind of police policing that we wanna see, the kind of public safety that we wanna see in our city. And that really does involve all of us having a voice in that and, and taking it out of the us against them scenario. Um, and moving on, the community at large can be reassured that discipline is imposed when appropriate and and it's you know transparent but again i would just add if we have really good practices and we're really going in there and fixing what needs to be fixed we really shouldn't be having too many disciplinary actions because again that when the uh i don't know i'm sorry let me just continue with this i know we're short on time um when an oversight agency confirms a complainant's allegations, the complainant may feel validated, but similarly, when they exonerate an officer, the officer may feel vindicated. Um, the police commission, I just wanna go off of the script and say, one of the amazing things in Oakland, the police commission there, when the pandemic first started, they had a really hard time figuring out you know, masks and the police commission really made sure that the police officers had the mask because they were out there and nobody was really thinking of getting the masks first. It was really the police commission, the civilians that said we need to do that. And as well as with vaccines, when they became available, it was really the police commission that just said, hey, look, these are our employees, they're first responders, and they also need vaccines too. And so it's, I just really want to say that a healthy civilian police commission really does benefit officers, especially in terms of P, you know, policies around PTSD. Are they, how um, robust are they? And I think having civilians kind of come in and look at that could benefit officers as well. It's really not just one-sided, it's about fixing the problem, supporting our committee, our entire community as a whole, including those who serve. Um, and I, I'm, I don't have to read this, I can just say that um, 
uh, we are really excited about this oversight model. We're very excited to have San Jose no longer be lagging behind everyone else, every other major city in California, in Oregon and Seattle. We really do want to come up to speed with everyone else given the enormous problems that were, we had um, during the George Floyd protests and the police conduct in those protests against the citizens really revealed a lot and we really are here to help solve that together. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Siegel. <clears throat> Comments, questions, feedback from the commissioners. <clears throat> Commissioner Marshman. Commissioner Marshman, you're muted. Sorry. Um, yeah. Overall, I think a police commission structure makes sense for San Jose. The only thing that jumped out at me, do all police commissions hire and fire the chief as well? I, I don't think, I don't know if you mentioned that now, but in, in your in your document, I mean, it seems a little bit to me like you're picking the guy so you could have the same protective uh, attitude as, you know, as a mayor and council sometimes has now. Uh, is that the typical way it's done? Yes, that's my understanding. So it, there's there are not police commissions that uh, that just oversee and review a and investigate a, a chief, a department when the chief is hired by someone else, by the mayor and council. I can look into that and see if there are other cities that do that, but am I hearing from you that that's what you would prefer? Well, it just, it seems a little bit detached from our elected representatives. Uh, you know, we elect the mayor and council, we're gonna have, you know, a larger, more representative council. We're doing this for a reason. Uh, and uh, it, it feels like the police chief then becomes somebody else's problem. And that doesn't seem right to me. Except that um, it's the mayor and council that elect the commission, the police commission, right. that appoint the police commission, right? So that's who, that's who gets to pick who's on the, which civilians are on the police commission. And can they, can they revisit that? Can, can they, uh, can they, if they can, appoint a commissioner, can they remove a commissioner even after the first term or something like that? I think I think the document said uh, if they wanted to stay on longer, they could. Barbara, what would you like? Um, I don't know. I mean, if nobody else does this, does it, uh, has the council involved, then, you know, I I would like to understand more if there are other options. It does not, I was not aware that that's how it worked. And I, with commissions, which I've for a long time thought might be appropriate for us, uh, but the hiring and firing part jumped out at me. So maybe some more detail on that and I'll make a few calls too and, and uh, um, but I don't, I don't wanna take up all your time. There are a couple of, if, if the commission does hire and, you know, supervise and so on, everything, the police uh, chief, um, what happens? Well, I guess, I guess then you have, who, who, do, who does the police re chief report to? I mean, does, does if he wants to, or she, if they want to establish uh, a curfew or something to feel like something's gonna happen, do they go to the commission? Do they go to the city council, the mayor, or the city manager? They would go to the police commission. Similarly, they would go to the police commission if they're having a problem with um, one of the oversight entities, right? Because the police commission is also in charge of the oversight ent entities. So if you have an inspector general who um, is perhaps, let's just, imagine there is an allegation by the police chief that there's some kind of retaliatory investigation mm -hmm. that the inspector general is doing 
they would go straight to the uh, police commission and the police commission again is made up of a very diverse group of civilians just like this body <laughs> is they're appointed just like this body is and the police commission would handle that would take that up would handle it would look at it and that police commission is serving as a check and balance on everybody not just the police chief also on the uh, inspector general and also on the independent investigator so if there's shenan there's there's shenanigans everywhere it's not just you know anybody could become corrupt anybody could do something that's not appropriate and so we need checks and balances on everybody mm -hmm. and this is a system that we think does that within the context of demo democracy and elected representatives okay, okay. I'm gonna move okay. Uh, we should move on i i will commissioner matsky then commissioner Posadas, and then commissioner fuentes commissioner matsky uh yes thank you chair uh, just for just to start though um first of all i've been kind of quiet that doesn't mean I, I want to just say that I kind of agree with most of the agenda here tonight, even though I'm quiet, I'm, I'm more in listening mode and you know, I'm trying to understand these things. I kind of generally agree with, with everything. Um, I'm also on East Coast time. So later on, if my eyes start to droop, um, I may turn off my camera just, just so you know, don't take it personally. Um, I do agree. I do support um, equitable policing. I do support police reform. Having said that, I, I don't support this. And the reason I don't is there were very two very key stakeholders were not included in our process. That is the police themselves and management of the police. And I've been in a few um, consensus processes in my career. Nothing as important as this, but the first rule of consensus and trying to resolve some of these sticky issues is to make sure all stakeholders are in the room. And, and we didn't do that. And it kind of surprises me for <clears throat> a group that is very concerned with equity, inclusion, all those things that we excluded those two key stakeholders. So it's really, and kind of surprised by that. And then when um, I thought that the, the committee did do a lot of good work. So I, I do appreciate everything they did. I think the speakers were very good. Um, and I think we got the full menu of ways to accomplish oversight of police. So I think that that was very good. One of the, I think it was the Oakland IPA said, it doesn't matter what you pick, what really makes these things successful is you have to have trust between both the community and the police. So I asked you, how do we get trust with the police if we don't include them in the discussion? So I'm, I'm very concerned about that. I, I think I feel that if this goes forward, this could be a big step backward as opposed to trying to resolve these issues. So I, I was even then more surprised. Um, I guess Mr. Aaron Zisser, I guess, was one of the speakers. I remember at one point I later on after he spoke, I, I Googled him just to kind of get some background. And I didn't realize that he kind of left under not the positive circumstances and, and both the, the chief and the police themselves just said that they lost trust in the individual. So, so it, it's surprising to me that that individual was given a platform to this commission, yet, our, again, our police chief and our police union was not given the same platform. So when, when this goes forward and those entities see this, I, boy, I, I just don't see how I think we're putting a wedge, a bigger wedge between the community and the police and we're actually pulling them together. So, so I'm concerned about that. Um, and then I, I wanna remind everybody that when we had um, a discussion about um, the next uh, Charter Review Commission, the potential of another future Charter Review Commission, and there was that issue of whether that commission should have authority to put things directly on the ballot and bypass the, the council, so there was a lot of angst about that by a whole lot of people in this commission. So now I turn around and I see this particular proposal allows an unelected body to hire and fire the police chief and a bunch of other people. So the two just don't fit together with me how you can have, how you can be supportive of one and not of the other. So I, I mean, just, I just, I think it's the wrong thing at the wrong time to, to do a charter thing. What I would like to propose, though, and I hope the, the subcommittee takes this seriously, 
that instead of a charter change, we look at a policy change. So I think we can say that a significant part of the community does mistrust the police, that as, as Commissioner Siegel has pointed out time and time again, it is pretty weak, our current process of the IPA. I think that's fair to say. And that whatever they come up with in their, their new, um, you know, the, the police initiative that they have, that the community does expect substantive change to come out of this thing. I, I think if we put that in a policy, and I think there's a fourth item that we haven't really talked about, which is various police tactics, then I think the council should have the ability to prohibit certain things. I know more than one member of the public, more than one time has expressed concern over the ability of the surveillance tactics that the police should have. And so whether it's that or um, no knock, whatever the no knock um, things that they, they talk about, there's certain tactics I think the, the community just doesn't want. I think the council should, should have all that. So, so in, in summary, I think if we repackage this as a policy issue, I think it would go better with the council. I don't think it would drive a bigger wedge between the, the community and the police. And I, I just, I would like the, the, the subcommittee to kind of look at that and, and see what they think about that. So thank you, Chair. Hi, okay. If I can just briefly respond. Um, so the police, what we're trying to do is not have the police police themselves, okay? And so you, you, your question about why um, the police chief wasn't brought here is because when this process is done, uh, there will be a collective bargaining process with the police union on each and every point, each and every single line, every word will be hashed out with teams and teams of lawyers on the, I mean, this is my understanding, lawyers from the, the union, the very wealthy police union, will be hashing that out with Mark Vanny, the city attorney's office. And, um, and so that is where anything they don't like, they could simply say, we don't like this and our officers are not gonna work in the city. So, so there is this, if, if you make us do this, we're not doing it, sorry. And that has happened before in San Jose. Um, when we tried to, I believe, res, um, limit or restrict some of the retirement funds, and we just said, okay, well, we're going to hire other people from, you know, other cities, or, or well, oh, I, the city said we're going to hire our own police officers, we're going to train them ourselves, and then my understanding of what the union did was tell those folks that the, that the city of San Jose, we paid, our taxpayers paid for the training of those officers. And unfortunately, the, um, the police union said, we're gonna get you jobs in really easy to police cities. It's gonna be high paying and just don't work here. And so that is how, and at that point, that was something that went on the ballot. We all voted for it and the police union thwarted it. So they have enormous ability to represent themselves. Um, Commissioner Matsky, don't worry that because they weren't here, that they're not gonna be involved in the process or won't be able to represent themselves. They're gonna be fully capable of of knocking down just as much as they want to from this. I want to move on I'm, to- I'm, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry though, but with all, due, with all, excuse me, but with all due respect, that's an excuse, that's not. I think we'd have more success if you actually brought them in the room, had the community talk with them, you'd be much more, you'd be, have a better chance of actually having them accept the things when it does go to the negotiation. So no, I, I disagree with that. I, I just think it's the wrong process and it's the whole thing is flawed, I'm sorry. Thank you for that. Um, your second point about our speaker, Aaron Zisser, um, he was uh, somebody who was the um, independent police au auditor for San Jose. And what happened in that situation, he did not actually leave under a bad situation. He, lived, he left under very, um, he was very appreciated by the community. He was somebody that went out into the community with folks currently associated with reimagining and he actually took their input and listened to them. And the argument that the police, my understanding and I've been told that the police union said he cannot possibly be fair. How could he be fair if he's out there talking to people like Silicon Valley debug? Um, the folks that are talking about defunding the police. So if he's actually having conversations with those folks and speaking at their, you know, taking input from them, speaking at their events, he's not fair, we don't want him. And so that is my understanding of what happened to him. But he's currently in Oakland as a, um, 
oversight um, official there. So he, there's there's nothing. I mean, he and and prior to that, he worked for the federal government in police oversight. He's pedigree. He's had an illustrious career. So I just wanted to clarify that. And then the next point you made was um, this would bring a wedge between the community and the police. Actually, it doesn't because this was created. This oversight model was created by the community. Um, this is what reimagining community safety has put to our commission, to our subcommittee, and we're putting that forward to you. Um, Commissioner Matsky, you do have a letter in your inbox from reimagining saying that they support this particular presentation. So contrary to a wedge, it's exactly what the folks want. Um, and then your, your final point was that it would be an unelected body in charge of hiring and firing. We of course have that already in the form of a city manager um, who is unelected and hires and fires um, pretty much <laughs> almost everybody. And then I think um, you were just a loss of word for, for the kind of warrant, it, it's called a no knock warrant. So just wanted to offer that final word to you. And um, you did mention it should be a policy. It can't be a policy because um, police oversight sits in the city charter. That is where it sits. That is where it lives. It lives in six, section 809 of our city charter. So it has to be a uh, charter revision. Okay, so thank you, Commissioner Siegel. Commissioner Posadas. Yes, I just have uh, two short questions. Um, one is actually related to what Commissioner uh, Matsky just brought up. So I understand that the um, members of the commission would be appointed, but if I'm reading this correctly, that they would also have a policy making authority uh, as virtue of being um, commissioners on this police commission. So I wanted to see if that is my understanding, if that's correct. And second, um, it, what was the reasoning behind not allowing um, county staff to participate? Because I would imagine if somebody is a resident of the city of San Jose and wants to provide some uh, contribution to policing that they should have the opportunity to do so, but by virtue of, of just having uh, uh, being employed by the county, they cannot. So I just wanted to get a better understanding what the reasoning behind that was. Thank you. Sure, yes, the police commission would have the authority to make policies. However, uh, that would go to city council and city council would have to either vote for it, against it, vote to push it forward, modify it. The only thing that they couldn't do is do nothing. If they do nothing for 120 days, then it does become policy. Um, but so it does go back to city council, our elected representatives. Um, and then to answer your other question, it's about process control. There's a, a big distrust between some portions of um, citizens of San Jose and city government because there's the allegation that there's intense control over process and that results you know, of commissions come out in a particular way because of how the process is controlled. An example of that is the first iteration of reimagining policing where the uh, city tried to appoint to that commission in very high spots like the chair and other things, the, who they thought has to be on there. It wasn't going to be um, elected by the folks and they tried to set the agenda and pretty soon everybody walked away. The black leadership walked away, then the Latino water leadership walked away and said this process control is meant to give us um, a particular outcome. And that is not why we're here. We're not participating, we're leaving. And the current iteration of it is entirely um, elected by the people there. So they ha have elected their own chair. They're setting their own agenda, their own subcommittees, their own policies. So when we finally get the uh, recommendations from them, it truly is gonna be community led. It's not gonna be that somebody who currently works for the city of San Jose has showed up and is managing the process in order to get a certain outcome. And so that is the reason. I think Mr. Somebody... Siegel, Mr. Siegel, the question was why not a county employee? City why? employee. But, but in your in your description it says county or city. And Commissioner Posada's question was why a county employee would be excluded. That's I'm so correct. sorry, Thank Commissioner you. Posadas. Thank you for that Thank catch you. chair for air. We will delete county. Thank you. 
Mr. Fuentes. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I well, actually I just want to make a comment. Um, I really want to thank the committee for, you know, we've been watching. I wasn't part of your committee at the time, and we've been watching all the work you've been doing for months on this really important critical issue to our community. The speakers you have brought in have been tremendous. Um, we've learned a lot, and, and you've really done great work, and, and I really uh, support your recommendation 100%. I think this is time for us to do this, and it's very fair and reasonable what you're proposing, and I, I strongly support it and hope I can help um, see it see it happen. And I just want to add, you know, as a mom, as a aunt, as a wife, as a former wife, um, and um, sister, um, daughter of, of men who really have been necess not necessarily impacted personally by the police, but do have that that um, that feeling toward the police of of not really trusting and not really knowing what could happen or what will happen to them. Um, I think in terms of both men and, and I'm sure all people may feel this way. Um, I think in the future when all of this is implemented, whether it's a year or two years from now, we are really going to have people in our community feel safer and have more trust in the system. Um, so I really want to thank you and, and, and deeply support you for what you have done. Thank you. The whole team. Thank you, Commissioner Quintus. Commissioner Quaytran. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm not the idea of civilian oversight, so I am fully in support of that. I, I have some questions about that and then about the individual departments. Um, the, uh, you know, Commissioner Macy kind of made a point about, you know, imbuing an unelected body with the ability to make decisions such as hiring and firing. I do have, I still have reservations about that. The difference between giving that power to the city manager is that we still have one person who is charged and, and supposed to be, supposedly, supposed to be held accountable for the decisions that occur among staff. Um, so uh, in that regard, I would still think that if the, I think the police commission should be able to make recommendations as to whether to hire and fire, um, and that can be, uh, but that the final decision should still um, either, I think, be validated by the council or, um, or somehow that feedback gets to the city manager and that and then the city manager has to make that decision uh, based on the recommendation. Uh, so I, I still wouldn't be so comfortable giving that specific power, specific, uh, you know, uh, power that cannot be reversed or, or is imbued only in the commission um, for that reason. Um, now in terms of the, 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 however, the one thing that Commissioner Macy said that I think you actually already addressed, you know, which is whether or not, you know, police officers and police union and, and police department would have been a part of the conversation. I think you mentioned that in your proposed structure, staff as a general matter do get to participate in this process because they already have channels of communication to decision makers, right? Um, and, you know, police officers are staff, they are city employees. Uh, they can communicate through their chain of command. Uh, they can communicate through their union and, and participate in the process uh, in that specific capacity, uh, rather than sitting in a, sitting as a member of the commission. Um, so I do uh, I believe that is addressed, and maybe not in a way that brings them more into the process, uh, but it does. But that that ability for them to communicate um, via the city structure as it currently exists is already there. So. I do uh, I, I want to acknowledge that point from commissioners as well. And uh, sorry, one thing, um, I want to make sure I'm saying the name correct because I've heard it two different ways. Is it Seagal or Siegel? I'll answer to both of them, but it's okay. Siegel. Siegel, all right, thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, the, it's still, it's supportive still. Um, looking at the uh, subcommittee idea though, you mentioned that, you know, um, you wanted the commission to be very community led, that it should be civilians. However, we also wanted to create subcommittees that allows members of the community to be part of the process. Um, you know, it, it, by your presentation, though, aren't commissioners the representative of the community itself? If we are all, you know, if the commissioners look like we are in this body, we're, we're all you know, civilians. We're not officers. We're not law enforcement. Aren't we already the body? Aren't don't we already represent the community? Okay, I'm I'm happy to answer your questions. Uh, in a way, yes. So yes and no. Um, the way that we are, of course, is the obvious way that we are living here. We're members of the community. And so 
if, if we happen to be one of the folks elected to be com uh, police commissioners, then we're happy about that. The problem is that there aren't going to be that many of those folks, right? There's going to be uh, 20, you know, th th in the 20s. And there are literally hun hundreds of people that have been affected by this issue who want to be involved in the process. And so how do those folks get involved? Um, how do folks from Reimagining, the caller who called in today, what if he's not somebody who his city council person elected? Does that mean he then gets no input into this oversight structure at all? And so I think the community is really looking for a way that they can actively participate somehow in the questions that are being asked in the policy questions in the use of force questions they want to both be able to understand what's happening give input as to what's happening and i think that they will not accept oversight as legitimate unless they're involved and remember that quote we heard from brian core um anything about us without us is not for us. Remember that? And so if the, what, what we hear from folks in the community looking for police oversight, first and foremost is they want involvement. They wanna be involved in understanding. They wanna be involved in knowing why and, and they wanna participate. And so how do you get a few hundred folks participating? If you had a perfect oversight model, and folks couldn't participate, they would not see it as legitimate. And that's the problem that we are trying to address with the subcommittees. Thank you, Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to the, to the commissioners for the, the presentation and thoughtful recommendations. And again, for all the education they've provided the commission um, and members of the public to, to lead up to this. Um, I wanted to short, uh, start with a couple hopefully quick comments and then ask some questions. Um, regarding the, well, questions and comments. Regarding the terms and the term limits, for, for a task as difficult as this and, and sort of requiring getting up to speed with departmental practices, the history of this issue, best best uh, practices for auditing, for investigations, et cetera. Two-year terms and a six-year term limit seem potentially quite short to me. And certainly that initial one-year term that you're recommending seems too short for, for people to get their feet under them um, and really be effective, especially assuming that some of the initial members of such a commission might be some of the, the leaders who have really done the work to, to make it happen. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering whether you would consider uh, potentially longer terms, longer term limits, and, and for that initial staggering of terms, perhaps three-year terms instead of one-year terms. Um, and I'm just going to put out all, all my sort of questions and comments about sort of the commission itself and how people get on and off and everything. Um, Before I forget, um, can you just send us a memo, just send the whole commission a memo of what you would propose in terms of term, terms, initial terms and term limits, keeping in mind that we don't want everybody leaving at the same time. We only ever want half of the commission um, having to cycle out. So if you could send a memo with what you would like, we will absolutely consider that. Sure, I don't know if I would consider it a memo, <laughs> but um, yeah, I can definitely put some thoughts in writing. Um, the, I know Commissioner, I think it was Commissioner Marshman had asked uh, or referred to what the method would be um, for, for removal of commissioners. Um, I don't know whether we need to discuss that tonight, but it, it seems that that is present in, in uh, language for other commissions and um, just would be important to have um, and, and that that language would uphold what I, I think the recommendation is attempting to do in terms of both appropriate levels of accountability and appropriate levels of sort of insulation um, from the types of political influence that could interfere with the effectiveness in the commission. Um, so I would ask about that. And then I, I'd also- Before I forget, could anyone interested in giving us an opinion on that? please um, put that, put the proposal in writing for um, how commissioners should be removed if there is a 
you know, undue influence feeling about that commissioner. So if you could send us what you believe, that would really be helpful. I, I don't. And I, the reason I'm, I'm attempting to defer to your committee is because of the extensive study that you've done and, and thinking that there's probably good models from other cities. Um, I, I was curious also about the number of commissioners. I think, it, and I, I um, couldn't in my quick look through find it in the memo. I think you said in the 20s, and I seem to remember some of the other examples were much smaller, sort of more in the, the five to seven range, which does seem valuable for a commission to really be functional at the level of, of work of, you know, oversight of staff, conducting investigations. Um, a 20 person commission seems much better suited for a task like the one that we've had. So I, I wanted to kind of hear more about, about that and the rationale. I'm looking through the proposal now and um, I can absolutely get back to you on that. And I'm also interested, I've taken, I'm interested in your comments about the size that you would be interested in. Um, and let me, if you could kindly give me a second to go through my presentation. And of course. Commissioner Segal, I think I can answer. I believe the commission would uh, be 11, one from each council member and one from the mayor. So that would be a total of 11. Yes. Um, and, and so we just thought each council member would want to appoint somebody. That's why we chose 11. Do you think that that's too big, Commissioner Matsumura? I do wonder about that. It interacts with, with just sort of the mechanism for appointments overall. And again, how do, you, how do you walk that line of ensuring accountability to the public while also shielding the commission from certain types of political influence? I do remember thinking um, that the, the method um, that the city of Oakland had for appointments to the commission was interesting. I unfortunately don't remember what the methods of appointment were for some of the other jurisdictions we heard from, um, but just wonder, you know, whether those, those might be models um, for us. It, they're more complicated, I mean, than this. This is so simple. It's like you have a city council person, they get to pick somebody. And the other is a little bit more complicated. In Oakland, they have um, a panel. So they they will you know, suggest a whole panel to the city council there, and then the city council can accept or reject, but they have to accept or reject a whole panel. Why? Because they don't want an individual person getting pointed out and persecuted for perhaps having done um, civil rights work, right? So that's why if, if somebody's done a bunch of civil rights work and now they wanna be a commissioner, we don't want folks saying, oh no, I'm gonna veto this one person because they've already done civil rights work. So they send an entire um, panel and then city council has to accept or reject that whole thing. Other people actually do it by, um, they pick a straw. I don't know if you guys remember, somebody said that. They just have a lottery. They go through, they pick lottery, and then whoever wins that lottery, and that seems to work really well for some folks. There are a lot of ways to pick, and we were just aiming for the most simplistic way that would avoid um, the question of, well, who gets to decide that? And how is that, you know, I live in District 10. Why does this person represent me? I live in District 4, why does that person represent me? And so this would be an answer to that. Of course, you're gonna have somebody that represents you in District 10. Of course, you're gonna have somebody that represents you in District 6 and in District 4. And so it, it's a more egalitarian way to avoid that question. There might, five might be a better number, but people might not think so if they don't feel like they're getting representation on the police commission. Okay. So that was the reason. Thank you for that rationale. Uh, Commissioner Percival? I, th I think uh, Commissioner Tran actually had his head up, hand up before me. Uh, yes, but I believe I've already spoken. So he's You've spoken already. Up. That's why I'm okay. going to Percival first. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and, I, and I too wanted to share my my deep thanks to uh, members of the subcommittee for all the all the work you've done on this issue. It's a, I am um, a big believer that we need to listen to and studying this um, we, we're way behind on, on so many issues with, in policing and, and community oversight and input. 
and uh, equity. So I really applaud applaud this work. Um, I am, I guess, so to echo a bit of what uh, Commissioner Mitsky was was coming on earlier. I am uh, interested in actually seeing uh, this broad framework, whether it's these specifics or something a little different, actually move forward and, and be successful. Um, almost all my questions with the experts that came before us dealt with really questions about implementation and um, and honestly, did, you know, so the politics around policing. And I know we've heard a lot from the public about, you know, focusing on policies and those are obviously really important, but, you know, through our political process where we hash out some of these and we can't avoid that. Um, even though I don't think we like to think of this as a political body, but uh, in the end, policing is, is very, very political. And um, so I'm wondering, um, to, to move this forward in a way that actually generates some real change that's, that's badly needed. Um, I, I guess I'm wondering about, um, Commissioner Siegel, your, your comment about the, the sort of the negotiations and the labor contract, whether that's really going to uh, be a, a venue to have, you know, um, effective dialogue because it's my understanding that those are those kinds of contractual negotiations are done behind closed doors it's not really set up to be sort of this public uh, forum in which we can uh, listen and and try to learn learn from each other and certainly that's not saying that uh, police officers don't have a voice because they certainly do and in many parts of this, this this debate they dominate the conversation and have for many years we just can look in san jose to know how much money the police union has has spent on campaigns and other things to try to to try to block uh, block reform, but um, so I I would like to hear a little bit more and then sort of thinking about next steps about how to how to bring in other other perspectives and how they they work with um, within and try to get buy in on some of these really important reforms. So I, I'm saying that in the spirit of trying to move this forward. Uh, and to bring change that's badly needed. Um, and I guess I'd also encourage the subcommittee to look a little bit more about um, the relationship between the, the uh, police commission down in Los Angeles and uh, its role with the mayor, because I think um, I'd mentioned uh, last week, either a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, the uh, Rodney King incident, of course, in the early 90s, uh, where, where Los Angeles, where the, they had a very powerful police commission, but the, the mayor who was uh, trying to invoke change and respond to uh, that event uh, couldn't, right? And so I think Los Angeles has gone back and, and made changes to that uh, and give the mayor more power to, to fire or hire the, the police chief. So uh, I'm not saying that model is perfect for San Jose, but I'm wondering if you've studied that a little bit more, maybe would encourage you to do so if you haven't uh, yet. So thank you. So um, with your last question, yes, and um, we are, so in, in LA, yes, it's the mayor that um, appoints there, I believe, five police commissioners. We did not choose that model because we don't think it's very, dem we don't want it, um, we don't think it's as democratic as having city council actually choose them because we all vote for the mayor, that's true, but we also all vote for our city council members and there's nothing wrong with having um, all of our elected representatives having a voice in something as important as policing and policing oversight. We don't want to consolidate that decision to a single person. We're all fallible. I've made mistakes. We've all made mistakes. And we all also get overburdened, overtaxed. Just in the course of being a commissioner, I've had so, I mean, I've been yelled at multiple times by the public in both, you know, for, for varying reasons. And um, it does get quite exhausting. And we just don't, we, we would like a as democratic of a process as possible, taking, spreading the uh, responsibility as well as the blame on all of our representatives, not just the mayor. I think just focusing it on one person, I think in 2021, there's no need to do that. We have many elected representatives, we have, we actually have a city council and our choice was to have the entire city council as well as the mayor, everyone to, um, to 
elect the police to appoint the police commission. We, we just, we think that the LA model of having the mayor do it all is outdated. We think that this for San Jose, San Jose, the, the folks here are all about how can I be included in this conversation and having that, having it just be limited to the mayor to appoint these folks, it doesn't inspire legitimacy. Again, we don't want to go through something and have the community say, I don't view this as legitimate because I'm not involved. Okay. So that would be the answer. And this, the first part of your question, I'm going to pass to Commissioner Callender, if you can remember what that was. I didn't catch the first part of the question. I think that you hit it. I think it was more of a statement. Well, I know it was a question in the sense of how do you see this, you know, trying to uh, give uh, your proposal the best chance of, of moving forward um, as it goes to city council, as, as uh, inevitably police get involved in trying to craft uh, policy, uh, whether it's charter or a mix of charter and other policy changes? Well, I think that um, clearly the, um, I've heard from at least the commissioners here that you'd want to make sure that at least the police unions, and I'm assuming the police chief is involved in the discussions, and I think that's a, um, that's a fair idea. I do believe that We've received letters that probably indicate that they were involved in the discussion in, in different capacities and ways. None of us are silly enough to think that they're not paying attention to what's going on. It's not like this has been done. Um, this has been completely out in the open. Um, so I think the participation is definitely be there. But but I think we can continue to reach out and can continue to uh, be able to move something forward that makes sense. I do believe that this is a model that makes sense for this community. And it is time to update this model and it's time to be able to move forward. No, no, in, no um, department's gonna say they want additional oversight. Um, let's just be frank here. But what we can do is we can have the discussion and then hopefully be able to have something that's political ten politically you know, tenable to council as well as to us. Thank you. I'm gonna go to Commissioner Fuentes, then Commissioner Huey Tran, and then Commissioner Matsumura. For second set of questions, Commissioner Fuentes. Commissioner Fuentes, you're muted. I was just saying that it's it's actually my second term to comment, but I I actually have a question um, to the presenters, and that has to do with how do you see our commission and the role that we can and should play as this moves forward because um, this is a huge, huge um, major change um, in our city. And um, I, I really would like to hear from you to see how our entire commission will have a role in that process. I don't know if you've even thought about that, you know, moving ahead like that, but um, if you have any thoughts on that, if not, you know, we can talk about it in the future. Uh, Commissioner Segal, if I can go ahead. I think in terms of our role in the process, our role would be if, if we choose to vote, vote this up or vote this down and then send it over to the council the same way that the uh, police um, auditor was put into the charter. I can't actually recall if that was through a charter review commission, but that was negotiated. And at the time, that was all the community was able to get. We knew that that didn't work then. We fought for a, a better oversight model, and we know that, that that model doesn't work now. So I think the role of this commission is going to be limited to whatever final recommendation comes out of it, voting it up, voting it down, or making whatever change it's going to ultimately look like. But that will be the extent of our role. Okay, Commissioner Tran, Koi Tran, and then Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. Um, just so you know, I'm, I'm drafting up a lot of questions and, and feedback that I actually have right now, and I'm going to email it to the chair and hopefully forward it to PM Live because uh, I have a lot of questions, but I, I'm supportive. Uh, so I just want to focus on uh, some of um, some structural questions or some high level questions. Um, I noticed that under your section for the in independent investigation department, um, you mentioned that there is still going to be an internal affairs. Um, so uh, my question is for the IID is, is it basically an internal affairs that's external? They would conduct uh, investigations into complete complaints against the police and do that completely separate from the IA? And if that is the case, what happens between the results of an investigation via IA and the results of an investigation via IID? Like, where if they clash, if they come to different conclusions, what happens there? Uh, and then I have a second question related Wait, to the Can I answer that really quickly? Because yes, I will course. forget. That's a fantastic sure. question, Commissioner Tran. I mean, that is just a very, very basic um, oversight question. So I really commend you for, for seeing that. 
Um, actually, that is exactly the kind of thing that always happens when you have an, an independent investigations, right? So you, you have um, the police investigating something, and then you have the independent investigator investigating something. And when they are um, synonymous, then nothing happens because it's synonymous. But when they're different, then that gets um, taken up to the police commission, right? Um, so it depends if you're talking about a case or if you're talking about policies. And so that is something that you're going very, very deep now into the nuggets of how this thing is going to work. And I don't think that we um, are necessarily going that deep into it here at a charter review level. I think that that is something that um, the city council will probably do. Um, we're not going, but, but yes, that is actually exactly what happens. There's going to be times they agree, times they don't agree, and they go up to their boss, which is the civilian police commission, to resolve that. Um, I had a question for you sure, if you're done with the questions for me. Go ahead. Sure. A follow-up to that then is, um, it, it, I know that the police commission is charged with specific, your, your, in your proposal, the police commission has specific power to fire and hire the police chief. Mm -hmm. um, what about the lower rank officers, rank and file? Typically in um, police, co police commissions typically don't do, so the way that my understanding is how they work, um, the police commission is really communicating with the police chief or the police chief's designee. So let's say there's one officer who clearly was a bad actor. So the commission, and, and but, but that wouldn't be an automatic assumption, right? There would be internal affairs doing an investigation and then there would be the independent auditor doing an investigation. If everybody kind of agrees or if one of those parties thinks that person's a bad actor, it goes up to the police commission, um, then the police commission will um, uh, make, a, make its own Rep, uh, recommendation or not recommendation it will tell the police chief they will vote so the so they're a body just like we're a body and the commission will actually vote on it and then their vote will go to the police chief i don't think that the commission you, normally police commissions at a high level aren't firing dispatchers you know people who are ta taking reports or that kind of thing they sort of just make their they make their recommendation to the chief of police, and then it's up to the chief of police to execute that. I'm using the word recommendation because I'm tired and it's late. The, their um, decision, their vote. They will tell that to the police chief. The police chief executes it. The police chief, if the police chief doesn't, then the remedy would be to fire the police chief. Um, but it, they're not, I don't think, typically involved on that minute level inside the police department of hiring and firing folks. You asked a different question, which is, would there still be an internal affairs? Yes, there would be internal affairs. Um, and just so you know, in Oakland, and it's the only place that does this, they have dissolved internal affairs in their police department and just have moved it right up into the police commission. It's the most amazing thing. So the police no longer have internal affairs. They no longer have um, an investigator. It's all just those employees that are actual employees of the police union work inside the police commission. It's so different, but I haven't seen anyone else do that. And that's not our recommendation here. We kind of think that that, yeah. So, um, it, <clears throat> thank you, Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. Um, Got to get back to the place in my notes where I had my questions. Um, uh, a couple things. So, you know, there's been much discussion about the relationship of our process to the work of the reimagining task force. I did see their letter, really appreciate um, having their representative here tonight and, and his patience in waiting for his turn to testify, which I'm looking forward to. How are we envisioning that that this would work with um, with their process, you know, we're going to recommend something. Would we be expecting that City Council act on it, or would wait for further recommendations from reimagining? Especially because there have been these questions around, um, you know, engagement of of police and and reimagining 
overall, you know, setting aside even the topic of engaging police is doing, you know, I think um, quite a lot of engagement and has a lot of good representation. So just wanted, I know that there has been coordination. Ultimately, where is this landing for how the work of the two uh, bodies relates to each other? Thank you for that question. That's an excellent question. Um, the worst thing that could happen, the absolute worst thing, is for the city council to say, oh, you know, Charter Review Commission, this was all good and nice. Thank you for your volunteer work. But we have reimagining as a process, and we're just going to sit this recommendation with them, wait for their year, and see what they come up with for a Charter Review recommendation. That would be the very worst thing that could happen. And this recommendation is reimagining's recommendation. We've worked with them. They support it. This is their recommendation for a charter review change. We are not working with them on policy changes. Their process is they're going to recommend anything and any, everything they want to recommend on a policy level, but this is their charter recommendation. We haven't had an opportunity to review the charter for police oversight in commission form in 36 years. And so here it is. They're not interested in waiting another five years or 10 years or 36 years. This is their recommendation. This is the one they're supporting. And they fully expect city council to act on it on a charter level. And then in a year when they're done with their blue ribbon commission process, they'll make those recommendations also to city council at that time. But no one is expecting city council to do nothing at this point. Thank you. Hey. And last question, last question from me. We heard from quite a number of models um, you pointed out some recommendation, for example, about the number of commissioners in the process of appointment that you are recommending be different from, for example, City of Oakland, from Los Angeles. I'm wondering if not to go through the entire proposal, but if there are other particular pieces that you would want to lift up for us where you put particular thought into this should be exactly like BART or this should be very different from San Diego. Just, you know, if there are, are highlights um, that you would have for us to keep in mind of how you've tailored this um, to the city of San Jose. So that would take a good 15 minutes. And I, I think was gonna say, Commissioner Matsumura, do you have a specific question? Because I think they've been incredibly thorough in their presentation and the written documentation is exceptional in their presentation. So if you have a specific question, I'd ask you to narrow it down a bit so we can keep moving. No, Remember, it, this it, is coming it, back. If, if you want them to think about that in their next presentation, perhaps, would be also part of what they can do at the public hearing? Sure. I'm just always interested in, in hearing more of their thinking. And so if there was anything that, that they wanted to take the opportunity to lift up, I was, I was requesting that. But yeah, I, and I appreciate that. And Commissioner Siegel, I think you all have done an incredible job. So I would just ask that in your public presentation at the public hearing, if there is anything that you specifically say, we really wanted to make sure we say it this way because our thought, our thought process was this, I'd ask that you do it at that time because I really would like to go to the public because there have been speakers waiting to speak. So I'm seeing no more hands. So, so I'm gonna ask the clerk to go to the public and for the public to be able to comment on a police commission, independent investigation department and office of Investi uh, inspector general. Clerk can call the first speaker. Karab Ansari. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Commissioners, for your work on, uh, on this recommendation. It's greatly appreciated by the community and the people. Uh, my name is Tarab Ansari, and I'm here to speak on behalf of the Reimagining Public Safety Community Advisory Committee. The purpose of this memorandum is to convey to the Council and Committee our support for a Community Oversight Committee to be added to the City's Charter to the work of the Charter Review Commission. For too long, the San Jose Police Department has been allowed to police itself without the benefit of accountability from the community. At this point, much of the community believes police are not accountable to anyone, which is destroying trust between the community and the public safety apparatus. We believe that a community such as we believe that a committee such as the one that has that is being proposed should not only advise, but have the authority to investigate individual incidents of misconduct, have the power to issue disciplinary measures and speak meaningfully to the policies and procedures that exist within their current policing structures. 
We support the Charter Commission recommending a police oversight committee whose main function should include but not be limited to patterns of practice, use of force, training, policies and practices, promotions, demotions, hiring and firing, investigative functions, including subpoena power, ability to review unredacted records and review police arbitration. In order to ensure this committee garners the public's trust, the community should have direct input on who serves on such a committee, giving special consideration to, committee, to communities most impacted by police violence. This will avoid government officials, elected and staff, from injecting politics contrary to the public's interest. Thank you very much for your time. I yield my rest of my time. Call in user one. You are unmuted. Why the ideas sound great, and I'd love to be on this commission somehow. There's no way my city council person is going to pick me. I think these. I think their disciplinary hearing should at least be open to the public, where yet they could be mocked and ridiculed. Quite frankly, but the, you know, they have so much vanity. They need. They need to hear that when they've done something wrong. But you're gonna. You got a lot of work. You're going to fight their union and those officers because think about what they're in charge of. They're in charge of all the marijuana dispensaries, regulate, regulating them, tax collection, all that. So they're, they're the biggest drug dealers in town. What else do they regulate and make enforcement calls on? Massage parlors. It's like they're pimps. Right? They also say, well, you, you can have a strip bar. How you? how your bar is supposed to operate. I got one better. They're in charge of the gambling in this town. I mean, the Corleone could have only dreamed of what San Jose Police Department has. They're well-funded, they're very cunning, and they're soulless, they're heartless. And you're going up against them, you better be prepared because these guys were loaded for bear. I just say guys and gals, people. I'm gonna refer them as people because they usually hate when you say those people. But imagine what you're going to do. These guys are collecting cash money from those dispensaries. Where does that cash go? Nobody ever questions that. Is it in a dark room somewhere in the police headquarters with, uh, you know, with a barricaded door and a guard in front of it? Because you can't put cash from marijuana into the banking system. It's illegal because it's federally uh, regulated. It's illegal to do that. They would be committing uh, crimes against the federal government. So imagine if Yes, thank you, Tessa Wimansi. Yes, um, I've been having trouble with the whole concept of policing and that the, even the word police. Um, in in the, the history of the police, from what I'm learning, is that it comes from the South and that it was the control of the, the slaves in our country and that they had to be armed to, to control the, the slaves. And so this was, you know, the beginning of capitalism is, you know, protecting their property, which was the slaves at the time. And it's, it's only uh, transmuted into, you know, now we have police with guns, you know, protecting the businesses. You saw Deb Davis walking around Willow Glen with the police behind her, you know, to be part of the neighborhood there. And it, it very much felt like fascism to see that, that bundling of the government with the police and the businesses. And, and so this is what needs to be reimagined is that we need to become, you know, to disarm is one part of it, is the disarming of it. And so not creating this whole police oversight commissions and all that, we have to really re reimagine it. And it is about disarming. That, that's the beginning of it, is the disarming. And, and then it's, it needs to be, we need to be creating a, a community of caring and problem solving. And that, the, you know, you know, why are you stealing, you know, from this thing? Oh, you don't have food, that type of thing versus, you know, beating them up and put them in jail and, you know, this type of thing. We need to be, you know, dealing more with our problems and having a, 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 a um, like I, you know, I say a caring community support. It's a support network, problem solving network. And, and, and instead of policing with guns and even without the cars, you know, we don't need, we shouldn't be having the cars you know, because of our fossil fuel problems. So we have to get rid of that. And so it needs to be on the bicycle or walking and be going back to the European model. Of Mayor Beekman? 
Hi, Blair Beekman here. Um, this was a real good item tonight. Thank you. Um, I guess, you know, I'm, 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 I'm starting to get an idea of how things can work, uh, work with these things. I am like way behind in understanding things and good practices. I'm trying to learn. I've been trying to learn a more, um, I don't know, inclusive approach. You know, I've been writing letters about an, an inclusive approach that can address green sustainability, uh, equity, reimagine, uh, and Ohlone issues and bring it in all under one space. I, I mean, these are great items tonight, but it, I guess only a few of them will eventually make it to the charter. And I'm trying to figure out ways that to try to bring in as much as possible into the charter. Um, I, I, you know, uh, the ideas of a surveillance and technology ordinance from the ACLU, I'm really sorry that was not a part of this uh, group. I guess there is, a, there will be a technology item later. That is, well, that'll be really nice to hear. And, and, you know, if there's a way to incorporate that, say, into the future of police oversight, uh, good luck how to do that. Um, it's those sort of things, learning then to then bring together uh, different programs uh, under you know, different uh, groups that do make it into the charter. To conclude, um, you know, I'm, I'm concerned, you know, about the issues of, uh, is there a language prepared uh, for the charter if, if a community oversight board can eventually make it to the ballot process? Does that sort of language need to be worked on? And does an extension of the uh, city charter commission process, is it needed for that? I, I, that's what my letter tried to bring out and, and make clear to, make, to give ourselves choices and how to understand things. Uh, good words tonight, so I can understand this better. Uh, thanks for the issue. Alina Yin. Thank you, commissioners, uh, for this very thoughtful and thorough proposal. Um, thank you, Commissioner Siegel, for your thoughtful and thorough answers tonight. I believe this is a fair process and it's um, been shared. The process will include you know, the police department. So there is an opportunity for them to come together with the people in good faith to address and course correct the policies and procedures that has led to immeasurable loss of life, community harm, and really the people's faith in our democracy. So with these charter amendments setting these skeletal structures of change, and then with the reimagining public safety committee working on the policies and implementations you know, putting some meat and teeth into these reforms. I think the community has really um, done nothing but commit to their due diligence and following all the processes and procedures to create these changes. And I thank you for all of your time and efforts and your resilience and your commitment to this process. And uh, I really appreciate everything that you've done. And also um, with the reimagining com um, advisory committee, everything they've done and how you've worked together and the collaboration and, um, symbiotic relationship, as you have so stated, uh, of this whole entire process. And so thank you, and I yield my time. Back to the chair. Thank you, members of the public. I appreciate you also sticking with us this late to get to this very important item. Our next item is equity values, equity standards, and equity assessments. And I believe it's going to be Commissioner Callender presenting tonight. Indeed, it is late. Let me share my screen. I will try to stay within the eight minutes is promised. Um, so what we're trying to, hold on a second, I got my screen all set up. Uh, so what we're trying to address is San Jose has a long history of failing to achieve equity, inclusion, and racial justice, particularly in regards to BIPOC constituencies with low income people. You see this in a lot of multiple, you see this in multiple areas, including affordable housing, transportation, healthcare, access to parks, green space, employment opportunities, law enforcement, assets and in incomes and many others. And when you look at the charter, it only addresses discrimination in employment or any way um, or in any way favored or discriminated against because of political opinion or affiliations or membership in a lawful employees association or because of race, color, or creed. It does not address what we're trying to address. So what, why does equity belong in the charter? Well, it's easy to imagine that the equity goals could be have been achieved through city council election or cultural change, but those strategies have proven so far to just simply be inadequate. So waiting for them to generate better and faster results condemns those who suffer from inequalities for another long 
indefinite delay. And to demonstrate a full commitment to equity, we must first employ every major mechanism that's available, including the city charger, city charter, excuse me. Racial equity assessments are best conducted during the decision-making process and prior to enacting a new proposal. And they're used to inform decisions, much like environmental impact statements, fiscal impact reports, or workplace risk reports. Cities like Detroit have been using them successfully as they educated us on, the, on them. And as the, well as the United Kingdom has been using them for success for nearly a decade. So let me hit some just some key definitions here. So racial and social equality shall mean the condition that would be achieved if one group's identity based on categorizations that have experienced discrimination, including race, aspects of neurodiversity and sexual orientation, no longer predicted in a statistical sense on how one's fared. Inclusion shall be, shall be uh, bringing together traditionally excluded individuals and or groups into processes, activities, and decision-making policy, making in a way that shares power. Racial and social justice shall mean the systematic and proactive fair treatment of and allocation of resources for all people of all races and all categorizations that have experienced discrimination resulting in equitable opportunities and outcomes for all. Access shall mean the ability to lawfully impose positive or negative consequences on decision makers. Accountability must include outreach to and communication with constituencies likely to be affected by the proposal being assessed. And representation means the ability to affect those who will be making decisions that impact the constituency and what the outcomes of the decision process will be. I know I'm covering this really fast, but this is all in the proposal. Hopefully you had the opportunity to read it. If you read the proposal, you'll see that it's there. Equity standards. So equity standards, so we're basically looking at several different areas. Safety, living free from harm or threat of harm uh, from other persons, private institutions, or city agencies as every other resident. Environmental health will mean living in an environment with clean air, soil, and water as every other resident. Water and sanitation addresses having access to clean water supplies for personal and domestic use and adequate sanitation services as every other resident. Parks and recreations having access to parks, recreational opportunities, community centers, and urban green spaces as every other res resident. Mobility and transportation addresses well-maintained and lighted streets and roadways, signage and other mechanisms to ensure pedestrian and vehicle safety and the opportunity for walking and biking as every other resident. Economic development addresses ensuring that all residents have uh, have public economic development investments as residents of every other part of the city. Housing standards ensures that every resident is entitled to the protections provided by the city enforcement of housing codes as every other resident. Workforce protections means every person who's employed within the city is, is entitled to protection against injury, discrimination, and wage theft as every other employee. Neighborhood amenities, residents of every neighborhood are entitled to amenities provided by the city as a cultural, represent, uh, cultural presentations or library services of residents in other neighborhood. The last one isn't there, but someone had asked about, um, is this like CEQA? And the answer is no. Nothing in this section is intended, nor shall be construed to create a binding funding obligation for the city or cause of action against city, which makes this completely different than CEQA. So when we're looking at an equity assessment, an, equ an equity assessment shall be conducted for the annual operating and capital budgets as contained in the recommended budgets generated by the city manager each fiscal year for major policies and programs to be decided on by the city council. The determination as whether a policy or program is a major one will require an assessment to be made by a majority vote of the city council or by the submission of petitions with at least 2,500 signatures from residents of the city. The process for determining when a policy or program is major, including the process for the submission of petitions will be established by the city council. And the assessment shall include the, um, the following elements. Does the proposed change have any disproportionate impact on racial or ethnic minorities or people of low income and or group categorizations that, uh, that experience discrimination? Does the proposed change increase or decrease the level of representation for racial or ethnic minorities and or people of low income or other group categorizations that have experienced discrimination in, in decision making? Does the proposed change increase or decrease the extent to which city officials and staff are accountable to racial or ethnic minorities and or low income and or other group categorizations 
that have experienced discrimination? Does the proposed change increase or decrease the access of ethnic or racial minorities and or low income people and other group categorizations that have experienced decision making? Excuse me, I read that one. And does the proposed increase, increase or decrease the extent to which ethnic or racial minorities and low income people or other group categorizations that have experienced discrimination receive a fair share of city services and benefits? Does the proposed change increase or decrease the safety and security of ethnic or racial minorities and or low income people and or other group categorizations that have experienced discrimination? And finally, does the proposed if does the proposed change increase or decrease the ability of the city to meet significant needs of ethnic or racial minorities and or low income people and or other group categorizations that have experienced disc um, discrimination? And then finally, equity assessments shall be presented at a public hearing. The final draft of the assessment must be published a minimum of two weeks before the day of that hearing. I believe I'm at questions and I'm inside of my eight minutes. Thank you, Commissioner Callender. Questions, discussion, feedback for Commissioner Callender, subcommittee's recommendation. Commissioner Hui Tran. Commissioner Callender, uh, I appreciate the proposal. Uh, I have seen some of the other recommendations um, that the subcommittee has proposed and presented, and I believe some of them are going to be dependent upon whether or not your motion is adopted. So I just wanted to verify if your motion is not adopted, do memos such as recommendation number nine, uh, do we just drop it by default? Well, the one thing I did want to do, and we actually had had that discussion, I think just uh, either Saturday or Sunday, the days are blending together because we've met so much. I think what we want to do is make sure that the elements are present here. There's some ideas that were not originally in here when Mr. Brownstein originally pre um, presented, for example, a budget. Um, uh, Commissioner Fuentes is, uh, definitely has some different ideas. I've looked at what she's, what she's presenting, and I think some of those can be incorporated. Um, there's some other equity standards that I think could be addressed if we were to pull these in here, but I don't want to say that, yes, this should be the one that moves <clears> forward. <throat> I think that there's, there's common elements that could be included and that could, that we could take the best from all and, and bring it back hopefully as one. Okay, and, uh, and then as a follow-up on that, um, the, it appears that your recommendation is intended to, in a sense, serve as a foundation for any kind of equity assessment that is conducted through other recommendations. So uh, this seems to be like that floor, and then any other proposals are attachments therefrom. Yeah, it, uh, correct. I think right now that's how I'm looking at it. I think there's other things that could be bolstered that could be brought in uh, to the equity assessment, but this is supposed to be the ground level floor. This is what's supposed to provide for the standard as well as how we do the assessment, as well as the areas that we've looked at. And I believe everyone should have received the language. It should be, um, um, there's additional language that's in there, but what I've hit is pretty much all the high level stuff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Matsumura, then Commissioner Marshman. Thank you, and thank you very much for the work and the speed reading. Um, I, I appreciate the standards, and I'm also appreciating just the difficulty of trying to come up with standards that are appropriately comprehensive for all the different things that the city does. Um, and so I'm wondering whether your committee considered sort of creating more of a general standard of saying that that everything that the city offers by way of um, protections and resources or similar sort of language needs to be offered equitably or having an additional, or, or keeping the current level of specificity, but having um, some kind of additional, you know, final point, just acknowledging that there, there may be currently and almost certainly will be in the future other functions that the city um, carries out that the equity standards should apply to as well. Well, I believe the way that this was, we, we called out very specific standards, I think when this put together, but if you look at how this would work as well as with the budget process, we should be able to grab everything in terms of what's coming out through the budget um, and being able to apply the equity standards to that. So yes, I think these are the major areas that are included. And I think it's broad enough to cover that equity would be included in all the decision-making of the council, as well as any major decisions of the council. But by grabbing the budget, that's where you really do um, apply equity standards and equity assessments to anything that the city will be spending money on. I believe I see one more hand from Commissioner Marshman. 
Mr. Chairman, you're on mute. Oh well, I'll just I'll just ask. Um, first of all, I I do want to say that this committee has done extraordinary work. I mean, I have questions about things here and there, but uh, you've really uh, put in the time and and done wonderful documentation and so on for what you want and what you believe. Um, on on the equity assessments. I understand that they would not create a legal barrier the way CEQA sometimes can, um, for better or worse. Um, but it seems to me there's a built-in um, delay. You would need to start a long time before the deadline for budget adoption to do equity assessments on you know, any significant issue in the budget. Uh, so that's that's one question. The other is who does the equity assessments when the council decides they're necessary or when uh, the public demands that that they be done? How do you get a, a, uh, a neutral assessor um, who can um, uh, who, who will not be come into question? Well, as I think, as you can see, we didn't go down that deep in terms of who I know that often people have said that they'll look to the Office of Racial Equity or Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. That's not what we've done. This would stay with the city manager to basically be able to determine how it's done. And in terms of moving forward, we did not get into that level of policy. In terms of it, would this take time? Absolutely, this would take time. But you know, being able to obtain and achieve justice sometimes does take time. And I don't want us to say, okay, well, this is going to take too long. So let's not let's continue to, you know, ensure that it, we will continue to say that there's things that are inequitable. But since we don't have time, let's continue to do what we're doing. And so, yes, this would take time. Do I know how much time? No, obviously, uh, I, I couldn't tell you how much time that it would take. But it would change the process of what we're doing. And now I'll look back to, um, to Detroit and look back to um, other entities that have been able to put this into place. I think they've been able to do it successful successfully. So yes, it can be done. I do believe we have the ability to be done. I think it would not be advisable for us to say which department or whom would do it within the um, do it within this, the city. I think that that's where we get into um, probably the mismanagement of, of the of, of the city manager versus making sure that this is done and it's done in a way that would come back to council to basically ensure that there's a vote on it with um, items that make sense. So I know that's not a direct answer, but but I, I it would be the responsibility of management. Other questions or thoughts? Commissioner Al Calendar, I would add, add I would add two things. One is the county does this with sit, with children and um, families, and they have a checkbox there. And I think the equity question you're asking is much better and stronger because what I typically see is um, staff in the county will say no impact. Mm -hmm. um, and yet it's only if it's a very specific direct impact that they would say something. But many times county policies have a direct impact on children, just in an indirect kind of way. So I think asking for an equity assessment is the right way to go as opposed to just kind of checking the box. Because in practice, what happens is, I think as Commissioner Marshman said, that process gets really narrowed down because we don't have time. So we just check the box that says no impact. I think the second thing is I would agree with you in the, it shouldn't be just assigned to the Office of, of Racial Equities because it should be a practice of all departments that they have to be able to understand their proposal from the perspective of equity. And so the goal to me or the gold standard would be that all departments are able to do this assessment and when they're fighting for their budget or they're fighting for their policy, that they're able to articulate these pieces because they are the ones that should be closest to the impacted um, citizens of the, of the community when they're actually working on that. So if they're parks and rec, they should be able to talk about what's happening in a neighborhood and their impact of what that budget looks like. To me, those are the kind of live in vivo experiences that city staff often have um, and yet 
they kind of get lost when we get to the actual budget process. So I would support both those ideas that they not only that we shouldn't tell some one department to do them, but all departments should be able to do it. And it should be an assessment, not simply a checkbox that says, yes, yes, this is equitable or no, it's not. Um, I, I really support both of those kinds of concepts. Um, and with that, I will go to the public on this item. The public, this is item number five, equity, inclusion, and city programming and budgeting. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's item equity values, equity standards, equity assessments. Robert Brownstein. I was going to say good evening, could be good night. <laughs> it's been it's been a long session. Um, I've been uh, I've been an advocate for equity in San Jose since I moved here in 1978, and I believe this charter amendment is an important step forward in terms of accomplishing those goals. Uh, several, and, I, and by the way, I'm very pleased that other commissioners have tried to base additional proposals on this foundation. That's one of the things I would have hoped for. Um, one of the questions that was raised was regards timing. As regards the budget, timing's built into the process. The recommended budget comes out in the spring and the budget isn't adopted until late June. So there's room to do the uh, equity assessment. And for other kinds of policies, I think it would be a good thing for the city council to know it has to adjust its timing in order to allow equity to be taken into consideration um, before it makes uh, a final decision. Um, I think uh, it would not make sense to micromanage the equity process, that is assign it to a specific department uh, or give specific rules. Uh, this proposal has goals and processes, which is what a charter should do. And times change. You don't want to be fixated on certain specific recommendations that won't make sense five or 10 years from now. Um, so I, I urge approval. I think you'll be glad you supported it if you do. Claire Beekman. Hi, uh, Brad Beekman here. Thanks a lot for, for the words from uh, Bob Brownstein. Um, yeah, uh, I have tried to offer the same sort of words and I am just teeny tiny uh, in this process compared to what your cells are doing. And I don't know the depth of uh, what uh, this is, this item can accomplish, but uh, it, it's just, I'm looking at a lot to, and I'm feeling it can be a lot uh, for our future. So so thank you for everybody's work on it. And it, it'll be really nice just to review this item and uh, better understand. I mean, this is effort and work that people have put a lot of years into as uh, Mr. Brownstein just stated. So um, uh, good luck on our continued efforts, and uh, thank you for this item. Alina Yen. Uh, thank you, um, Commissioner Callender, for the great presentation and being so speedy. Um, I think this is extremely important. I think this pairs well with the Office of Racial Equity's work, but as Chair Ferrer also mentioned, it's the responsibility of all departments. I think this creates accountability, and part of that is literally literally counting and taking into account, keeping track and keeping records, similar to performance reviews so that we can track the progress of these changes. Additionally, you know, this is our city constitution and it absolutely belongs in this document as a new guiding principle, um, not only for the departments and city staff, but the residents and hopefully for each uh, future cities to follow. And so I thank you for that and I yield my time. All in user one. Who's going to enforce this? Who's going to regulate this? How much time will be wasted on it? I'd like to know because an example would be I'm an Italian American, right? I've never been honored by the city hall lighting up the rotunda and having a, 
an Italian American Heritage Day week or month. Okay. The city council always announces many different religious holidays, but when it comes to Christmas, it's just a holiday, happy holiday. Even though City Hall gets paid for Christmas, as do all the city employees, it's not honored. It's not equitable. I mean, you don't call other religious holidays just a holiday. I mean, I want to know when other religious holidays are than, other than my own are going to be, right? Like, I think it's cool. But the way that the city does it with my race and my religion is not equitable. So do, would I get to file a complaint against the city of San Jose for, for not honoring me and my people and my religious faith? Uh, my religious faith where you guys get paid money extra sometimes? I find it a little bit uh, a double standard with this equity thing. It's gonna, I mean, it, it's going to cause a lot of problems because if you're going to implement these rules, I'm going to be down at City Hall making sure that I'm be, that I'm being treated equitable, right? How would you, how would people like that if everyone went down to City Hall? And, hey, I'm not being treated equitable, equitably. It's going to happen, and I'm going to be first in line, and it won't be fun when you have to deal with me because I'm going to make sure that you guys live by your rules and your equitable values. That it 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 trickles down to every single person. People, even the people you don't like or don't don't want to want to recognize. Tessa Woodmancy. Okay, good. Thank you, Tessa Woodmancy. Um, well, what I, I liked about the uh, what Rick Callender was talking about is that every uh, department would have you know have to be up on their equity understanding in every department. And I see that as a corollary with our climate crisis too, or you know, trying to create a climate crisis commission um, is that you know, it needs to be in from every department and seeing it through that lens. So that was a good, um, you know, a good uh, protocol of that it, it would be going through every department as we look at it. And, and even they say, you know, that I, I didn't hear exactly what was going on in regards to the budget and stuff, but I, I've been listening to George Mambiat, um, and uh, he was saying, you know, we give, you know, when people get elected, then they get this, you know, sort of carte blanche to make all the decisions for five years or four years, whenever they're in. What was that? Oh, a, 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 it's called implied consent. And just like in sexuality, he said, we don't just give implied consent. You know, you have to, you know, get it from each activity or each person, whatever you're doing. So in that sense, he was saying that the way we make decisions, we should have more using our digital democracy. We should be able to decide our budget through, you know, um, real democratic um, engagement instead of saying, you know, this implied consent that they get to do whatever they want for four years after we voted them in. And the same thing, we need to have more, uh, digital, more granularity towards what, what, what's going into our budget. We should have more say in what goes into our budget. And they're doing that in, they said in Iceland and other countries, you know, using it where there's much more democratic decision-making about what, how, what goes on in the budget and how it's distributed. So I think those principles. Back to the chair. Thank you. Let's move on to our next item, which is item number nine. Equity and Inclusion in City Programming and Budgeting. Commissioner Fuentes. Thank you. Um, Lawrence, can you please put up the PowerPoint? Here we go. I'll put it up and you just let me know when you need me to go to the next slide. All right, thank you. Um, so before I, I start um, with the presentation, I just want to um, explain something. Um, and I'm gonna try and go through the presentation pretty qu uh, quickly. Um, there was a lot of work that I did in several areas and that led up to this particular recommendation. And the recommendation um, um, has to do with equity and, and how we, um, how we um, do our budgeting in our city. And, and I have a lot of experience in this whole area, um, many years in my work with the county. And, one thing that I know is very important is the responsibility and the responsibility that's given to the leadership. 
So that's why I focused on, on this particular area. I actually drafted it first before I saw um, Article 20 that um, Bob Brownstein and others prepared. And, and so once I saw the um, Article 20, um, I, I, ch I changed what I had written so that it would use the actual uh, policy and uh, requirements that Article 20 has, in, has embedded in it. Um, and you probably saw a, a different version of, of the, uh, my recommendation because originally my, my recommendation was talking about Article 20. Then I realized, um, as sort of uh, um, uh, Commissioner Callender alluded to, I, I realized that it had actually changed and it was now part of, of Article 6. So then I, I quickly today, you know, made those changes so that um, it would all, all, all make sense. Um, and um, I would also like to uh, comment on, um, on Commissioner Tran's question. Um, so this is um, I, what I see is what you just saw in Article um, Six is the overarching uh, policy and uh, requirement that goes across the city. And what I have is only one example of hopefully many where this overarching policy is actually taken to different levels, depending on, on what the situation is or what the department, et cetera, as, as has been mentioned. Um, what I did was I only focused on um, wanting to bring in language into the charter um, where it fits in terms of budgeting. And so that's why I looked at and I and I wrote um, a recommendation that focuses on the responsibility of the mayor, the city council, and the city manager. They all have responsibilities in in the area of budgeting that's in the charter. So I wanted to add language to their already existing responsibilities per the charter. I also want to mention, and this is actually the last slide, but I want to say it right now. I want to mention that we know that today in our in our uh, leadership, and I'm I'm most, most familiar with the mayor and the um, and the city council. There's a lot of commitment and a lot of great work that's being done by by um, the mayor and city council around equity and serving um, the entire community. However, we don't know what the future will be. We don't know what it will look like, and this is in a way to make sure that it's in the charter that um, equity has to be taken into consideration and addressed by these three groups, meaning the city council, the mayor, and the um, city manager. So um, with that, um, we'll just go quickly through the slides, the next slide. So. Um, so for the purpose of this recommendation that we guarantee all residents receive the benefits of the city and that all residents have equal access to city services and that they, are equitab they equitably meet the diverse needs of San Jose. Uh-oh, what happened? Give me a second. I want to actually present this so we're not seeing the... Uh... Give me one second. Okay. Uh... Well, you know what? I'm not going to be able to do it. So apologies all. Let's just share what I was sharing. Okay, thank you. That's the oh, wrong one. Okay, so one thing that we have in our city, we do have historical segregation pr pr uh, patterns. Um, we do have the, um, the entrenched patterns of redlining who, that have disfavored poor persons of color, geographically segregating them, and today's economy is also impacting. Um, and there is historical data of past city policies and practices that, that disadvantaged poor communities. So next one. 
Um, so we want to have available, engaging, responsive cities resources are vital. Next, just keep, okay. Okay, um, so um, these, these next slides are just really presenting the background to the issue and, and why this is important. Next slide. Okay, so the city charter does not require equitable distribution of resources among all of its residents. Equity in the city of San Jose budgeting would help alleviate our disparities that we face in ethnic communities and poor communities. Next slide. So the proposed change to the city charter, um, and, and so um, the, city, the, the city charter articles of article four, five, and seven do not address um, equity. Therefore, to advance equity in the city of San Jose budget, the following charter changes are recommended. So um, what I'm going to show you is um, what I'm recommending, and that is new language in each of these articles. In the sections of these articles, um, meaning Article 4, the council, Article 5, the mayor, and Article 7, the city manager, in these articles to add new language in the budget sections. Next slide. So the first one is Article 4, the council. So Section 411.1, Department Heads Policy Objectives Consent to Hire. The council shall adopt a written statement of policy for each city department, which is under the administration of the city manager. Said statement of policy shall set forth the broad goals, objectives, and inspiration, aspirations to be accomplished by that department. What, I, what we're recommending is the statement of policy shall adhere and follow specific criteria as set forth in CRC proposed Article 7, Section 610, Statement of Values. And again, that's, that's the, the um, article that was just presented. The next slide. Okay, so under Article 5, the mayor, under Section 502, the mayor powers and duties, the mayor shall have the following duties. D, if the mayor recommends any increases in the city budget, the mayor shall recommend the method of financing such, financing such expenditures. And I recommend this addition and ensure these recommendations adhere to CRC proposed Article 7, Sections 610, 611, 612, and in particular, 613. Um, that is a little typo there. Uh, and in particular, 613, Equity Assessment. And it, the original, the actual charter language now continues. If the mayor propose the curtailment of any services, the mayor shall provide specific recommendations and the reasons for the proposal. And I added, I'm recommending this addition. If the mayor, upon receiving an equity assessment as set forth in Article 6, Section 613, Equity Assessment, which results in portions of the budget do not adhere to Article 6, Section 610, 611, 612, and 13, the mayor shall recommend remedial action. So in other words, um, the assessment is done, and then the, the equity assessment, and then the mayor has to take that inf information and address it. And then if there's problems that have been identified through the assessment, the mayor shall recommend remedial action. So the intent is the person who is responsible here, we have our mayor, that person is responsible for addressing the problems pertaining to equity. The next slide. The next slide, please. Uh, let's see, the next slide. There, let's see what happened. We, we lost the city manager somewhere. Go back. Is it city manager, this one? Yeah. Yeah, city manager. Okay. 
So I haven't done that one yet, have I? I think you were talking about the mayor. Right, and then yeah. now the city manager. Okay, here yeah. we go. Yeah. Okay, so then Article 7, city manager. Okay, so what it has in the article is Section 7, 701, city manager, power and duties. E, the city manager, manager shall prepare and submit the annual budget to the council in accordance with the provisions in Section 1204. I recommend adding each section of the budget will be evaluated in accordance with Article 6, Section 613, Equity Assessment, and adjusted to adhere with Article 6, Section 612, Equity Standards. And then F, the city manager shall submit a complete report on the finances and administrative activities of the city as of the end of the preceding year. And I recommend adding, the annual report will address in detail the provisions in Article 6, Section 610 through 613. Um, so in essence, um, as you can see, what I am really trying to do is to make sure, I mean, absolutely make sure that there is language in the charter within the responsibility of these four, I mean, well, these three areas, meaning the, the mayor, the city manager, and the city council, that they have the responsibilities in charter where they are responsible for taking Article 6 and implementing it. Now, I want to answer just the point if what if we don't pass or the other one doesn't get approved. Um, I want to say that what I'm presenting um, in a way is dependent of, on, a, on the city having an overarching policy that is in the charter. And, and that, that is what we need to advocate for. Um, well, first of all, understand how this works and advocate for because this is the way our, our city can really transform to make sure that we are um, being equitable across the board um, throughout city government. And, um, and I, I know that um, many of us already know that, and, and it was kind of um, similar to what um, um, Chair Ferrer just gave an example of what, this, what the county does <clears throat> in addressing equity, um, where it's just maybe like a checkbox or something. Um, we need to make sure that um, equity is truly incorporated into our, our full structure. And we have an opportunity. I mean, we are very fortunate. We are extremely fortunate, all of us, meaning the commissioner, um, all commissioners, to be in a position to be able to make a recommendation that is that our, our recommendations are transformative and can really move our city in a, in a very positive way. Um, you know, there is no doubt in my mind when I go through my neighborhood, through parts of San Jose, um, that, that it's not equal in our city. And also, the more I, I learn, the, maybe the older I get, the more I, I realize what redlining has done in, in our city what other policies have created to make many of us live in disadvantaged communities. So this is really an important area. And like I said already, what I'm recommending here does go hand in hand with Commissioner um, Callender just presented. And um, I, I don't know, I haven't been looking at my time, but uh, can you just move really quickly through the next slides, um, Lawrence, please? Okay, so that's the reference in Article 6. Um, okay, I, I think um, I've already covered that. Um, well, um, the I've already covered, I think, everything else here. And so um, with that, um, um, there's more information in the full recommendation that, that's posted on our agenda. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Fuentes. Commissioner Matsumura. Um, I 
mainly wanted to point out, I think I see Commissioner Barrosio amongst the attendees, um, probably having lost the connection and needing to get promoted to panelist. Um, I, I also oh, just wanted to ask whether there's, there's any thought to sort of merging this together with, with the recommendation that Commissioner Callender just presented and I'm, I'm so sorry if you've addressed this and I missed it and we'll um, beg for the excuse of the late hour and but yeah just thinking that we're going to be best be able to to sort of process similar things effectively as a commission if they're consolidated um, but there may be a disadvantage to that that I'm not seeing. Well I think um, I actually think they're different in this in the purpose. Um, I think this one could be an example of how um, um, the um, what's in Article Six could be um, implemented, um, but we haven't talked about it. I mean, um, unfortunately, the way that our structure is, um, I was working on this on this proposal when I was in the Governance Structure Subcommittee, so I wasn't um, um, working with the other subcommittee, um, other than asking um, if um, Article tw uh, 20 would be um, would be recommended by, by by this subcommittee, and and since I, I I got the answer that it would be, then I just kept working on what I was working on because um, I think that um, I think I've already explained why I I propose this recommendation and that that I did do it before I even knew about Article 20, but I think um, our subcommittee will will work on, on addressing that question that you're raising. Seeing no other questions, I'll go to the public. So the public, uh, we ask your comments on the equity inclusion in city programming and budgeting that's just been presented. Clerk can call the first speaker. Claire Beekman. Hi, thank you. Um, you know, for as important as the previous item was, uh, this uh, this item may actually be very interesting as well. Um, to talk about these issues uh, can can make people uncomfortable, and um, I, I I don't think it should, but it has, and so that, that's why I'm so interested in uh, the previous two items is is to create uh, just a feeling of familiarity and uh, decency and that these things are okay. We are not communists <laughs> because we, we do these practices and it's, it's hard to say that to people and convince people of that. And, uh, but I find this really hopeful, good work. And so good luck in your efforts in these continuing efforts. Um, I know like when COVID, 19 first came uh, in San Jose, people like Councilperson Perales, uh, he was really working on this, on, on budget equity issues. And even before COVID-19 uh, was had started, they were, they were really working on a plan to do this well. And, um, you know, uh, balanced budget initiatives of the mayor um, at the same time of COVID can actually come in really handy at this time and uh you know they, they've done some important good work and so you know there's some good standards being set uh currently in our city government uh with these issues so good luck how to improve upon them um does does it need a bit more um effort besides just mayor services i don't know i'm totally you know knew how to ask questions about this, but uh, good luck in, in our efforts and, and, and thank you for this item. All in user one. Yeah, I'd like to see what all this is gonna cost in the budget. I mean, how much money are you gonna have to spend to make sure everything is equitable? You know, Bill Clinton, used to talk about this in his administration. He called it bean counting of all people. I wasn't even a Bill Clinton fan, but uh, I did like that terminology that he used. You're going to be bean counting 
every single thing. And I mean, hey, if I'm not treated equitably, it's going to, I mean, do I get to sue the city? Do I get to fine the city? Does the city get, I mean, how does it work? How does all this, I mean, it's, it, it is the most esoteric, odd thing I've, I've ever heard of. I mean, you have equality under the law, but equity means like a tit for tat type thing happening from the city. I mean, if that was the case, I've never been treated, treated equitably by San Jose PD. They've always treated me like dirt. So, I mean, and, and so, if, you know, just city workers, they could care less, man. So, if I'm not treated equitably, then what's going to happen? What's going to happen when, they, when things aren't equitable? What, what are going to be the ramifications? What are going to be the punishments? What are going to be the fees? I mean, do, do this, are the citizens going to get to write a ticket to a city worker who's not treating them equitably? That would be funny, quite frankly. But I think you're going you're gonna to find yourself in a lot of trouble if you're going to try to enforce this, and spend tons of money and time towards it. I'm more concerned about the potholes, about, about fires being put out about midnight to six patrols from the police department. I'm not treated – hey, my district, we hardly get any police protection between midnight and six. Other, other places, get other areas of the city get a lot more. Is that equitable? How is that equitable that I have less police officers in my neighborhood? A lot more. Back to the chair. Thank you. I want to move to the next item. and uh, This is item number six, department audits. Commissioner Shao. Commissioner Zhao, would you like me to share my screen? Uh, uh, share share the, my screen yes, and the recommendation. I, seem, I don't know how to. It seems like my my sharing is not working. Lawrence, please. Okay, share. there yeah. you go. Thank you. So this proposal is about department audits. Um, it's made by the entire of our subcommittee. Uh, first of all, what is the problem? Uh, we discovered that there are two basic problems of our city auditor function. First is that the auditing topics are entirely determined by the city council. And the second is um, there is a lack of department-wide auditing. So this recommendation is to remove political pressure from our decision-making process and to bring greater financial accountability for the city of San Jose. Uh, in the charter section 805, it gives the power and the duty to the city auditor's office. So they, um, the charter grants the auditor's office access and authority to access and exam all the records of our city department office an agency. So the performance auditing function is, uh, is already in place and is very essential element to hold the city's operation and services accountable. Lawrence, can you move to the next page, please? The current process um, is that the auditor's office will prepare a annual audit plan, they use a risk matrix to, to put together the methodologies to, to, to determine what's a higher risk and needs to be audited. The potential audit subjects on that plan is uh, going to, uh, it's submitted to the, to the council or to the rules committee for review and approval every year. The rules committee makes the determination um, of the annual auditing tasks after they submit that plan. Um, the rules committee can, can decide to accept or partially accept the city auditor's recommendation or choose to completely ignore the city auditor's recommendation and come up with their own uh, uh, auditing tasks. Therefore, the current determining process of audit subjects could potentially cause that some departments or some areas consistently 
being left out and never gets audited. Additionally, the current auditor office have been focused mainly on a specific area of the city department and doing a in-depth analysis and auditing. Um, those small scale auditing is certainly very important. However, the department-wide performance auditing, which is essential and critical um, to track the key performance goals of the city service, However, it's currently barely conducted. The missing of such auditing on a regular basis could cause um, a lot of problems such as misuse of city resources, lack of accountability, or even corruption. The larger scale department audits are necessary to ensure the taxpayers' money are being spent in a physical, responsible manner to ensure the highest quality of service to our community. Lawrence, please, next page. So how this problem possibly benefit? The increased accountability of the city services benefits every San Jose residents to, by ensuring physical responsibility and uh, improving services. This especially will benefit to the underserved communities who usually they rely heavily on the city services and resources and supports. What changes are we proposing? We propose to add the following language into uh, the city charter section 805.3. A department-wide performance audit must be conducted to all city departments to assess key performance against its mission, goals, and objectives in order to ensure accountability and physical responsibility. The constituent facing departments shall get a department-wide performance audit at least every six years while the remaining departments should get a department-wide performance audit at least every 12 years. The auditor reports should be presented at public meetings with trackable uh, correct, uh, correction items and follow-ups. Um, then next page. Is this feasible? Yes, we believe this change is very feasible and necessary to ensure the increased accountability. San Jose has uh, already have an audit function in place. This simply adds a larger scale to the current auditing process to ensure a higher quality of oversight and accountability. It may require though, it requires to increase the auditor uh, auditing office budget and capacity. Who may benefit? Every San Jose residents would benefit from this change uh, because this provided an increased level of accountability and oversight to our community. This would make sure that no part of any city department goes unaudited for more than a 12 year period. It helps us to detect fraud, embezzlement, and other crimes, as well as it identify potential ways to decrease spending and increase efficiency. It improves financial accountability in the city of San Jose. And the, the workload and budget for the auditor's office are likely to increase. What are the arguments? So the arguments, we think it would be the scale of department-wide auditing is too large. However, we think that if we don't do this, then it would, it would cost us more. And also, according to the auditor's office, every $1, on average, every dollar the auditor's office is spending to audit, it generates $2 in return on cost savings um, um, with, their funding, uh, with their fundings. 
Um, lastly, does this have to be in the charter? Yes, we think so, because it ensures that this is an unbiased approach that will not be influenced by any elected officials or impacted department staffs. This must be a charter revision. I think that concludes uh, our recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Zhao. Uh, questions, thoughts, feedback? Any comments from commissioners? Commissioner Matsumura. Um, I, I didn't see anything in the section regarding um, other examples of this change. Um, I, I do hear your response to the argument of uh, about the the challenge of uh, department-wide audits being sort of a very broad scope, um, but you know that that does seem like a significant concern to me. So I'm I'm wondering whether there are models, since I think we heard from both the city and the county that the department-wide audits are sort of not their practice. I also I know they referenced. Um, an association that they are part of that, that sets auditing standards. And, and yeah, just wondering what you found there in terms of models and best practices. Thank you. Uh, while we talk with uh, the county and the city auditor, uh, what they said is uh, the de department-wide auditor to the scale of the city of San Jose is kind of large, but it, it, is, not, uh, it is not undoable. Um, for the smaller cities, there are cities that are constantly doing the department audits. However, uh, the county of Santa Clara and the city is not doing that. Um, we think the larger scale allow us to look at the bigger pictures and hold the, the department head accountable. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none, let's go to the public. The public, we'd ask you to speak also on the issue of uh, department audits that was suggested by the subcommittee through Commissioner Zhao. First speaker. Tessa Woodmancy. Okay, thank you, Tessa Woodmancy. Well, yeah, I appreciated what the auditing issues and how um, the issue of saying that the politicians are the ones that choose what is being audited. And one of my um, quotes um, was that um, the politicians, the, the, those who have made the problem are, are not the ones that are going to be able to find the solution, will, you know, to give us the solution. And it's the same thing, you know, what they're going to audit um, and that they, you know, so it's really good to open up that process of how we're auditing. And I think auditing is really important in regards to, I guess, um, you know, I, um, well, just to make things right, you know, to look at things. And, and that's the same thing with our, you know, the same concept is what I've been looking at in terms of what we need to do or other people are saying that we need to do in regards to our climate crisis is that we need to be auditing. And so that auditing uh, muscle needs is needs to be in, in, improved as we go forward uh, to figure out where we're you know where we're making the mistakes because there's a lot of problems that are happening. So we need to, to open up that process and look at that. So I appreciated you know the ideas of you know just looking at auditing more uh, thoroughly and how we're going about it. And so that's a good thing. So I I support that and. Hopefully, we can um, have a more uh, equitable and fair city city operations, and and more you know uh, ideally you know as we look at it in terms of our climate crisis, how we're going to get to net zero by 2030 is what we have to do. Even though they say forget about the net, we really have to go to zero. And so basically, that you know improving our auditing capabilities is important. Claire Beekman. Hi, um, to, to simply note, uh, the auditing office currently offers monthly uh, auditing uh, at the Rules and Open Government meeting 
as a way of public accessibility. Uh, it's a nice feature. Um, I was talking about it with Tessa today, and uh, you know, this item sounds really interesting, what it can expand upon. And uh, the ideas of public accessibility to the auditing process is uh, an important concept. And uh, so good luck uh, how you can uh, work on this issue. Like what I tried to say earlier, um, maybe not all these items can be, become a part of the charter, but maybe they can fit into other items within this list and 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 work into uh, the charter that way, uh, which I think is a fair and interesting way to work and just interesting ideas. So um, good luck in these efforts. And what and what can't come up in the charter? Uh, we spent the past year, I think, creating a really good focus for the upcoming uh, equity roundtable and the um, COVID nineteen economic forum. And of course, the reimagined re task force, what's going on right now. Um, I hope we can continue a, a good organization and focus with these items to bring to these upcoming commissions. And uh, it can be a lot of help and do a lot of good service to them and how they can get started and, and, and have good, a good place to work from. So good luck uh, with these items. And um, thanks. All in user one. Who watches the watchers? Who chooses what's audited? What's audited? How is it audited? Is it totally transparent? Do we get to watch as citizens? I'd like to know. I mean, ultimately, I'd like to know when the police confiscate people's property and money, where does it all go? Who audits that? I'd also like to know where all the marijuana money goes. Because the police are in charge of the permits for that, and, and the people have to pay for those permits and the taxation and, and the fines if they don't do things right. Where does all that cash go? Where do all those toys that the department confiscates, the motorcycles, the cars? You know, It goes to a public auction, but I've been told there's an auction that the police have for themselves privately before – it goes to a public auction. Everything's already picked through. They get everything at rock bottom prices. Who audits that? Who audits auctions, the marijuana tax, and when things are, are, are forcibly taken away from people? I'd really like to know. And I, I'd like to know who watches that audit. I bet SJPD's police union probably makes sure that the right people are handpicked whenever they're audited because they don't ever seem to have anything go awry, right? I mean, remember how they were hoarding all those masks and all of a sudden they go, oh, hey, we got all these masks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they were hoarding those things. Who was auditing the masks and the PPE before COVID? Nobody. They were. They're the ultimate. They're, I mean, these guys need to have more scrutiny. They don't like it, but they I need to because sure they've been getting I've away with it. Forever. Really the door and then was like, oh, I'm going to text you. He canceled. Hello? Hello? Like a I'm muting panelists. That, that voice wasn't coming for me. I was apologizing for not getting to mute um, the, dis the disturbance in time. Um, next speaker is Alina Yin. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Zhao, for this presentation. Um, I think what you're building here is something that is definitely going to disrupt the status quo, but work better for everyone in San Jose, because it takes into consideration how the process enables inequity. And I appreciate the firm boundaries being set around this, the thoughtful frameworks and the critical lens that is really helping all of us to think about long-term solutions to these acutely felt pains of inequitable processes. And this also shows what I've always believed in, that the people of San Jose are very capable, very smart, and they know how to collaborate and work together. And all of these things, I think the city, the city should already be doing, but due to lack of either funding, focus, or support, you know, this commission has taken that on by volunteering their time. So I thank you deeply for um, 
for taking this on and for sharing your recommendations. And it's a long night. We're like halfway through. I don't know why tonight feels so long, but thank you. <laughs> I yield my time. Back to the chair. I'm sorry, Alina, that was a great Freudian slip. Um, let us move to our next item. <clears throat> at this late hour, we have to at least be happy. Um, our next item is number eight, amend the city's charter to address climate change impacts through establishing a climate crisis action commission in the city charter. Commissioner Siegel. Thank you. Are you able to see my screen that says San Jose Climate Crisis Action Commission? Yes, we are. Okay. So um, <clears throat> this proposal, the name is Amend San Jose City Charter to Address Climate Change Impacts Through Establishing a Climate Crisis Action Commission in the City Charter. It's submitted by myself and Commissioners Amador, Callender, and Segura. Um, it's inspired by Tessa Woodmancy. I'm sure every commissioner here can understand why. Um, and of course, her husband, Kat, was one of our speakers. Um, so what's the problem that uh, we're trying to address? I think, Lawrence, you were going to play a video. Can you play that video, please? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> so I need you to stop screen sharing. You got it. If you could. All right. Let me see if I can get this going here. Uh, to share your computer audio, please install the Zoom audio device. Let me see if I can get this to work quickly. Um, I don't know. What you do. All right, well, let's try this. Um, can you all see this uh, screen, this video? It's undeniable. And do you hear that audio? We can. Can okay. you maximize it, please? I'll Thanks. give it a try. All right. Can you still still see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can. Fantastic. Here we go. It's undeniable. We are facing a global climate emergency, but there is hope. We can still slow global heating and dramatically lessen its impact, but without action, the conditions for living on Earth will get worse. Fires, floods, storms, droughts, hunger, conflict, poverty, grief, anxiety. By 2050, pollution may be so bad, there might not be fresh air to breathe. Rising ocean temperatures could destroy nearly all the world's coral, decimating our fish stocks. Global harvests will likely be failing, sending our food prices skyrocketing, and even more people into food poverty. Our world could be so catastrophically hot that sea level rise would displace millions. Increased risk of disease, war, and mass migration would create global chaos. It doesn't have to be this way. Averting the worst is still achievable if we act now. It will be hard, but together we can make a difference. We need to cut our carbon emissions in half by 2030, then half again by 2040, and then again by 2050, and push our corporate and political leaders to do the same. Not tomorrow, today. Write to your elected representative. Tell them it's time to act or they'll lose your vote. Support an organization that's lobbying to eradicate fossil fuel emissions and revolutionize agriculture. March for change. Call for climate justice. A green future that benefits everyone. If we act now, there is a chance that by 2050, our hard work can help deliver a world with clean air powered by wind and sun. A world with more space for wildlife, a world regenerated by all of us, a world ready for whatever comes next. Thank you, Lawrence. 
So this article just came out a few days ago. This uh, video is, was attached to an article. I am trying to share my screen. So that was um, a bit of the problem. San Jose needs to take coordinated actions to prepare city services and citizens for major ongoing impacts of climate change. Um, and it will take decades to resolve if ever. Um, there's currently not nearly enough focus on evaluating the problems that could occur and outreach and on outreach to citizens and input from citizens regarding climate mitigation for over our 1 million resources and our city government. Greater accountability in reporting fossil fuel use and in mitigating the effects of climate change in San Jose is needed. Residents should have an organized city supported platform for making proposals to the city manager and to the city council. This is to say res residents are asking for greater inclusion in the creation of a climate change mitigation strategies on a city level. How has this problem possibly impacted, benefited low income, BIPOC, immigrants, undocumented, and those experiencing houselessness? Well, this one really does experience um, impact those groups really severely. Uh, local climate change is expected to impact underserved communities first and most. San Jose already has experienced flood events that had a disproportionate effect on poor communities left to dwell in low lying flood prone areas. Sea level rise will soon force Alviso residents to leave their homes. Extreme heat events could happen any day. And most poor neighborhoods um, have neither home air conditioning nor local cooling centers. Impacts from global heating and resulting climate changes will be felt locally and quickly. While binding legislation and treaties will only come nationally and globally, if at all, and even then slowly. So what changes are we proposing? Whereas the Earth's climate systems is changing according to science, we know this is a global event. Whereas the anticipated global changes in Earth's dynamics will impact local habitability in San Jose. Whereas it is difficult to impossible to predict what those local impacts will be. Therefore, the Charter Review Commission recommends creating a Climate Crisis Action Commission in the city charter composed of both community members and scientists to further distance the climate change mitigation decision process from the political process. In order to be evergreen, this commission shall have a broad scope to bring forth climate change mitigation proposals to the city council. It will be comprised of three volunteer scientists chosen by a majority vote of the commission once it's established two members of the Muwekame Ohlone tribe because this indigenous tribe has the lived experience of working with local lands through floods, fires, and natural disasters. And for all of those concerned, yes, um, I did get the blessing of the uh, Muwekame Ohlone tribe to include this language in here. Two community members from each council district and two appointees of the mayor, 27 total commissioners, a quorum shall be 14. Um, the commission shall select its own chair once established and the chair may be removed by 14 votes and a different chair may be elected by 14 votes. I mean, this is gonna be, we expect a lot of contention on this. I mean, we're, this is a very, very serious issue and there will be disagreement on how to best move forward with recommendations. So that's why we have more specifics in there than um, people otherwise may have. We just wanted to have that clear. Um, although the city of San Jose employees are more than welcome to participate by giving information to the C Climate Crisis Action Commission at each of its meetings, they would not be eligible to be commissioners because as employees, they are paid to bring solutions to the city manager, city council and mayor already. That is their day job. This is what they do day in and day out. And so there's already an established route for city employees and departments to give information to the city manager and elected representatives. We do not want an echo chamber with the same ideas manifesting in different places in government. This is the reason we don't want, um, we, we just want citizens on this commission. We just don't want an echo chamber. Um, due to the existential crisis, we are 
presented with, this commission would serve as an independent community source channel for ideas to flow to city council, mayor, and city manager. Um, and so once a year, this commission will make recommendations to the city council and mayor at least once a year, it's a minimum. And um, the city council mayor shall vote on these recommendations within 90 days of their submission. If they don't vote on the recommendations within 90 days, the, um, subject to applicable law, of course, then, um, then it becomes policy. It just becomes policy. And again, this gets back to what we were talking about before on the police commission. The worst thing that can happen is for folks to volunteer a year of their life and have city council say, thank you for the report. That's very nice, next. When we submit recommendations, we expect a vote. It could be a no vote, a yes vote, yes but vote. Any way they wanna vote is their prerogative, but they should vote. And so that's why we have this 90 day rule. And especially when we're talking about climate crisis, so much can happen. So many crises can happen in a 90 day period. And we're in, a, in this period of exponential downward spiral right now. So 90 days is actually um, quite generous. I don't even wanna use that word. Uh, it's, it's quite a lot of time to vote on what a commission has put forward after a year's worth of work. Um, so the intent of course is to give city council actionable items intended to help mitigate the risks of climate change on the local level within our city. So that's the, the real reason for the 90 days because climate change is rapid and the markers that indicate whether we are at a tipping point as pa are passing us by at a rapid rate as indicated by the United Nations in the August 9th, 2021 report. I will just remind the commission, I brought you somebody who had written the prior iteration of the UN IPCC report. And he was the scientist from Stanford and he explained the current August 9th IPCC report to us. It's quite alarming. Tipping point is actually defined by a bunch of markers and we've just missed a bunch of them. So. That's it, we've passed a bunch of them. So we're there right now, that's where we are. Um, so adding this charter language that directs the city government. So this is another recommendation, just charter language that would direct the uh, city government to identify current and proposed efforts to mitigate climate change risks and to educate people on those risks in each neighborhood and um, in each city of San Jose department. So this is just, we're not gonna tell the city council exactly what this language should be. It's, we're just giving them the idea of this is what folks in the community would like to see and we'll just let them word it. Um, but the commission of course should have a broad scope, uh, which should include, but not be limited to this whole list of things. Um, there's a whole list of things that, and these are all these ideas. I know I'm going by them, but you have them all and we're short on time. This is not coming from any commissioner. This is all coming from members of the public. And these are just examples of things that someone on a commission might um, suggest. So the, the point of the commission's broad scope is to get ahead of the crisis, not to scramble when it arrives. Um, and so we could revisit these recommendations after something really bad happens, or we could start mitigating the process in a serious manner now to protect as many people as possible from where we sit today, which is not a very good place to begin with. Um, we again, encourage the city to fully participate, but not as voting commissioners since they already have a path to give their input to the mayor and city council and city manager. Is it feasible? It's definitely legally possible. It's practicable. Um, it should have broad support from the public and organizations interested in preventing climate change um, we're not going to solve the problem of climate change in San Jose alone, but we actually do need to address climate change for tactical reasons, including floods and fires. We need to know which services rely on fossil fuels because we, the residents of San Jose, may not be able to get those services if fossil fuels are in short supply or if we're priced out of purchasing them. So we actually need to identify tactically what are the weaknesses uh, related to climate change who may benefit, all people living in San Jose are gonna benefit from this. Um, they're gonna benefit from knowing how their neighborhood is gonna be impacted and 
and planning for that and presenting ideas to mitigate that. Um, businesses, of course, we know are impacted by the by climate change. Um, an unintended consequence of having San Jose joining, just residents of San Jose that should say residents joining Climate Crisis Commission is that very smart engineers, computer scientists, other scientists, environmentally conscious residents would contribute significantly to ideas of mitigating local climate change impacts for San Jose. Folks, we're close to three universities here. There's a wealth of resources. This is Silicon Valley. We have so many smart technical people that live here. Um, it, it will be so easy to get smart minds to come up with ideas for us and to contribute those. Um, we're, we're just, this is a reflection of where we live. So we, we should definitely tap on those resources. Um, so let's see. City of San Jose employees and agencies are working already on the climate crisis. Um, they're, let's see, what am I saying? I'm sorry, it's quite late in the night. Okay, oh, I see. How could the city of San Jose benefit the, the employees themselves? Okay, so here's one example. The city of San Jose employees and agencies um, represent 1% of, um, while municipal greenhouse gas emissions are less than 1% commute wide emissions for, you know, community wide. So it's just what, I'm sorry, it's late at night. When people who work for San Jose travel to work, that represents only 1% of the community wide emissions for everybody in San Jose. However, if you're looking at the city itself, the employee commute is the second largest component of the city's most recent municipal greenhouse gas inventory. And here's a link to that. So 22% of the city's greenhouse gas emissions are coming from employee commute. So the city, how is it remedying that? It has joined this thing called Cut the Commute Campaign, which says that we're gonna allow folks to work from home one to two days a week, but um, but here's the thing, a climate, you can't, people who work for the city can't say to their boss, hey, that's not enough. I want to work from home four days a week. In fact, I've been working from home five days a week during the pandemic. One to two days is really not going to make a dent in this greenhouse gas emission. We've all been working from home. Why can't we work from home four days a week? That is not something you can say to your boss. But you know, if, if it comes from a climate crisis action commission making a recommendation to say, hey, can we increase flexible workspace for city workers to four days a week, where it's possible where for people that have uh, desk jobs, that actually would benefit the city. It would be supportive to um, city employees. So that's one way of who would benefit. The question was who would benefit. Arguments against it? Um, you know, the first one is, is, it's pretty silly. There shouldn't be arguments against it. So, but, um, but, but there's like a serious argument that says that we got actually from the city, which says that um, they want this commission that I'm, that my subcommittee is proposing to merge with the San Jose Clean Energy Community Advisory Commission. And so the reason we don't recommend this is because the clean and clean energy is just one part of the solution space we're addressing and we have other problems that impact local resiliency like food insecurity, water insecurity, energy costs and availability, not just electricity, you know, which this energy commission is looking at, but there's other energy costs and availability, not electricity, political inaction, sacrifice zones, crushing economic disparities and the list goes on. We will have problems that are unknown to us right now. Where, from where we're sitting, we just don't know what those problems are. Like, just like how food supply chain fragility popped up recently, and you know, we couldn't have, we weren't really thinking about that. Similar things will come up. That so, just to say that clean energy is the only, you know, we, there's, <laughs> there's there's a lot more that this commission would be looking at. So we need a separate citizen-led commission set up to address the broad and unanticipated threats that will result from global heating and regional climate change. Okay, and these threats are not gonna get, I mean, they're just not gonna get better except on geological timescales. 
So in, in case, you know, no one has let you know, we're here and it'll get better on geological timescales, but we're actually in the thick of it now. And based on the ice, I see, based on the UN report, it doesn't seem like, it seems like we're, we're, we're we've passed a lot of those tipping point markers. Um, okay. <clears throat> So also the other argument against this, against merging it with clean energy is, I mean, clean energy is highly important and it's a very technical subject that requires commissioners to have a particular interest in energy like they do now. I looked up the backgrounds of the folks that are on there. And so we just think that that commission is more useful as a standalone commission with its somewhat narrow focus. And then the other thing was, um, Okay, wait, sorry. Finally, we don't prefer merging these two because clean energy becomes, so here's the thing. If we have our climate crisis action commission and we've now merged it with clean energy, then clean energy would become an ad hoc subcommittee of this commission. And then the public would have no idea what's happening in this ad hoc subcommittee potentially around clean energy or be able to give input and that's just a horrible consequence. The, the last thing the community wants is to have even less input um, and even less uh, visibility of what's happening in subcommittee. So that's another reason. Some people say that San Jose's Climate Smart Program is really what, um, it's enough, it's what we should be promoting, but that sits on a policy level. And, um, and this proposal, of course, is not redundant at all with Climate Smart. That's just city policy on what the city is doing. Um, and most major cities and many small cities have a climate smart program and sometimes with a different name. So these sit at a policy level, they reflect current government programs run by employees of the government. This is not the gold standard. The gold standard would be to solicit ideas from residents um, to work with their lived experiences, professional educations, intellectual resources, um, the powerful desire to not suffer in natural and man-made disasters. And that's what that's exactly what our climate crisis action commission would do, and so, but it would actually support the work of Climate Smart by getting the word out neighbor to neighbor about the programs that Climate Smart offers. So Climate Smart has a whole bunch of programs. Pretty much most people don't know anything about them, and so ha this commission, I think, could really support that. Currently, um, there's. Climate Smart is right now suffering from low participation in its public facing programs. And so does it matter how great a public facing program is if most people don't know about it or participate in it? No. And so what we think the lack of community engagement and empowerment to participate in finding solutions and presenting these solutions to city council manager and the mayor is actually what's causing the apathy in participating in the public facing climate smart programs. And so Mr. this- Siegel, Mr. Siegel, I'm gonna stop you there. I think you've made a great argument. Your, your, your memorandum is very detailed. Anyone should be able to have read it. I'm gonna ask for questions to, the hour is late and we still have four items to go. So okay. Commissioner Quaytran, and uh, I see your hand up and then Commissioner Matsky. Let's get into the discussion so Commissioner Siegel can respond. Commissioner Quaytran. Sure, I, I uh, saw that recommendation seven uh, from Commissioner Percival we had recommendations related to the Smart City Advisory Board and the Technology Board. Uh, are they related? Are these two related? Two board. Uh, the Smart City Technology Board is totally different. Oh, sorry, I think I may have misheard when you were speaking about the smart. I was, I was talking about something called Climate Smart, which is just the, the public facing programs that the city of San Jose has. Okay. Um, like, like for example, if you want to buy a car that's um, the, an electric car, the city has contracted with a company that will help you locate an electric car. Like that's one of the programs. Got it. Okay. Um, okay. And, and then just a question. Then uh, you know, I mean, obviously the objective is very you know uh, important, and I you know I believe you're going to find a lot of support among the commissioners for the objective. Um, is would there be any? significant difference between proposing this as a policy recommendation and having the this, this commission just be created within the municipal code versus doing it from a charter level. Uh, I mean, I do see this a little different from the Fair Campaign Board in the sense that the Fair Campaign Board has existed and there's been disputes or, 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 or um, concerns about whether or not the Fair Campaign Board has any real authority, but as a policy body, 
Um, I know I, as a, as, I serve on the housing commission and we're going, you know, not being in the charter, the housing commission has been able to have a lot of input and say on, on the policy recommendations that come before the council. Um, so I'm wondering if we can kind of save ourselves the, the, the process here of trying to go through a vote by the, by the, by a resident, right. And having that go through the whole process and just kind of skip through that whole process and create the commission anyway from, through the municipal code, which can actually just be done directly from the council. And we don't have to bring this before voters. My response is if the city council wants to do that, they're free to do that, but they might not do that. There's a lot of, uh, pre there's a lot of backlash. There's a lot of pressure. You have to realize um, the building industry lobby is pretty big. Um, and so they haven't done it. Like, why haven't they done it so far? If they wanted to do it, they would have done it. So part of putting something in a city charter is that we find it so ethically necessary and so time imperative that putting it in a charter reflects that. And I think the existential mm -hmm. crisis that we're in right now is so severe that it warrants <clears throat> the charter's protection. Once it gets into the charter, it's it's semi it's very protected <clears throat> in that it really would take a vote from citizens of the city of San Jose to actually dissolve it. Whereas if it sat on a policy level, then the worry is it could be changed, it could be manipulated, it could be dissolved based on the political wind of the elected body. And okay. so- All right, let's keep going. Commissioner Tran, did you have a second question? No, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Matsky, then Commissioner Marshman. Commissioner Matsky. Yeah, I'll be very quick. Um, I originally questioned why um, we were even looking at this because I thought it should be a policy issue. I appreciate the fact that we did. I kind of agree with everything that's in here. However, I still also agree with Commissioner Tran that I think this is a policy issue. So I will just um, leave it at that. However, I do want to say there is the one issue about the council simply reading and filing commission recommendations. Maybe we should put something in for all commissions that the council should be required to vote either to accept or reject any, any recommendation. So we may want to think about that as well. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. Um, so my response to Commissioner Maskey is if you could kindly draft that recommendation for all commissions, I think it, I think you're right. I think it's wonderful. Um, it's beyond the scope of my subcommittee to do that, but you are more than welcome to do that and you're welcome to present it on the next day we're presenting. I completely agree with you. I would just add, Commissioner Maskey, that um, in, in Western Canada, just in June, just like five months ago, the temperature reached 125 degrees Fahrenheit uh, on an FLIR thermal imaging camera, and that killed 1 billion, not million, clams, mussels, and other marine animals that lived on the beach. And in a few day period, look at this, June 25 to July 1, it's like less than a week, 719 people died of overheat, of heating in this tiny little town called Lytton in British Columbia. Just because it reached 121, 719 people died from June 25th to July 1. Now we know that San Jose will reach 125. And so are our air conditioners ready for that? Of course they're not. Do we have cooling centers for half a million people when we reach 125? We do not. And so the urgency of this thing is ethically why it belongs in the charter. Okay. So okay. I'm going to keep moving us forward. I've got a bunch of hands up here. Um, I'm going to go to the attorney first. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on, uh, and this is applicable to any of these commissions where we're talking about giving them some sort of decision making or policy or legislative authority over the council. That would need, need to be something that is addressed in the charter because presently the council is the only body that has legislative authority uh, in the city. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Matsky. I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Brosio. Perfect. Thank you. Um, first, I want to say thank you um, for bringing up this very important um, recommendation. I appreciate the forward thinking um, in terms of having all recommendations have um, at least a vote on the floor. Um, <clears throat> so then that way, 
the work could be honored and, and some public comments um, can happen around um, what ends up being talked about um, at the council level. One of the things that um, I, would, I would push this recommendation to have um, um, is even more teeth. I would say like other commissions, um, like library and parks and rec, um, they have city departments frequent their, their commissions. <clears throat> so I would recommend, um, if I recall the presentation from the Stanford professor correctly, the two biggest um, uh, issues that contribute or um, areas that contribute to um, a local pollution problem is transportation and industry. So I would recommend um, maybe including some language where uh, the city's transportation, airport, um, maybe economic development um, staff attend um, and share work plans and have a continuing dialogue with this commission. Something that um, would build good collaboration between commission and city departments. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Marshman, then Commissioner Matsumura, Commissioner Marshman. Um, I, you know, you've made a very good case here for this kind of commission, although I did think it was a little detailed in, in the structure. Uh, but I think, I think we ought to consider uh, what uh, Commissioner Tran and, and uh, Commissioner Maitsky said um, about keeping it in uh, the municipal code, making it a policy. And, and it's just, it's a strategic thing. The city has already said, and maybe it's just two council members, but my sense is when something goes to rules like that, it probably has a little more support. They said they don't want us messing with this. And, and we might actually be able to make something happen with the council carrying the idea forward uh, as you know, not as a charter change. I I doubt they're going to put this on the ballot as a charter change. Great job, though. Are we? Um, I would be open, Commissioner Marchman, to having this commission vote both ways, having it vote up or down at a charter level, and having it vote up or down on a policy level, just like we had alternate voting, voting in the alternate with um, the earlier presentation by Commissioner T. Tran mm -hmm. today. So um, I actually would be open to that. Chair, is that permissible? I think it is. And I think when you bring it back, um, I think that's the discussion we should have to see the will of the commission. Is it really something that strategically we believe makes more sense in the Muni Code as a policy recommendation? It can have just the same detail, same argument, um, but I do think it'd be the it'd be good for the the will of the commission to see which way um, they want to if they're going to support this, if they're going to support it as a policy or a charter change, since it can go either way. And I think there's compelling arguments to be made. Um, Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. Um, first question: What of this language is intended for? inclusion in the charter. Sorry, does the question make sense? Um, yes, it took me a second to understand if you were asking if I had fulfilled the requirements for the inclusion and account <laughs> inclusion piece, or are you asking but but you're not. You're actually asking um, the language in this recommendation memo. How much of it is going to go into the charter? Yes. Not, exactly. Yeah. Yes. I've not developed um, specific language to go into the charter. We're simply giving the uh, substance Got of it. the recommendation. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's and fine. is that what you want, or do you want actual language? Um, I think, you know, there's, there's enough substance to this, um, that, you know, it, it, for example, sorry, clicking around to too many tabs, especially sort of when it gets into the 
examples of the scope that it would it would be really helpful to know exactly what we are recommending for inclusion in the charter um mm -hmm. right because okay. some of this is fleshing out it's it's illustrating etc okay um so yes i i do think that would be helpful you know to be kind of really crisp about what's the charter recommendation versus <clears throat> charter recommendation um versus what versus what's uh kind of fleshing out and explaining okay the, the recommended language okay um a, a couple of suggestions mm -hmm. um one is i i do remember i think it was from mr woodmancy's presentation a real emphasis on climate resiliency um that i thought was was important and different from from some of the other sort of work that we're seeing in the city. And I may have missed it, but I, I don't think I saw it in here and, and think that that would be valuable. Um, another recommendation is, is regarding the name. There's um, quite a lot of research about what motivates people to action on climate and how do you walk the line of, of conveying the urgency without sort of simply making people shut down from overwhelm and fear. Um, and so my recommendation on the name would be Climate Action Commission rather than Climate Crisis Action Commission. I think action still conveys, you know, that orientation towards solutions and, and urgency um, without sort of striking that note of fear, um, which I, I do think the urgency of it is conveyed elsewhere. So it's, it's just regarding the name. And then um, last question is uh, if there are sort of notable um, differences from the ap approach of the Hawaii Commission that we heard about um, that you that we as a commission should be aware of. Okay, um, that I can just comment right now. Hawaii is very different than San Jose. It's an island. It's an island <laughs> state um, and specifically Honolulu where they um, where this sits. Let's see, I have it here. Um, are there examples of this? The city of Honolulu, yes. So it sits in there to they have a very specific composition to their commission and it involves really specific scientists. For example, some that study the waves and how it kind of um, wraps around the island, specific to coral. Um, I can't remember, but he actually went through the very, very specific scientists that are unique to Hawaii that just wouldn't apply to San Jose. They did have one position that I thought was super interesting and they did reserve a spot for a representative of the building commission, not the commission, the building um, industry. And so I thought that was pretty interesting that they had done that. So I can tell you that that's how it's different um, in its composition, but it just wouldn't be applicable to San Jose. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work. Seeing no other, no other hands, thank you, um, Commissioner Siegel. Let's go to the public. Call in user one. Where's all the money gonna come for, for, for this environmental stuff? Where's it gonna come from? You know? I don't think you know. Soon to be King of England says it's going to cost trillions of dollars. Where is trillions of dollars going to come from? Now, this is a city that can't put out a fire, that can't solve a crime, can't fix the roads, that makes the wrong decisions on almost everything. And San Jose is going to save the earth? I don't know. There's already county and state and federal requirements for environment. I think the city needs to focus on the city. They need to focus on reforming their police force, and having enough officers between midnight and six so people don't steal things from other people and commit crime. But you guys don't see it that way. You think you have this sort of like a romantic view of, of a utopia that you're going to save the earth and all this. It's not going to work. Well, who's going to enforce all this and who's going to work from home and who isn't, what kind of car you're going to drive, 
and you know you're going to help people find electric cars. I mean, you just go on the internet and look for one if you want to buy one. How how are you going to be able to help people buy an electric car? Who's going to do that? Who's going to get paid to do that? Why are they being paid to do that? I think you guys have a lot more soul searching to do. And I mean, we already have a recycling program through our trash, and many people already drive electric cars. I don't know what you guys are angling at, but you know, you do have people driving around looking to see if there's a shed in someone's backyard or how high a flagpole is. Maybe you guys should stop with the with the petty enforcement because that wastes a lot of energy and greenhouse gases and everything else. So I don't know where you guys get off on doing all these things. I think it's Roland. Thank you. So what I'm about to say in the next two minutes pretty much applies to every item that's in front of you tonight. So I hope that you'll pay attention to what I'm about to say, and there's no need for me to come back and repeat it. So let me start by saying that I have a deep appreciation for all the effort that is being put into all the issues that are in front of you tonight. But having said that, these issues, as you are presenting them, belong on some kind of political agenda. They don't belong on the political on the shelf. So my recommendation to you is to go back to the Guardian video, and I forgot how many, maybe a minute into it. It's all you right there. Go to your elected officials, and if they don't follow what you expect them to do, what well, just basically roll them out. That, that's how democracy works. So my recommendation to you moving forward, to all these people who are pushing for these issues, is reach out to every single one of the five council and the mayor candidates who will be running for election in June, and ask them to, to put all these issues on their political agenda, and then let the voters decide you know, uh, where they want to go with this. And I'm going to basically call everybody's bluff here. If you really, really believe in these issues, and you really, really, really believe that the people of San Jose will follow you all the way to the bank, my best advice to you is to run for mayor or run for council, and let you see how it goes. Thank you, and good night for now. Tessa Woodmancy? Yes. Oh, hi. You can hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, good. I don't have my little clock, though. Uh, anyway, yeah, well, I was just reading about what they were talking about, what the charter is. And our charter is the central procedures of the city government that defines the organization, powers, functions, and essential procedures of the city government. So what this um, Climate Crisis Action um, Commission would do is there's a couple of things that weren't exactly addressed that I think need to be in it which was, and that the science is looking at, um, is that we need to have a, a real insight um, auditing of our departments. Because that was something my husband as a scientist has, has suggested, that we look at all the departments and where their fossil fuel is used, that they need to report that to us. These type of procedures that we need to have, look into the, what's going on in our departments and their mitigation. And that, that's what we don't get from the, um, the, the 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 smart the city cities San Jose smart you know climate smart it, it's not we don't know what's going on in each department that granularity into each department that's important as we go forward and on top of it this this um the um what they call the citizen what the extinction rebellion refers to it as is a citizens assembly on climate and ecological justice will empower citizens but it's also the scientists to take the lead and politicians to follow with less fear of political backlash as they, as they discuss that. And the, the issue even uh, that um, what we have to look at is how, who is gonna be on this commission. And it has to be those, just like in a jury, how they evaluate their orientation. We need to understand that, that each of the people that are going to be discussing the procedures and leading, leading our government, it's like it says, the government must create and be led by the decisions of Alina Yin. Thank you, commissioners. Um, I 100% support the creation of this commission, especially including and centering the Mwakma Ohlone voices and their lived experiences. 
And just as we've witnessed all of the amazing hard work and commitment and ideas of this commission, I have faith that the future members of the Climate Commission will also come up with outstanding recommendations as well, and that they'll help to lead city staff into thinking about this more innovatively and also with more urgency, just as you have all been leading um, the discussion on equity and how we can be addressing that. As commissioners, people have said, you know, they could have been already doing this, but they're not. And I think that's the importance of having these forums. I do respectfully disagree with Roland that in order to make change, you have to run for office. That is not true. And not everybody has the ability to do that. And that's why boards and commissions are important. And this is another part of democracy that's even more important because this is where we collaborate, uh, collaborate together. So thank you. I yield my time. Claire Beekman. Hi, thank you. Thank you for the words of Alina. That was uh, very well said uh, all the way around with, with all her items. Um, yeah, um, the fact that you brought in uh, Ohlone questions and issues uh, with this item was really interesting to myself. I think it, you, you kind of possibly hinted at the concepts of, of are we preparing for 2023 enough? And, and what can this commission do for that process? Um, I, good luck uh, how we decide how, how we'll be thinking and working for the next few years to consider and the next decade, I suppose, to prepare for natural disasters within the Bay Area. Um, this commission can do very well for emergency preparation work, I feel. Um, good luck how I think we can address the future of clean energy and this commission can work together. I, I, you know, I don't want to say anything definite, but you know, the, the, the accessibility, the public accessibility ideas uh, that clean energy can offer as a conduit for just community working towards a future with their government. Uh, I think it's astounding what it can work towards. And you know, good luck how to make these sort of connections. Uh, it, this is an effort of how to bring a community more into the process. And so they have more of a voice and more of a part of their community and government. And it isn't just government handing down dictates. We are at a time where we can start being a community, where community is, is making the decision making. Good luck in those efforts how to come to do that the, the sort of things this commission wants to work towards, I think very well addresses those sort of concepts. Uh, so this is interesting uh, pictures that it can develop. So thank you. Back to the chair. Okay, we have three more items. I'm gonna ask the commissioners who are presenting to go and do that in five minutes. I'm gonna also change the, our, our public comment to one minute. Um, because we have three more items plus our um, our old business to take up still tonight. I was going to try to move these items to a different agenda, but I just don't think we can. In other words, because of the public hearing that's coming up, we wanted all these items to be able to be heard by the public. So public will have another item. We'll have these items all able to discuss again at the public hearing on Saturday. And I'm asking commissioners on Saturday if they can Again, tighten their presentations down. These are in writing. Folks have gotten copies of them. They're on the record. Um, they've heard them tonight. So really wanna make sure that uh, our, our, our public hearing is as tight as it can be. Um, so I'm gonna ask now that we go to item number 10, which is article 21, the promotion of home ownership opportunities for low-income residents of San Jose. Commissioner Fuentes, if you could just summarize the proposal that you put in writing, that would be helpful. Thank you, I will try my best. I want to do the same. Um, Lawrence, um, can you please um, um, put on the PowerPoint? And um, I wanna go ahead and go to the, um, the slide that has the actual um, article 20. This is, um, it's no longer going to be Article 21, it's going to be Article 20. Okay, uh, I seem to have. <clears throat> it's the green. Uh, yep, one second. Okay. It was open and now it's. Okay, so very quickly, I just want to say that um, 
the purpose of this of this um, article is to put in our charter that the city will take action to assist residents, low income residents, to be able to um, purchase a home. And um, this article um, was worked on with um, um, uh, Commissioner Amador and Commissioner Shea. Uh, and um, also I wanna say that um, Bob Brownstein was very instrumental in helping us conceptualize and design this article. Um, you know, our goal is, um, and you're gonna be hearing um, another presentation on COPA, and our goal is to really take this um, need in our community, very serious need, and really try and address, address it. So, Lawrence, you can just uh, scroll down, and I'm not sure, let's see. I, I think um, click on click uh, click on on four for a second. Okay, go ahead and click on on five. Okay, so basically, the city charter does not serve as residents with the greatest need for housing. Therefore, Article Two, the promotion of home ownership opportunities for low income residents of San Jose, is proposed. Next slide. So the people of San Jose find it must be must establish new policies to support the purchase of affordable housing by low income residents, while not impacting existing policies or resources available to support affordable rental house, housing for its renters. Next slide. So I'm just reading you the article right now. Therefore, Article 20, the promotion of home ownership opportunities for low income residents has the goal to meet this need, which is vital to the long-term stability of San Jose as home to its residents. Next slide. The people of San Jose Finder must establish new policies to support the purchase of affordable housing by low-income residents while, now, while not impacting the existing affordable rental housing for its residents. Um, the, Therefore, okay, okay, next slide, please. I'm sorry. Next slide. Okay, so the definition is low income residents are defined by 60% of AMI or some other widely acceptable measure in the future. Affordable housing means somebody should pay no more than 30% of their income for a mortgage. House for purchase, and we're talking about detached houses, condominiums, townhouses, duplexes, etc. Next slide, please. This policy is intended to directly assist residents who otherwise would not be able to person up, purchase a home because they would not qualify because of their salary. Next slide. Something went wrong. Please try again. I was trying to time myself. So this article has five areas, and I'm just going to quickly um, explain these. Um, next slide. The first policy area is... Um, is a comprehensive study. So we would ask the um, the mayor and the city council to every other year conduct a comprehensive study to identify opportunities opportunities that will assist San Jose residents to purchase a home, such as city, county, state, or federal legislation, efforts by business or philanthropic sector seeking to improve the quality of life. And this would include, they, should, they would have to consider this a major policy requiring an equity assessment. Next slide. Um, so upon identifying the opportunities, the mayor and city council will delegate the responsibility to pursue, promote, and participate in opportunities for home purchase for its residents starting with low income residents. So anyway, this, would, this actually would be assigned to staff to follow up on any possible opportunities to assist. Next slide. Um, and then the city will identify land that is currently not zoned for housing, which is highly suitable to convert to land to be used for affordable housing for purchase. 
And this section does not apply to land covered in Article 19. Next slide. And whenever um, there's an opportunity, such as like with Google, um, San Jose, um, the city of San Jose will negotiate new business development community benefit programs to assist low income residents as defined by city housing department to achieve more to achieve home ownership. So this should be included in what's negotiated with the community with potential businesses in their community benefit programs. Next slide. Additional policies and programs to promote home ownership by low income residents, which are subsidy incentive and educationally based, including those that are voluntary rather than regulatory based shall be expo explored. Next, next slide, please. And so there is a whole section that incorporates the concept of racial and social equity analysis, which, as we know, is extremely critical in addressing the needs of low income people in our community. Um, and so this this slide um, shows all the various areas that would need to be looked at as we move forward with this policy. And um, I'm, I went really fast, but the idea is that the, our city, you know, we have a chronic problem with our housing crisis. It's horrible. And we have crowded living conditions and people are really struggling. They cannot afford barely their rent. And we're just trying to figure out what are some possibilities where the city could actually take proactive action, take responsibility to assist its residents and, um, and make a difference and really start taking action. So um, sorry to be so quick. Um, I really... Um, not right now, but at another time, I really would appreciate hearing all of your comments and and um, recommendations to how we can improve this concept. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Fuentes. Uh, Commissioner Quaytran. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Fuentes. I love your priorities, and you know they're, they're very much aligned with mine. Um, I would invite you to uh, to come in and, and um, speak with the Housing Commission at any time about your ideas. This has been a discussion point for us for quite a while. Um, I am a little concerned about putting this into the charter, uh, but if this was structured in a similar way as the COPA memo was, which is to endorse the policy position uh, rather than to put into the charter specifically, I'm home wholeheartedly behind it. Thank you, Commissioner Tran. Commissioner Matsumura and then Commissioner Marshall. It looks like Commissioner Fuentes was responding. I think it was on mute. I'm sorry, I, I somehow I, I became muted. Um, I just wanted to say that um, um, thank you, Commissioner Tran, and I hope we can discuss your points that you just made about um, making it a policy at another time. And I will like to go to that to your housing committee meeting. Thank you. Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. Um, I certainly appreciate Commissioner Fuentes' work to, to be as efficient as possible with her presentation, as well as, of course, the, the detailed um, preparation that went into it. Question to the chair, I also appreciate her effort to, to be efficient with our time tonight in, in um, delaying her responses to another time, but I'm not sure that we have another time because I, I think the next time we have an opportunity to commission to give feedback or have discussion is, is when we're at the final vote. And I'd hate to have- I Matsumura, if you have some comments to make about this, go ahead and make them. I, I'm no, I'm trying to understand from the chair whether we are going to have another chance to discuss this or not. I don't I don't think so, right? Well, you have another chance. You're gonna hear from the public on this item. You're gonna then have a chance to discuss it when a motion's made for the final vote. If you have recommendations to Commissioner Fuentes around what you want to see in this proposal, any adjustions, then you should make them now. Thank you. Yeah, it, in recognition that you know, substantive changes, I think ideally shouldn't wait until the final vote. We should have the opportunity to work on them. Um, I I just want to um, echo the the thinking around this potentially being a policy recommendation. But here as well, if, if there's um, a particular reason that made it a charter change that the commission should be aware of. Commissioner Marsh. And, and I just want to clarify that given the work plan right now, 
provisional vote voting will happen on November 15th, and we've added an additional commission meeting on Thursday, November 18th, with the final voting. So there will be discussion on all these items after the public hearing on Monday, November 15th, and that'll be the provisional voting step, and then final voting again on uh, Thursday, November 18th. Great. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Marshman. I'd also like to check in, uh, Commissioner Tran, I um, would support this as a policy suggestion. I would not uh, support it as a charter change. Great. Commissioner Monley, and then Commissioner Percival. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd also support this as a policy. This is a very fluid issue and the city has over over many, many years come up with um, down payment plans, other kinds of assistance plans, and it's very fluid. I, don't, I just don't see how you could make it a charter item. Um, I'm all for affordable home ownership. It is, um, it's the way we can all get up and out. Um, so I, um, I, I would really support whatever we do, but not as a charter. Thank you, Commissioner Monley. Commissioner Percival. Uh, thanks. Yeah, my question dealt with how this proposal fits into existing policy. Um, and then also what, how does, how does this address, uh, say like market-based housing, um, and, uh, other, um, sort of regional uh, effects. Uh, so San Jose is, you know, not isolated from, you know, the housing market in Sunnyvale or Palo Alto or something like that. Um, obviously, we don't have control over that. But um, so if you thought about that, but particularly how, how it uh, mixes with existing efforts in these areas. We have a study session on Wednesday, November 3rd, which is gonna talk about housing. So um, that's probably a good time, Commissioner Purcell, to make sure that that question gets before our guests that night, because they may be able to refer to it. Okay. Unfortunately, I think the city staff person's not able to come. So I think they're still working on that. Um, okay. That's Great. a really good question for city staff to answer. I think that would be um, a great way to get info. Sounds, sounds good to me. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, then we're going to go to the public and I'm going to ask the clerk to limit the comment to one minute. Thank you. Blair Beekman. Hi, thanks for this item. Uh, thanks for the work of uh, Bob Brownstein. Um, you know, I'm really learning the different ways that uh, the Charter Commission is working. Thank you. Um, there can be ways of working the heavy lift of issues like with uh, the future of uh, police commissions and, and, and green commissions, green sustainability commissions. And the approach, there's also the approach that Bob Brownstein is taking that uh, a few uh, endorsements and guidelines to develop that for the future of the Charter um, can give direction to our entire community for the next 10 years as well. Uh, so good luck on, on the differences and, and different ways to work. Uh, maybe there's ways to, to make endorsements that incorporate, can incorporate a number of items. Uh, good luck and all our practices. Thanks for this item and the next item. Back to the chair. Thank you. The next item is item number um, 11, which is the Community to Purchase Act or COPA. And Commissioner Amador is going to present tonight. Commissioner Amador. Great, thank you. And yes, thank you. I'll make it as quick as possible. Um, so again, this is a, uh, was written as a policy recommendation to city council and it's the Community to Purchase Act, um, otherwise known as COPA. So this memo seeks to promote and improve accountability, representation, and inclusion under racial equity lens within the housing department and anti-displacement efforts at the city of San Jose by promoting and supporting the Community to Purchase Act 
that promotes the prevention of tenant displacement and creation and preservation of community-owned affordable housing to build a more just and equitable city. Preservation strategies are needed in order to prevent further displacement, segregation, and negative quality of life and generational poverty. Preservation strategies often struggle for funding, sources, and commitment from cities, which ultimately impact BIPOC. Again, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and low-income families. Preservation strategies are necessary to address long-term affordability and to complement our housing production goals and not net loss ratios. Preservation strategies are key to ensure BIPOC families do not uh, experience homelessness and a cycle of institutional violence. Protecting tenant rights, producing affordable housing, and investing investments should be seen as a long-term priority as part of our vision to cement our city's commitment to ending displacement and materializing housing as a human right. Again, this was um, something that the Park Council Charter Review um, was asked to see under uh, consideration number five, considering additional measures and potential charter amendments um, as needed uh, that will improve accountability, representation, and inclusion at City Hall. Um, and in addition, this COPA memo aligns with uh, the overall San Jose anti-displacement goals and strategies set forth with community input, housing department direction, and city council board approval. Um, the 10 recommendations in this multi-year strategy are designed to complement each other and are listed below. The recommendations are also prioritized by timing from near term to medium term. So, and here's the source as well. Um, and this cannot longer wait. Uh, nor be scared of co-ops or community land trusts because we have seen these policies make changes throughout the, the country in cities like San Francisco and Washington, D.C. Co-ops and community ownership models have been discussed by city council as well to address the impact of displacement. And we are seeing neighborhoods rapidly changing before our eyes over the last few years with increasing in home sales and evictions of dozens of families. Many of our neighbors have been displaced. We are seeing that this is the realization of our once culturally rich communities, culture and heritage erased from spaces and our local family owned businesses are closing. Um, several documents provide data to the urgent need to create preventative measures to staff displacement and its impact on communities of color. Um, and then there's a couple quotes here from a staff memorandum. Um, I won't go over them, but feel free to go over them again. And as COPA, as one more time, as COPA tends to address historically and current discrimination based on home ownership and opportunities to build wealth, the same memo highlights the racial impacts of home ownership. Um, and in San Jose, Black households have a home ownership a rate of 33%. The home ownership rate for Latinx community is about 41% in comparison to white households have the highest home ownership rate in the city of 66%. And furthermore, COPA tends to address the racial impact of the 2008 foreclosure on BIPOC communities. From 2007 to 2008, East San Jose was named ground zero for the foreclosure crisis in nationwide Black and Latinx communities where two to two Point five times more likely to experience foreclosure than their white peers. Um, wealth building is connected to asset ownership and BIPOC communities and value of assets owned is also impacted by racism. Housing displacement greatly impacts Black and Latinx residents as it, it relates to affordability, home stability, and overcrowded homes, as well as which greatly impact families during the COVID pandemic and cause health harms. Unemployment and other economic barriers tied to housing leads to overrepresentation of Black and Latinx families in the homeless count. Um, and what are the changes that we are proposing? So no changes to the charter, but rather support policies that will prioritize establishing and continuing to support community opportunity to purchase programs, such as COPA, and creating new sources of funding for affordable housing community ownership models and anti-displacement and the continuation of tenant protection, following the examples of San Francisco and Washington, D.C. Is this feasible? Yes. We have many different cities throughout the country, such as San Francisco and Washington, D.C., that have implemented COPA and TOPA in efforts to support anti displacement and build ownership possibilities for tenants. Again, the benefits. Communities that have historically been impacted by redlining, housing segregation, and historical disinvestment in communities that majorly have affected Black, African-American descent, Indigenous, Latinx, and people of color. Um, and one more time, the burden, the burden 
um, of change weights on everyone. All participants, both on the city staff residents stepping into unfamiliar environments and roles to create sustainable and long lasting changes for our city and communities that improve social and racial equity, accountability and inclusion. Must this be a charter revision? Uh, I'm hoping in the future this policy could be a charter amendment as the city continues to work and implement this policy to combat anti-displacement and promote the prevention of tenant displacement and creation and preservation of community-owned affordable housing. It is important to expand our city charter to address our commitment to housing equity. And this recommendation should be in the commission's report. Um, and again, other examples, cities like Washington, D.C. and San Francisco have implemented these policies. Um, just a few to mention, there are more. Um, and examples of topo policies that have been implemented in Washington, D.C., as you can see, um, this is from TOPA, which is a tenant, um, which is a, the T, what changes is a T, which is tenants um, instead of community. And here are my citations. So I will stop sharing now for any questions. Thank you, Commissioner Mador. Uh, questions? Any questions, thoughts, comments, feedback? Commissioner Huey Tran. I back, no comments. I fully support COPA. I'm actually just want to take this moment to recognize the, the housing department staff. Uh, a lot of the experience that I get comes from how serving there. We have a very incredible staff that has done a lot of work on the issues that were brought forth by commissioners uh, Fuentes uh, and uh, Amador and many others here. Um, so. I fully support this as a policy recommendation. It's something the housing department is already working on. And uh, again, I would strongly encourage all people who want to work on housing issues, please engage with the housing department. Please engage with the housing commission because the staff there are phenomenal. They work hard and they're putting out uh, policies to try to address all the issues that we've been discussing. Great. Any others? All right. Then we're going to go to the public for one minute comments. Speaker. Call the first speaker, please, Clerk. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Um, yeah, uh, for this item, uh, this can be a sensitive issue to those who are not uh, familiar with it and what its real potential can, can help with. Uh, I think it's something awesome that really very much complements the ideas of land trust issues and the ideas of uh, uh, tenants uh, learning to work together cooperatively and uh, creating the, the ideas of co-op of a co-op future. Um, it, it's tenants rights ideas and uh, it's really interesting work. Uh, Councilperson Perales, this was brought to the city council recently. Councilperson Perales made a really nice I, choice and idea to offer a bit more time for uh, community input on the subject. To, to so people can familiarize itself with what it's capable of doing. And so the housing department can talk to people who are uncomfortable with it. Alina Yen. Thank you, Commissioner Amador. Um, I was a part of the 2021 Silicon Valley Housing Policy Leadership Academy. And um, in attending was many local community-based organizations as well as the city of San Jose staff persons COPA was a big discussion and study topic with overwhelming approval. And so I completely support this policy recommendation. Thank you. To the chair. Thank you. And then our uh, last item in terms of policies tonight is item number seven, which is alter the appointments to the San Jose Smart City Advisory Board and the Innovation and Technology Advisory Board. Commissioner Percival. All right, thank you very much. I will make this very quick, I promise. Um, I am going to um, share my screen here quickly. And uh, all right, so we have the title and I, I come to this uh, issue with a great, great degree of uh, humility, uh, but I do want to, um, to uh, recognize uh, our subcommittee who's done uh, great work tonight. And also this particular issue that I put this uh, recommendation together is really from the from the public and public interest. Um, and given the sort of late hour, not only tonight, but also in terms of our overall work, um, there wasn't a lot of time to, uh, at least for me, to study this in any great detail. But I feel I wanted to try to put together a policy recommendation that is uh, um, 
connects with existing things that the city is doing in this area of technological change and, and, and policy. Uh, whoops. So um, just a, a bit of background as, as part of uh, San Jose's smart city vision, uh, it's created two advisory boards that both re, uh, report to the city manager, the uh, smart city advisory board, and it has uh, uh, one of its roles is to obtain expert input from industry. Uh, thought leaders experience in developing and deploying innovative technology solutions to solve 21st century problems. And a second board, the Innovation and Technology Advisory Board, which is designed to tap the rich expertise of our community and shaping strategies um, and directions for the, uh, for the city. Uh, so what is the problem? The, uh, technological change, uh, including uh, things that we've heard about um, in our study session last week, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, intersects with a, a lot of longstanding social and economic challenges in our city and communities. And these technologies will have implications for, as I wrote in the memo, the future of work, which has implications for city tax revenues, uh, perhaps often overlooked though, uh, but vitally important, things like individual privacy rights and social and economic uh, inequities. It also intersects with core city functions, including many things we've talked about tonight, including policing, record keeping, transportation, number of other issues as well, including, I would think, climate. Uh, and then, but research shows uh, that technological change affects the community in very different ways. Uh, often it's communities who are uh, disadvantaged uh, and marginalized are uh, often harmed the most by technological change. The last ones to really benefit from the positive changes that technology brings. But currently on these boards, there's no requirement that the composition uh, includes community members, uh, academic experts, neighborhood associations, civic organizations. So in the spirit, a lot of the changes I think we're uh, speaking with and, and learning about tonight, uh, this is an idea or an effort uh, to um, get uh, a better cross-section and breadth of representation on these uh, crucially important advisory committees. Um, so uh, the question is, is a charter change necessary? Uh, the answer is no, I believe. Um, and this would again be a, a policy recommendation to the city council to expand the size and breadth of membership on both of these advisory boards. Um, and the exact number of appointees and the composition of each board would be determined by the city council. This is a, a power that the city council, of course, currently has and will have. Uh, but after consulting with the Office of Racial Equity, academic experts on this topic, but also tech industry stakeholders and other community members. So the idea is instead of having these boards stocked uh, full of uh, tech industry representatives who are of course really important to this conversation, but given the overall effects of technology and the different ways that it impacts our communities uh, to get a, a greater representation. And then lastly, arguments against this. Um, one that, uh, that uh, I put in the memo was that these are technology related issues are very complex, machine learning, artificial intelligence is uh, can be really technical really quickly. High degree of specialization and knowledge is often needed uh, to engage in these topics. And so one argument against broadening this uh, sort of scope of, of, of uh, representation on these committees would be that uh, you know, conversation is best left to uh, people who work in the industry and know how they're developed and deployed. Um, so I will leave it at that. And if there's any comments or questions, I'll be happy to uh, do my best to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Siegel. I wanted to really thank Commissioner Percival for taking this on, especially so late in our work plan. It was really big of him to do it. Um, so just thank you. I really recognize the amazing speaker that you brought and um, the good work that you're sharing with us. Thank you so much. Seeing no other hands, uh, we'll go to the public. Alina Yen. Thank you, Commissioner Percival, for bringing this forth. Um, I 100% support this policy recommendation and broadening it to include community support. I think that um, having tech professionals and industries represented is one thing, but we need to have the other side of the coin, which is the impact of community members. 
And so I think this is really important. Uh, one minute till midnight. All right, we're almost there. Thank you so much. Sarah Beekman. Hi, uh, thank you for uh, this item. Uh, yeah, and, and for the speaker you had uh, last week on it. Um, you know, the, these are technology items that, you know, the, the creativeness of technology and the oversight of technology for a community, they don't have to work in mutually exclusive terms. That's a really important lesson I don't think we fully understand yet, but it really, we really can work, the things can work together. Good luck uh, on, 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 on public accessibility ideas. Maybe this can be applied. Back to the chair. Thank you. Um, that concludes our discussion of policy and for, uh, uh, um, I can't say it, policy and recommendations for charter change. I want to thank all the commissioners for their incredible work on all these items, uh, as well as your th uh, fruitful discussion tonight. Um, I will want to go to all business and the first is a report from the chair. I don't have a report, um, but there is a report from the clerk. Uh, I'll turn it over to clerk Tony Tabor. Um, I, I don't have anything to report. I was going to ask you to report on the rules committee. Oh, that's right. Um, so the rules committee heard your, um, heard the memo from council member Jones and the chair emphasize that we are on track with how every, if we leave everything alone, we're on track to complete it by the December 14th meeting um, for council to hear it on December 14th. And the rules committee was satisfied with that sort of guarantee that will be done in time for them to hear it on December 14th. Thank you. And then, um, uh, public comment. This is the open time for anybody in the public that wants to address us on an item that does not appear on our agenda tonight. First, first speaker. Tessa Woodmancy. Oh, okay. Well, I guess, you know, just thinking about, you know, these proposals and specifically our climate crisis proposal, and I know that's on the agenda, but the thing is, when you say it's not on the agenda, most probably will not pass, you know? And the thing is, is that I think we have to take these, these um, uh, motivations and decisions of what we want to do and put it out there as saying, this is what should happen. Now, whether or not, you know, most probably the politicians won't do it. Like they say, the politicians who have made the problem cannot be part of the solution. So yes, it most probably will fail, but maybe all we can say is let's put out what we think should happen because then the future generations who will look back in what we propose, well, at least there'll be something in the archeological record that we had some good ideas as humans. And maybe the you know, future generations will take those ideas because maybe it is ahead of their time. My husband says it's, it'll take another two or three years before things get much worse and then we will do. Blair Beekman. Hi. Um... The, uh, the, the smart city technology uh, uh, recommendations, maybe, uh, you know, the public accessibility ideas can be applied to the uh, community uh, police oversight ideas as well. Uh, hopefully things can cross, cross breed, I guess, you know, just everybody can just work under everybody and, and to work towards things. That's my hopeful goal. Um, about the uh, rules and open government meeting, I think item three in the memo was awesome. It gives the commission the, the power if they want to continue an extension uh, of the commission, they can, if, if needed. Um, you, you're going to have to possibly address legal language issues for the future of the charter. Will that need an extension time? That's what my letter tried to ask about. I don't know how much you need to do that, but just to be aware of that, I think is uh, the important part. So good luck uh, in our remaining few weeks here. Thank you. Roland. So in closing this evening, um, I would like to give you a friendly warning of where we had this here. Uh, it's the same warning I gave to our elected officials um, actually exactly at the time when Tesla decided to relocate to Texas. And it, that just basically followed, followed Oracle, HP and others. But some of you have mentioned that what's behind Silicon Valley is our universities. And I respectfully put it to you, that's Berkeley and Stanford, probably not San Jose State. 
that what you've got to pay attention to is what Musk announced four days ago. It's going to open the Texas, Texas Institute of Technology and Science. Now, I don't think the acronym is going to be, uh, um, you know, sustained uh, scrutiny for very long. But the bottom line is they will actually have the class of 24. That'll be the first class. And it's not going to wait four years for these people to graduate. It's going to identify the top performers and make them an offer they can't refuse to drop out and start working for Texas, uh, Tesla, and other high tech companies. So just watch out. Thank you. Alina Yin. Thank you um, for all the commissioners that showed up today and that stayed on and uh, for all of your work and for all of the subcommittee of the policing municipal law accountability and inclusion. These are fantastic proposals and I'm so excited that we're finally talking about these things and we're um, putting forth realistic solutions. So thank you. Back to the chair. Well, good morning, everyone, and I'm going to adjourn us. Our next scheduled meeting of the Charter Review Commission is our study session on Wednesday, November 3rd, uh, 5.30 p.m. This is a virtual meeting, uh, and the public hearing after that is going to be ske is scheduled for Saturday, November 6th at 11 a.m. Again, thank you to our commissioners, uh, Commissioner Q Tran. Sorry, quick question. I believe that Lawrence earlier spoke about it. Uh, a special study session or a special session or a meeting on November 18th. Uh, I just wanted to confirm that it was the 18th and not the 17th. I was under the impression it was the 17th. Uh, I could have the date wrong, but um, I, I this, it's 15th it's, and the 18th. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is Tony Tabor, City Clerk. I actually just double checked that because I had to schedule other special meetings. So it's been the 18th on the work plan for a while. Okay. So it's Thursday the 18th, not Wednesday the 17th. Yes. Thursday the 18th, correct. And that's final voting on all of this. Chair? I'm like double checking the calendar <laughs> myself. I'm like, wait, I don't have it on the 18th either. So, okay. Um, so we are adjourned. Again, thank you all so much for your service tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night.